Section 17 of The Glories of Ireland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Glories of Ireland. Edited by Joseph Dunn and P.J. Lennox. Section 17. Irish Leaders. By Shane Leslie. Irish leaders have proved far-famed but not long-lived. Their short and strenuous careers have burnt out in their prime, and their ends have been such as attend conflagrations. More often they have left a pall than a light in the heavens, for the most brilliant lives in Irish history have led to the most tragic deaths. The destiny which allotted them impossible tasks has given them immortality on the scenes of their glorious failure. They differ from leaders of other countries, who divide the average pittances of success or ill-success on the road to honored retirement. Few of the heroes among modern nations have left such vivid and lasting memory as the strong men of Ireland. During the 19th century, their lore and cult have traversed the whole world in the wake of the great emigrations. Whether they failed or succeeded in wresting the independence and ideals of Ireland for a while from the fell clutch of circumstance, they live with their race forever. Under Plantagenet and Tudor rule, the Irish leaders presented a sullen but armed resistance. A never-completed invasion was met by sporadic raids and successive risings. A race of military outlaws was fashioned, which accounts for much in Irish character today. Previously, the Irish, like all Celtic civilization, was founded on the arts, on speech, and on law, rather than on war and feudalism. Even Irish militancy was crushed in the Williamite Wars, and the race, deprived of its original subsistence, as well as of its acquired defense, sank into the stupor of penal times. Those who should have been leaders of Ireland became marshals of Austria and France. Gradually it was learnt that the pen is mightier than the sword, and the human voice more potent than the sound of cannon, and the constitutional struggle developed, not without relapse and reverse. To Dean Swift must be attributed the change in the national weapon, and the initiation of a leadership of resistance within the law, which has lasted into modern times. Accident made Swift an Irishman and a chance attempt to circulate debased coins in Ireland for the benefit of a debased but royal favourite made him a patriot. Swift drove out Wood's halfpence at the pen point. He shamed the government, he checked the all-powerful Walpole, and he roused the manhood of Ireland towards independence and legislation. He never realised what a position history would give him. To himself he seemed a gloomy failure, to his contemporaries, a popular pamphleteer, but to posterity, he is the creator of public conscience in Ireland. He was the father of patriotic journalism, and the first to defend Ireland's rights through literature. Though his popularity was quenched in lunacy, his impress upon Irish politics remains as powerful and lasting as upon English literature. Within the so-called Irish Parliament, sprang forth the first of a long line of orators, Henry Flood. He was the first to study the Constitution for purposes of opposition. He attacked viceregal government in its own audit house. Pension and corruption he laid bare, and upon the people he breathed a spirit of independence. Unfortunately, he was not content with personal prominence. He accepted office, hoping thereby to benefit Ireland. His voice became lost to the higher cause, and another man rose in his stead, Henry Grattan. The American War tested the rival champions of liberty. Flood favored sending Irish troops, armed negotiators he called them, to deal with the revolted colonists. Grattan nobly reviled him for standing, quote, with a metaphor in his mouth and a bribe in his pocket, a champion against the rights of America, the only hope of Ireland and the only refuge of the liberties of mankind. Flood collapsed under his ignoble honors. He was not restored by returning to patriotic opposition. Grattan's leadership proved permanent politically and historically. 
his name, connotes the high watermark of Irish statesmanship. The parliament which he created, and whose rights he defined, became a standard, and his name a talisman and a challenge to succeeding generations. The comparative oratory of Grattan and Flood is still debated. Both, after a manner, were unique and unsurpassed. Flood possessed staying power in sheer invective and sustained reasoning. Grattan was fluent in epigram and most inspiring when condensed, and he had an immense moral advantage. The parliament which made him a grant was independent, but it was from one of subservience that Flood drew his salary. Henceforth Grattan was haunted by the jealous and discredited herald of himself. A great genius, Flood lacked the keen judgment and careless magnanimity without which leadership in Ireland brings misunderstanding and disaster. In the English house, he achieved total failure. Grattan followed him after the Union, but retained the attention, if not the power, of Dublin days. Neither influenced English affairs, and their eloquence, curiously, was considered cold and sententious. Their rhapsody appeared artificial, and their exposition labored. The failure of these men was no stigma. What is called Irish oratory arose with the inclusion of the Celtic understrata in politics. Burke's speeches were delivered to an empty house. Though he lived out of Ireland and never became an Irish leader in Ireland, Burke had an influence in England greater than that of any Irishman before or since. The beauty and diction of his speech fostered future parliamentary speaking. Macaulay, Gladstone, Peel, and Brougham were suckled on him. His farthest reaching achievement was his treatment of the French Revolution. His single voice rolled back that storm in Europe. But no words could retard revolution in Ireland herself. Venal government made the noblest conservative thinking seem treason to the highest interests of the country. The temporary success of Grattan's parliament had been largely won by the volunteers. They had been drilled ostensibly against foreign invasion, but virtually to secure reforms at home. Their power became one with which England had to reckon, and which she never forgave. Lord Charlemont, their president, was an estimable country gentleman, but not a national leader. A more dashing figure appeared in the singular Earl of Bristol. Though an Irish bishop and an English peer, he set himself in the front rank of the movement, assuming, with general consent, the demeanor and trappings of royalty. He would not have hesitated to plunge Ireland into war had he obtained Charlemont's position, but it was not so fated. After forcing parliamentary independence, the volunteers meekly disbanded, and the United Irishmen took their place. The brilliancy of Grattan's parliament never fulfilled national aspirations. Bristol was succeeded by another recruit from the aristocracy, Lord Edward Fitzgerald. With Wolf Tone and Robert Emmett, he has become legendary. All three attained popular canonization, for all three sealed their brief leadership with death. Lord Edward was a dreamer, an Irish Bayard, too chivalrous to conspire successfully, and too frankly courageous to match a government of guile. Tone was far more dangerous. He realized that foreign invasion was necessary to successful rebellion, and he allowed no scruple or obstacle in his path. He washed his hands of law and politics entirely. To divert Napoleon to Ireland was his object, and the total separation of Ireland his ambition. The United Irishmen favored the invasion which the volunteers had been formed to repel. The feud between moral and physical force broke out. The failure of the sterner policy in 1798 did not daunt Emmett from his ill-starred attempt in 1803. He combined Lord Edward's chivalry with some abilities worthy of tone, but he failed. The failure he redeemed by a swan song from the dock and a demeanor on the scaffold, which have become part of Irish tradition. After the Union, Irish leaders sprang up in the English house, which Pitt had unwittingly made the cockpit of the racial struggle. Far from absorbing the Irish element, the commons found themselves forced to resist, rally, and finally succumb. 
The Irish House cannot be dismissed without mention of Curran. He was a brilliant enemy of corruption and servility. O'Connell said, quote, there was never so honest an Irishman, end quote, which may account for his greater success as a lawyer than a politician. To be an Irish leader and a successful lawyer is given to no man. For the former, the sacrifice of a great career is needed. This sacrifice, Daniel O'Connell was prepared to make. His place in history will never be estimated, for few have been so loved or hated, or for stronger reasons. Never did a tribune, rising to power, lift his people to such sudden hope and success. Never did a champion leave his followers at his death and decline to more terrible despair. Friend and foe admit his immensity. He was the greatest Irishman that ever lived, or seemingly could live. In his own person, he contained the whole genius of the Celt. Ireland could not hold his emotions, which overflowed into the world for expression. He rose on a crest of religious agitation, but, emancipation won, he had the foresight to associate the Irish cause with the advent of reform and liberalism throughout Europe. He sounded the notes of free trade and anti-slavery. What he said in Parliament one day, Ireland re-echoed the next. To her he was all in all, her hero and her prophet, her messiah and her strong deliverer. On the continent he roughly personified Christian democracy. In public oratory, O'Connell introduced a new style. Torrential and overwhelming, as Flood and Grattan had never been, he proved more successful if less polished. The exaggerations of Gaelic speech found outburst in his English. Peel's smile was the silver plate on a coffin, Wellington a stunted corporal, and Israeli the lineal descendant of the impenitent thief. It sounds bombastic, but in those feudal forties it rang more magnificent than war. Single-voiced, he overawed the host of bigots, dullards, and reactionaries. Unhappily, he let his people abandon their native tongue, while teaching them how to balance the rival parties in England, the latter a policy that has proved Ireland's fortune since. He loosed the spirit of sectarianism in the Tithe War, and he crushed the Young Ireland movement, which bred Fenianism in its death agony. But he made the Catholic a citizen. Results stupendous as far-reaching sprang from his steps every way. The finest pen sketch of O'Connell is by Mitchell, who says, quote, Besides superhuman and subterhuman passions, yet with all a boundless fund of masterly affectation and consummate histrionism, hating and loving heartily, outrageous in his merriment and passionate in his lamentation, he had the power to make other men hate or love, laugh or weep, at his good pleasure. End quote. Yet during his lifetime there lived others worthy of national leadership. O'Brien, Duffy, and Davis played their part in England as well as in Ireland. Father Matthew founded the Temperance as Fergus O'Connor the Chartist movement. And there was an orator who fascinated Gladstone, Scheel. Father Matthew succeeded in keeping many millions of men sober during the forties until the Great Famine engulfed his work as it did O'Connell's. To him is due as a feature of Irish life, the brass band with banners, which he originally organized as a counter-intoxicant. Fergus O'Connor founded radical socialism in England. As the Lion of Freedom, he enjoyed a popularity with English workmen approaching that of O'Connell in Ireland. He ended in lunacy, but he had the credit of forwarding peasant proprietorship far in advance of his times. Scheel was a tragic orator, an iambic rhapsodist, O'Connell called him, who might have been leader did not a greater tragedian occupy the stage. And Scheel was content to be O'Connell's organizer. Without O'Connell's voice or presence, he was his rhetorical superior excelling in irony and the byplays of speech for which O'Connell was too exuberant. Scheele's speeches touch exquisite, though not the deep notes of O'Connell, whom he criticized for, quote, throwing out broods of sturdy young ideas upon the world without a rag to cover them, end quote. 
he discredited his master and his cause by taking office. The fruits of emancipation were tempting to those who had borne the heat of the day, but there was a rising school of patriots who refused acquiescence to anything less than total freedom. The young Irelanders reincarnated the men of ninety-eight. They were neither too late nor too soon. They snatched the sacred torch of liberty from the dying hands of O'Connell, who summoned in vain old Ireland against his young rivals. But men like Davis and Duffy appealed to types O'Connell never swayed. He could carry the mob, but poet, journalist, and idealist were enrolled with young Ireland. For this reason, the history of their failure is brighter in literature than the tale of O'Connell's triumphs. To read Duffy's Young Ireland and Mitchell's Jail Journal, with the drafts from the spirit of the nation, is to relive the period. Without the Young Irelanders, Irish nationalism might not have survived the famine. Mitchell, as open advocate of physical force, became father to Fenianism. An honest conspirator and brilliant writer, he proved that the pen of journalism was sharper than the Irish pike. Carlyle described him as, quote, a fine, elastic-spirited young fellow, whom I grieve to see rushing on destruction palpable by attack of windmills, end quote. Destruction came surely, but coupled with immortality. He was transported as a felon before the insurrection, while his writings sprang up in angry but unarmed men. Mitchell and O'Connell both sought the liberation of Ireland, but their viewpoint differed. Mitchell thought only of liberty. O'Connell, not unnaturally, considered the liberator. His refusal to allow a drop of blood to be shed caused young Ireland to secede. Only when death removed his influence could the pent-up feelings of the country break out under Smith O'Brien. If Mitchell was an Irish Robespierre, O'Brien was their Lafayette. His advance from the level of dead aristocracy had been rapid. From defending Whigs in Parliament, he passed to opposition and contempt of the House. He resigned from the bench from which O'Connell had been dismissed, became a repealer, adding the words, no compromise, and finally gloried in his treason before the house. His next step brought a price upon his head. Grave and frigid, but inwardly warm-hearted and passionate, O'Brien had little aptitude for rebellion. But the death penalty, commuted to transportation which he incurred, went far to redeem his forlorn failure. Mitchell, who shared his Australian imprisonment, left a fine picture of, quote, this noblest of Irishmen, thrust in among the off-scourings of England's jails, with his home desolated and his hopes ruined, and a feeded life falling into the sear and yellow leaf, a man who cannot be crushed or bowed or broken, anchored immovably upon his own brave heart within, his clear eye and soul open as ever to all the melodies and splendors of heaven and earth, and calmly waiting for the angel, death. End quote. The Irish cause was not revived until the Fenian movement. Disgust with the politicians drove the noblest into their ranks. In Stevens they found an organizing chief, in Boyle O'Reilly a poet, and in John O'Leary a political thinker, men who, under other conditions, had achieved mundane success. The Fenians were defended by Isaac Butt, a big-hearted, broad-minded lawyer, who afterwards organized a party to convince Englishmen that repeal was innocuous when called home rule. The people stood his patient ways patiently, but when a more desperate leader arrived, they transferred allegiance, and Butt died of a broken heart. Parnell took his place and began to marshal the broken forces of Irish democracy against his own class. But had been a polite parliamentarian, reverencing the courtesy of debate, and at heart loving the British Constitution. Parnell felt that his mission lay in breaking rather than interpreting the law. The well-bred house stared and protested when he defied their chosen six hundred. Parnell faced them with their own marble callousness. He outdid them in political cynicism, and outbowed them in frigid courtesy while maintaining a policy before which tradition melted and a time-honored system collapsed. In one stormy decade, 
he tore the cloak from the mother of parliaments, reducing her to a plain-speaking democratic machine. Through the breach he made, the English Labour Party has since entered. He united priest and peasant, physical and moral force, under him. He could lay Ireland under storm or lull at his pleasure. His achievement equaled his self-confidence. He reversed the Irish land system and threw English politics out of gear. With the balance of power in his hand, he made Tory and Radical outbid each other for his support. He was no organizer or orator, but he fascinated able men to conduct his schemes as Napoleon used his marshals. On a pregnant day, he equaled the achievement of St. Paul and converted Gladstone, who had once been his jailer. Gladstone became a home ruler, and henceforth English politics knew no peace. Parnell stood for the fall and rise of many. Under his banner, Irish peasants became human beings with human rights. He felled the feudal class in Ireland and undermined them in England. Incalculable forces were set to destroy him. A forged letter in the Times classed him with assassins, while a legal commission was sent to try his whole movement. It is history that his triumphant vindication was followed by a greater fall. The happiness of Ireland was sucked into the maelstrom of his ruin. He refused to retire from leadership at Gladstone's bidding, and Ireland staggered into civil war. The end is known. Parnell died as he lived. Of his moral fault, there is no palliation, but it may be said he held his country's honor dearer than his own, for he could not bear to see her win even independence by obeying the word of an Englishman. References Lecky, Leaders of Irish Opinion Mitchell, Jail Journal Duffy, Young Ireland O'Brien, Life of Parnell Dalton, History of Ireland End of section 17. Recording by Owen Cook in Pottawatomie, Ceded Land. Section 18 of The Glories of Ireland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jenny Adamson. The Glories of Ireland, edited by Joseph Dunn and P. J. Lennox, section 18. Irish Heroines by Alice Milligan The worth and glory of a nation may well be measured and adjudged by the typical character of its womanhood. Not so much, I would say, by the eminence attained to by the rarely gifted, exceptionally developed individuals, as by the prevalence of noble types at every period, and amongst all classes of the community and by their recurrence from age to age under varying circumstances of national fortune. Judged by such a standard, Ireland emerges triumphant and points to the role of her chequered history, the story of her ancient race, with confidence and pride. Gaze into the furthest vistas of her legendary past, into the remotest eras of which tradition preserves a misty memory, and the figure of some fair, noble woman stands forth, glimmering like a white statue against the gloom. At every period of stern endeavour, through all the generations of recorded time, the pages of our annals are inscribed with the names of mothers, sisters, wives, not unworthy to stand there beside those of the world-renowned heroes of the Gael. In the ancient tales of Ireland we read of great female physicians and distinguished female lawyers and judges. There were banfilla, or women poets, who, like the filla, were at the same time soothsayers and poetesses, and there are other evidences of the high esteem in which women were held. There can be no doubt, to judge by the elaborate descriptions of garments in the saga texts, that the women were very skilful in weaving and needlework. The Irish peasant girls of today inherit from them not a little of their gift for lace-making and linen embroidery. Ladies of the highest rank practice needlework as an accomplishment and a recreation. Some of the scissors and shears they used have come to light in excavations. In the stories of the loves of the ancient Irish, whether immortals or mortals, the woman's role is the more accentuated, while in Teutonic tradition man plays the chief part. 
Again, it has often been remarked that the feminine interest is absent from the earlier heroic forms of some literatures. Not so, however, in the earliest saga texts of the Irish. Many are the famous women to whom the old tales introduce us and who stand out and compel attention like the characters of the Greek drama. Everyone knows of the faithful Deirdre, the heroine of the touching story of the exile of the sons of Osnoch and of her death, of the proud and selfish Maeve, the ambitious queen of Connacht, the most warlike and most expert in the use of weapons of the women of the Gael, far superior in combat and counsel to her husband, Eilil, of Emer, the faithful wife of Cuchulain, of Etin of the Horses, that was her name in Fairyland, and of many others too numerous to mention. It is with the introduction of Christianity into Ireland that the Irish woman came into her rightful place and attained the preponderating influence which she, ever since, has held among the Celtic people. In the period which followed the evangelization of the island, many were the women of worth who upheld the honour and glory of Inishfall the Fair, and women were neither the less numerous nor the less ardent who hung upon the lips of the Apostle of Ireland. Amid the galaxy of the saints, how lustrous, how divinely fair shines the star of Bridget, the shepherd maiden of Focard, the disciple of Patrick the Apostle, the guardian of the holy light that burned beneath the oak trees of Kildare. Over all Ireland and through the Hebridean Isles, she is renowned above any other. We think of her, moreover, not alone, but as the centre of a great company of cloistered maidens, the refuge and helper of the sinful and sorrowful, who found in the gospel that Patrick preached a message of consolation and deliverance. Let it be remembered that the shroud of Patrick is deemed to have been woven by Bridget's hand, that when she died in 525, Colum Kill, the future apostle of Scotland, was a child of four. So she stands midmost of that trilogy of saints whose dust is said to rest in down. Who that hears of Colum Kill will forget how he won that name, Dove of the Church, because of his early piety, and that surely bespeaks a mother's guiding care. Ethne, mother of Columkill, remains a vague but picturesque figure, seen against the background of the rugged heath-clad hills of Tyrconnell by the bright blue waters of Garton's Triple Lake. Her hearthstone or couch is shown there to this day, where, once in slumber, before the birth of her son, she saw in a glorious visionary dream a symbol of his future greatness. A vast veil woven of sunshine and flowers seemed to float down upon her from heaven, an exquisitely poetic thought which gives us warrant to believe that Columkill's poetic skill was inherited from his mother. Ronnet, the mother of his biographer St. Adam Nunn, plays a more notable part in history, for, according to an ancient Gaelic text recently published, it was to her that the women of Ireland owed the royal decree which liberated them from military service. The story goes that once, as she walked beside the Boyne, after some sanguinary conflict, she came upon the bodies of two women who had fallen in battle. One grasped a reaping hook, the other a sword, and dreadful wounds disfigured them. Horrified at the sight, she brought strong pressure to bear upon her son, and his influence in the councils of the land availed to bring about the promulgation of the decree which freed women from war service. Our warrior kings had noble queens to rule their households, and of these none stands out so distinctly after long lapse of time as Gormley, the daughter of Flan Shunna, and wife of Neil Glondov. Her story has in it that element of romance which touches the heart and wins the sympathy of all who hear it. Her father was king of the Mahan branch of the Clan Neil and Ardry of Ireland for 37 years. Neil Glondov was king of Tyrone and heir of Flan in the high kingship, for at that era it was the custom for the kings of Meath and of Tyrone to hold the supreme power alternately. In order to knit north and south, Flan betrothed his beautiful daughter to Cormac Macquillanan, king of Cashel an ideal husband, one would have thought, for a poetess like Gormley, for Cormac was the foremost scholar of the day. But his mind was so set on learning and religion that he took holy orders and became Bishop King of Cashel, repudiating his destined bride. Gormley was then given as wife to Ciarvel, King of Leinster, and war was waged against Cormac, who was killed in the Battle of Ballymoon. Coming home wounded, Ciarvel lay on his couch, and while tended by Gormley and her ladies, told the story of the battle, and boasted of having insulted the dead body of King Cormac. Gormley reproached him for his ignoble conduct in such terms that his anger and jealousy flamed up, and striking her with his fist he hurled her to the ground. Gormley rose indignant and left his house forever, returning to the palace of King Flan, 
and on Carvel's death she at last found a true lover and worthy mate in Neil Lonbov, who brought her northward to rule over the famous palace of Eiloch. In 916 Neil became High King, but the place of honour was also the place of danger, and soon he led the mustered hosts of the north against the pagan foreigners who held Dublin and Fingal, and he fell in battle at Rathfarnham. A poem, preserved for us ever since, tells us that Gormley was present at his burial and chanted a funeral ode. Her long widowhood was a period of disconsolate mourning. At length it is said she had a dream or vision in which King Neil appeared to her in such lifelike shape that she spread her arms to embrace him, and thus wounded her breast against the carven headpost of her couch, and of that wound she died. Many saintly, many noble, many hospitable and learned women lightened the darkness that fell over Ireland after the coming of the Normans. I passed to the time when a sovereign lady filled the throne of England, the spacious days of great Elizabeth, which were also the period of Ireland's greatest, sternest struggle against a policy of extermination towards her nobles and suppression of her ancient faith. Amid all the heroes and leaders of that wondrous age in Ireland, there appears, like a reincarnation of legendary Maeve, a warlike queen in Connacht, Grace O'Malley, Granula of the Ballads. Instead of a chariot, she mounts to the prow of a swift sailing galley and sweeps over the wild Atlantic billows from isle to isle, from coast to coast, taking tribute, or is it plunder, from the clans. First an O'Flaherty is her husband, then a Norman Burke. In Clare Island they show her the castle tower with a hole in the wall, through which they say she tied a cable from her ship, ready by day or night for a summons from her seamen. She voyaged as far as London town and stood face to face with the roughed and hooped Elizabeth, meeting her offer of an English title with the assertion that she was a princess in her own land. The mother of Red Hugh O'Donnell, Inneen Dove, though daughter of the Scottish Lord of the Isles, was nonetheless of the old Irish stock. Her character is finely sketched for us by the Franciscan chronicler who wrote the story of the captivity and mighty deeds of her son. When the clans of Tyrconnell assembled to elect the youthful chieftain, he writes, It was an advantage that she came to the gathering, for she was the head of the advice and counsel of the Kinel Connell, and though she was slow and deliberate and much praised for her womanly qualities, she had the heart of a hero and the soul of a soldier. Her daughter, Nuala, is the woman of the piercing wail in Mangan's translation of the Bard's Lament for the death of the Ulster chieftains in Rome. Modern critics like to interpret the Dark Rosaline poem as an expression of Red Hugh's devotion to Ireland, but I think that Rose, O'Doherty's daughter, wife of the peerless Owen Roe, deserves recognition as she whose holy, delicate white hands should girdle him with steel. The record has come down to us that she prompted and encouraged her husband to return from the Low Countries and a position of dignity in a foreign court to command the war in Ireland. And in her first letter, ere she followed him overseas, she asked eagerly, How stands Tyrconnell? True daughter of Ulster was Owen's wife, so let us henceforth acknowledge her as the Roisin Dove, Dark Rosaline of the sublimest of all patriot songs. In the Cromwellian and Williamite wars, we see the mournful mothers and daughters of the Gaeldom passing in sad processions to Connacht, or wailing on Shannon banks for the flight of the wild geese. But what of Limerick Wall? What of the valorous rush of the women of the beleaguered city to stem the inroads of the besiegers and rally the defenders to the breach? The decree of St. Adam Nunn was quite forgotten then, and when manly courage for a moment was daunted, woman's fortitude replaced and re-inspired it and fortitude was sorely needed through the black years that followed, the penal days, when Ireland, crushed in the dust, bereft of arms, achieved a sublimer victory than did even King Brian himself, champion of the cross, against the last muster of European heathendom. Yes, her women have done their share in making Ireland what she is, a heroic land, unconquered by long centuries of wrath and wrong, a land that has not abandoned its faith through stress of direst persecution or bartered it for the lure of worldly dominion no, nor ever yielded to despair in face of repeated national disaster. It was this fidelity to principle on the part of the Irish Catholic people which won for them the alliance of all that were worthiest among the Protestants of North and South in the days of the Volunteers and the United Irishmen. What interesting and pathetic portraits of Irish women are added to our role at this period. None is more tenderly mournful than that of Sarah Curran, the beloved of Robert Emmet. The graceful prose of Washington Irving, the poignant verses of Moore, have enshrined the memory of her, weeping for him in the shadow of the scaffold, dying of heartbreak at last in a far-off land. No more need be said of her, 
for whom the pity of the whole world has been awakened by song allied to sweetest, saddest music. What of Anne Devlin, Emmet's faithful servant, helping in his preparations for insurrection, aiding his flight, shielding him in hiding, even when tortured, scourged, half-hanged by a brutal soldiery, with stern-shut lips refusing to utter a word to compromise her master Robert? What of the sister of Henry Joy McCracken, Mary, the friend and fellow worker with the Belfast United Irishmen? An independent, self-reliant businesswoman, she earned the money which she gave so liberally in the good cause, or to help the poor and distressed, through the whole period of a long life. Some still living have seen Mary passing along the streets of Belfast, an aged woman, clad in sombre gown, to whom Catholic artisans raised their caps reverently, remembering how in ninety-eight she had walked hand in hand with her brother to the steps of the scaffold, and how in 1803 she had aided Thomas Russell in his escape from the north after Emmet's failure, had bribed his captors after arrest, provided for his defence, and preserved for futurity a record of his dying words. Madden's History of the United Irishmen, as far as it tells of the north, is mainly the record that she kept as a sacred trust in letters, papers, long-treasured memories of the men who fought and died to make Ireland a united nation. And now a scene in America comes last to my mind. Wolf Tone, a political fugitive who has served Ireland well and come through danger to safety, is busy laying the foundations of a happy and prosperous future with a beloved wife and sister and young children to brighten his home. An estate near Princeton, New Jersey, has been all but bought. Possibilities of a career in the New Republic open before him, when a letter comes from Belfast, asking him to return to the post of danger, to undertake a mission to France for the sake of Ireland. Let his own pen describe what happens. I handed the letter to my wife and sister and desired their opinion. My wife especially, whose courage and whose zeal for my honour and interest were not in the least abated by all her past sufferings, supplicated me to let no consideration of her or our children stand for a moment in the way of my duty to our country, adding that she would answer for our family during my absence, and that the same providence which had so often, as it were, miraculously preserved us would not desert us now. Inspired by the fortitude of this noble woman, Tone went forth on his perilous mission, and similarly the young Ireland leaders, Mitchell and Smith O'Brien, were sustained by the courage of their nearest and dearest. Eva, the poetess of the nation, gave her troth plight to one who had prison and exile to face ere he could claim her hand. Other names recur to me, Speranza with her lyric fire, Ellen O'Leary, fervent and still patient and wise, Fanny Parnell and her sister. And what of the women of Ireland today? Shall they come short of the high ideal of the past, falter and fail if devotion and sacrifice are required of them? Never, whilst they keep in memory and honour the illustrious ones of whom I have written. The name of Irish woman today stands for steadfast virtue, for hospitality, for simple piety, for cheerful endurance. And in a changing world, let us trust it is the will of God that in this there will be no change. References On Etna, Mother of St. Columkill, The Visions, Miracles and Prophecies of St. Columba, Clarendon Press Series on Ronnet, S. Mackenvard, Life, in Irish, of Adamnon, Letter Kenny. Reeves, St. Adamnon's Life of St. Columba, The Mother of St. Adamnon, an Old Gaelic Text, ed. by Kuno Meyer, Berlin. On Gormley, Thomas Concanon, Gormla, in Irish, The Gaelic League, Dublin. On Granula, Elizabethan State Papers, Record Office Series. William O'Brien, A Queen of Men. On Inning Dove, O'Cleary's Life of Red Hugh, Contemporary. Ed by Dennis Murphy, S.J., Dublin, 1894. Standish O'Grady, The Flight of the Eagle, or Red Hugh's Captivity. On Rose, Wife of Owen Roe O'Neill, see references in Father Meehan's The Flight of the Earls, and in Sir John Gilbert's History of the Confederate War, Dublin, 1885. On the Wife of Wolf Tone, see Wolf Tone's autobiography, ed by R. Barry O'Brien, London, 1894. The American edition has a fuller account of Tone's wife, her courage and devotion in educating her son, and her interviews with Napoleon, and life in America. The women of the United Irish period are fully dealt with in K. R. Madden's Lives and Times of the United Irishmen. 
on Mary McCracken, see Mrs. Milligan Fox, the Annals of the Irish Harpers. On the Women of the Young Ireland Period, see C. Gavin Duffy's Young Ireland, Dublin, and John O'Leary's Fenians and Fenianism. On the Women of Limerick, see Reverend James Dowd, Limerick and its Sieges, Limerick, 1890. For the women under Cromwellian plantation persecutions and the penal laws, see Prendergast's Cromwellian Settlement, Reverend Dennis Murphy's Cromwell in Ireland, and R. R. Madden's History of the Penal Laws. End of section 18. Recording by Jenny Adamson. Section 19 of The Glories of Ireland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James McAndrew, San Francisco, California. The Glories of Ireland. Edited by Joseph Dunn and P.J. Lennox. Irish Nationality. Irish Nationality by Lord Ashbourne. Note. This chapter was written by Lord Ashbourne in French because he is so strong an Irishman that he objects to write it in English. This translation has been made by the editors. To those of us who are interested in the future of our country, there is at this very moment presented a really serious problem. The political struggle of the last century has been so intense that many of our people have come to have none but a political solution in view. For them, the whole question is one of politics, and they will continue to believe that Ireland will have found salvation the moment we get home rule or something like it. Such an attitude seems natural enough when we remember what our people have suffered in the past. Nevertheless, on a little reflection, this error, for error it is, and an enormous one too, will be quickly dissipated. In the first place, the political struggle of today is only the continuation of a conflict which has lasted 700 years. And in point of fact, we have a right to be proud that after so many trials there still remains to us anything of our national inheritance. We find ourselves indeed on the battlefield, somewhat seriously bruised, but we can console ourselves with the thought that our opponent is in equally doleful case, that he is beginning to suffer from a fatal weariness and that he is anxious to make peace with us. In order to place the present political situation in its true light, and to take into account its comparatively limited importance, we must not lose sight of the fundamental fact that what home rule connotes is rather a tender of peace on the part of Ireland than a gift which England presents us of her own free will. In fact, our neighbor across the channel has as much interest as ourselves, and perhaps even more, in bringing the struggle to an end. Through us, England has already lost much prestige, and that famous British constitution, which in times past everyone admired, while trying in vain to imitate it, has lost caste considerably. I am not now speaking of the danger which an Ireland discontented and even hostile, and having nothing to lose, would constitute for England in case of war. It is especially from our neighbor's point of view that we can cry up home rule or any other solution that will bring peace. But let us leave to Great Britain the task of getting out of trouble as best she may. On our side, what shall we say of it? In our conflict with the English, we are not wearied. Rather, are we hardened for the fray. We have acquired the habit of fighting, and many of us can now scarcely regulate our conduct in a manner suitable to a state of peace with England. Nevertheless, as I have already said, we have not emerged unscathed from this war of the centuries. National sentiment remains with us, no doubt, and our traditions are not wholly lost, especially among the country people of the West. But our commerce is almost ruined, and the national language is no longer spoken throughout the greater part of the country. It is true that a continuation of the hitherto existing state of war cannot do us much harm, that for purposes of mere destruction, all the advantages are on our side, and that on the other hand, we can begin a reconstruction at home without waiting for a treaty of peace to be signed. But we have some things to do for which a home government would be useful to us, and further, in the absence of such a government, it would be difficult to imagine 
what means could be employed to turn the people away from their too exclusive absorption in Anglo-Irish politics. It is then, from a practical point of view, that we wish for peace. But we may lawfully ask, will not this peace bring with it a special danger against which we ought to take precautions? As a matter of fact, there is such a danger, and it lies in the fact that the people have been to so great an extent obsessed by the political struggle that they run the risk, once their end is attained, of collapsing and of losing interest in the national question. Let us not forget that the question is to save our language and our civilization. Without it, it is all over for our nationality. Let us endeavor to turn our parliament to account in order to work seriously on the reconstruction of our national life, and it is certain that Ireland will find therein her salvation. We can therefore take advantage either of England's prolonged resistance or of peace. If England decides to continue the contest, she will suffer more from it than we. Her empire, her institutions, her safety will be more and more impaired. While, as for us, there will result a strong growth in patriotism and an anti-British bitterness. What we have to do right now is to take our bearings in such a way that no matter what happens to England, our own future shall be assured. We can do it if we wish it. The question is, shall we wish it? Here it may be objected, qui bono? The English language is quite enough for us. We have it now and we speak it, sometimes even better than the English people themselves. We are proud of using the same language as Sheridan, Burke and Grattan used. Such an opinion has its modicum of truth, though less now than a hundred years ago. Formerly, there was in Ireland, and especially around Dublin, a little colony of Anglo-Irish. The members of this colony spoke a very pure and classic English. And this fact is largely responsible for the place which Ireland at one time held in English literature. But during the last century, the remains of this colony have been swamped beneath a flood of half-Anglicized people of Irishmen from the country districts who were formally excluded and who brought with them such a mixture of expressions and of phonetic tendencies derived from the Gaelic that the language of Grattan, Sheridan and Burke has well nigh gone out of existence. The reason of this is that since the date of Catholic emancipation, most careers are open to everybody. The result has been that the newly enfranchised majority has ultimately absorbed the minority and that the atmosphere of culture of which we have just spoken has disappeared. We thus reach an island which, in a sense, has neither culture nor language, a country in which the Gaelic spoken by a people humiliated and deeply demoralized by an anti-Catholic legislation which is both savage and degrading, tended to coalesce with an English already condemned to death. It is from the moment when the Catholics had finally triumphed over persecution that we must date the beginning of that political struggle with which we are familiar, a struggle which has resulted in absorbing all the energies of a great part of the population. That is why this tremendous problem presents itself to us at the very same time when we should be justified in feeling ourselves elated by triumph because of our victories in Parliament. And let not England rejoice too much at our dilemma. If we are doomed to die, she will die with us, for before disappearing, we shall prove to be a great destructive force, and out of the ruins of the British power, we shall raise such a monument that future generations will know what it costs to murder a nation. But if possible, we must live and let live. The elements of reconstruction are always at hand. Anglo-Irish culture is indeed dead, but Gaelic culture is only seriously sick, and on that side, there is always room for hope. Sooth to say, its sickness consists above all in the fact that the Irish language is no longer spoken in a great part of the country. But on the other hand, where it is preserved, that same language is spoken in all its purity. By going there to find it, all Ireland will gradually become Gaelic. But it will be objected. What a loss of time and energy. If it is a question of languages, why not learn one of the more useful ones? To this we may reply that while English deforms the mouth, 
and makes it incapable of pronouncing any language which is not spoken from the tip of the lips, Gaelic, on the contrary, so exercises the organs of speech that it renders easy the acquisition and the practice of most European idioms. Let us add, by way of example, that French, which is usually difficult for strangers, is much more within the compass of Irishmen who speak Irish, no less because of certain linguistic customs than from the original relationship between the two languages. This remark brings us to another objection which is often lodged against our movement. It is urged that Ireland is already isolated enough and that by making a Gaelic-speaking nation, we shall make that state of affairs still worse. English, say the objectors, is spoken more or less everywhere, while Gaelic will never be able to claim the position of a quasi-universal language. To this line of reasoning, it might be answered, for one thing, that no one can tell how far Gaelic will go in case our movement is a success, and that many a language formerly universal is today as dead as a doornail. But we must look at the question from another point of view. John Bull's language is spread everywhere, while he himself retains the most exclusive insularity. He travels to every land and there finds his own language and his own customs. Now, it goes without saying that from this very universalization, his language is corrupted and becomes vulgarized. The idiom of Shakespeare and Milton gives place gradually to the idiom of the seaports. Furthermore, far from isolating us, Gaelic will tend to put us in touch with the civilization of the West. As a people, anglicized and badly anglicized at that, we share and even exaggerate the faults which I have just described. It is Anglo-Saxon speech which isolates us, and we wish on this ground to break with it and to hold out our hand to our brothers of the continent. But it may be said, what a pity to dig yet another abyss between Ireland and Great Britain, for it is with the latter that our geographical position will always link us for common defense. For while it is true that history does not show us a single case of an empire which has not sooner or later fallen to pieces, nevertheless, whatever happens, the two islands will be necessarily forced to cooperate for the common good. Well, let us take it that many things will so fall out, and let us suppose an anglicized Ireland called upon to face such a situation. It would be a revolutionary island, a restless island, an island seeking vaguely for revenge on someone, deprived of really national character, and in a general way suspecting England of responsibility for the disappearance from our country of everything that constitutes the idea of nationality. And let us remark that we are no longer living in those good old times when entire nations allowed themselves to be absorbed by the conquerors. The art of printing has changed all that. Today, a suppressed nation is one that will sooner or later have its revenge. Thus, let us suppose that we are destined to make political peace with England and to enter of our own accord into a Hiberno-Britannic confederation. From our point of view, what would be the result of that arrangement? The result would be strange. Here again, as in the case of Home Rule, it is rather we who offer advantages to England than she who offers them to us. Only in this latter case, the result depends on ourselves alone. If we die, it will be because we have wished it. Our language is not dead. On the contrary, although not widely spread, it is in itself much more alive than English, which, as a literary language, is in full decay. We may congratulate ourselves that our idiom is intact. Our civilization is old, but it has not yet lived its full life. If we wish, the future is ours. And let us truly believe that that is worthwhile. For the race, which has produced epics like that of Ossian, and all that magnificent literature which has been preserved for us through the ages, the race that gave to Europe that great impulse of missionary activity, which is associated 
with the names of Columkill, Brendan, Columbanus, and Gaul, not to mention men like the famous Scotus Erigena. That race is certainly called upon to play an important part in the modern world. But, let us repeat it, it must have the wish. End of section 19. Recording by James McAndrew, San Francisco, California. Section 20 of The Glories of Ireland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. The Glories of Ireland, edited by Joseph Dunn and P.J. Lennox. Section 20. Famous Irish Societies by John O'Day, National Historian, AOH. In the social organization of no nation of antiquity were societies of greater influence than in pagan Ireland. During many centuries these societies, composed of the bards, olavs, brayons, druids, and knights, contended for precedence. In no country did the literary societies display greater vigor and exercise a more beneficent power than in pagan Ireland. Although the Hebrews and other Asiatic nations had societies organized from among the professions, yet in Ireland alone these societies seem to have been constructed with a patriotic purpose, and in Ireland alone they seem to have had ceremonies of initiation with constitutions and laws. These societies existed from the earliest times until after the coming of St. Patrick. Traces of them are visible during all the centuries from the conversion of Ireland down to the Anglo-Norman epoch, and it is apparent that the clan system and the introduction of the feudal system by the English failed to eliminate completely their influence. When the Irish emigration flowed towards the American colonies in the 18th century, the social instinct early found expression in societies. One of the earliest of these was founded in Boston, where, in 1737, 26, quote, gentlemen, merchants, and others, natives of Ireland or of Irish extraction, unquote, organized the Charitable Irish Society. In Pennsylvania, where the Irish emigration had been larger than in any other colony, the Hibernian Fire Company was organized in 1751. The Friendly Sons of St. Patrick was founded in Philadelphia in 1771, and about that time societies bearing this name were founded in Boston and New York, as convivial clubs welcoming Irish immigrants to their festive boards. These societies were formed upon the model of the Friendly Brothers of St. Patrick, which had existed in Dublin and other Irish cities a generation before, and was well and favorably known throughout Ireland. The Society of the Friendly Sons of St. Patrick in Philadelphia contained some of the most prominent merchants and leading citizens of the city, and in 1780 they subscribed 103,000 pounds, or one-third of the sum collected, to supply the Continental Army with food. Among its members were Commodore Barry, the father of the American Navy, General Stephen Moylan, General Anthony Wayne, and the great merchants Blair McClenahan, Thomas Fitzsimmons, and Robert Morris. Washington, who was an honorary member, described it, quote, as a society distinguished for the firm adherence of its members to the glorious cause in which we are embarked, unquote. Whether upon the field or upon the sea, in council or in the sacrifice of their wealth, their names are foremost in the crisis of the revolution. The Hibernian Society for the Relief of Emigrants from Ireland was founded in Philadelphia on March 3, 1790. Other Hibernian societies, with the same title and organized for the same purpose, were founded in other cities along the Atlantic coast in the early years of the 19th century. But the Philadelphia Hibernian Society was, from the character of its members, the extent of its beneficence, and the length of its existence, the most famous. The emigrants from Ireland during the 18th century had pushed on to the frontier, or in some instances remained in the cities and engaged successfully in mercantile pursuits. The emigration which came after the revolution was, however, in great part composed of families almost without means. Unable to subsist while clearing farms in the virgin forest, thousands were congested in the cities. The Hibernian Society extended a ready and strong hand to these helpless people, and not only aided the emigrants with gifts of money, but also secured for them employment, disseminated among them useful information, and provided them with medical attendance. While the Hibernian Society was regarded as the successor of the Friendly Sons of St. Patrick, yet the two societies, which contained largely a membership role bearing the same names, flourished in the work of patriotism side by side. 
The first officers of the Hibernian Society for the Relief of Emigrants from Ireland were President, Chief Justice Thomas McCain, Vice President, General Walter Stewart, Secretary Matthew Carey, the historian, Treasurer John Taylor. It was said that no other society in America contained so many men distinguished in civil, military, and official life as the Hibernian Society. In almost every city where the Friendly Sons of St. Patrick and the Hibernian Society for the Relief of Emigrants were found, there was a close and intimate connection between them, which ultimately resulted in amalgamation. The ancient order of Hibernians traces its origin to those orders which flourished in pagan Ireland, and which exercised so potent an influence upon the history of the Celtic race. The Order of Knighthood was the first of these orders to be founded. It existed from the earliest times and is visible in the annals of the nation until the Anglo-Normans invaded the land in the 12th century. In pagan Ireland, the knightly orders became provincial standing armies, and there are many glorious pages describing the feats of the Clan Adea of Munster, the Clan Morna of Connacht, the Feeney of Linster, and the Knights of the Red Branch of Ulster. When the island was Christianized, these knightly orders were among the staunchest supporters of the missionary priests, and were consecrated to the service of the church in the 6th century, assuming the cross as their distinctive emblem and becoming the defenders of religion. Among the names which are upon the rolls of the ancient orders of knighthood are those of most of the kings, bards, saints, and statesmen, and in the long list there was no family of greater renown than that of Roderick the Great, to which belonged Connell Kernach and Logod, who, according to McGagan and others, were the direct ancestors of the O'Moores of Leeks. In this family, the ancient splendor of the knightly orders was a tradition which survived for centuries, and they were an almost continual rebellion against the English, from the siege of Dublin by Roderick O'Connor until the rebellion against Queen Elizabeth, led by Rory Ogui O'More and his son Owen in the latter part of the 16th and the early 17th century. A nephew of Rory Ogui, the sagacious and statesmanlike Rory O'More, revived the ancient orders in the Catholic Confederation of Kilkenny in 1642. A grandson of Rory O'More, Patrick Sarsfield, Earl of Lucan, was the most distinguished commander of Irish armies who opposed, in Ireland, the forces of William of Orange. There's no stranger story in all history than the intimate connection of the O'More family with the annals of the ancient order of Hibernians. The lineage of this family furnishes the links connecting the ancient orders of pagan Ireland through the centuries with the ancient order in modern times. Under the names of Rapparees, White Boys, Defenders, Ribbon Men, etc., the Confederation of Kilkenny was carried on through the 17th and 18th centuries until the 19th. At various times, the duties of these organizations were subject to local conditions. Thus, the defenders were occupied in protecting themselves and their priests against the hostility of the penal laws, engaging in armed conflict with the orange men in the north, while the white boys were waging war against the atrocities of landlordism in the south. Between these two organizations, there was a secret code, which operated until they were combined under the name of ribbon men in the early 19th century. The contentions of the white boys regarding Irish landlordism have since been acknowledged to be just, and have been enacted into statutes. The defenders joined with Wolf Tone in the formation of the United Irishmen. About 1825, the ribbon men changed their name to St. Patrick's Fraternal Society, and branches were established in England and Scotland under the name of the Hibernian Funeral Society. In 1836, a charter was received by members in New York City and in Schuylkill County, Pennsylvania. The headquarters were for some years in Pennsylvania, but in 1851, a charter was granted to the New York divisions under the name of the Ancient Order of Hibernians. New York thus became the American headquarters. National conventions were held there until 1878, since which year they have been held in many other cities biennially. Many of the most distinguished leaders of the Irish race in America have been members of the order, and from a humble beginning, with a few emigrants gathered together in a strange land, the membership has grown to nearly 200,000. General Thomas Francis Marr, Colonel Michael Doheny, General Michael Corcoran, and Colonel John O'Mahony were among the members in the late 50s. Among the organizations which have sprung from the ranks of the AOH were the powerful Fenian Brotherhood, the Emmett Monument Association, and scores of smaller associations in all sections of the United States and Canada. 
During the Know Nothing riots, the order furnished armed defenders for the Catholic churches in New York, Philadelphia, and Charleston, and it has ever been foremost in preserving its position as the hereditary defender of the faith. In 1894, the Ladies' Auxiliary was founded, and this body of women numbered in 1914 over 63,000, and had donated great sums to charity, education, and religion. The AOH had, in 1914, assets of $2,230,000. It pays annually for charity, sick and death benefits and maintenance over $1 million, and during its existence in America has donated nearly $20 million to works of beneficence. One of the most celebrated of the gifts of the order was the endowment of the Chair of Celtic in the Catholic University of America and one of its greatest gifts to charity was its contribution of $40,000 to the sufferers from the San Francisco earthquake. The Clan na Gael is a society organized to secure the independence of Ireland by armed revolution. Its organization is secret, and it is the successor of the Irish Revolutionary Brotherhood, called in America the Fenian Brotherhood, which promoted many daring raids and risings in Ireland in 1867. The IRB was perfected by James Stevens in Ireland and by John O'Mahony in America from 1857 to 1867. An invasion of Canada was made in great force under the general direction of Colonel William R. Roberts, president of the Fenian Brotherhood, but was unsuccessful owing to the attitude of the United States government, which declared that the Fenians were violating the principles of neutrality. After the disorganization of the Fenian Brotherhood, the idea of revolution languished until revived by the founding of the Clan na Gael by Jerome J. Collins in 1869, and the membership during the 20 years from 1880 to 1900 included almost 50,000 of the flower of the men of Irish blood in America. The principle of revolution was first given organized public expression in America through the formation in 1848 of the Irish Republican Union, which was succeeded by the Emmett Monument Association, these societies influencing the creation of the 69th and 75th Regiments of the New York State Militia and the 9th Massachusetts, which became so famous for valor during the Civil War. Although not putting forth all its strength so as to allow full scope to the parliamentary efforts to ameliorate the state of the Irish people, the Clan na Gael is as vigorous a section as ever of the forces organized for the service of patriotism. The Land League, founded in Ireland in 1879, was transplanted to America in 1880, when the first branch was established in New York City through the efforts of Patrick Ford, John Boyle O'Reilly, John Devoy, and others. Michael Davitt soon after came to America and traveled through the country founding branches of the League. In a few years, the whole American continent was organized, and in this organization, Michael Davitt declared that the members of the Ancient Order of Hibernians and the Clan na Gael were everywhere foremost. To the enormous sums collected by the League in this country, and to the magnificent labors of Parnell, Davitt, Redmond, Ferguson, Dillon, Kettle, Webb, and others in Ireland, is due in a large measure the present improved state of the people, resulting from the sacrifices made by those who supported this greatest of leagues devoted to the amelioration of unbearable economic conditions. A ladies' auxiliary to the Land League was established by the Sisters of Parnell and was for some years a brilliant vindication of the power and justice of feminine participation in public questions. The Land League, the name of which was changed to the Irish National League in the early 80s, having prepared the path to eventual victory, declined in potency after the political movement was divided into Parnellites and anti-Parnellites in 1890. The elements composing these rival parties were, through the initiative of William O'Brien, MP, and in commemoration of the 100th anniversary of the United Irishmen of Wolf Tones Day, joined in 1898 under the name of the United Irish League, John E. Redmond becoming the first president, and also the chairman of the Parliamentary Party, which it had been instrumental in uniting. This organization is now a living, vital force in the affairs of Ireland on both sides of the Atlantic. Mr. Redmond being still its head, with Michael J. Ryan of Philadelphia as president of the American branch. The Knights of Columbus were organized in 1881 by Reverend Michael McGivney in New Haven, Connecticut, and a charter was granted by the Connecticut legislature on March 29, 1882. At first, the activity of the organization was confined to Connecticut, but the time was ripe for its mission, and it soon spread rapidly throughout New England. 
In 1896, it began to attract the attention of Catholic young men in other parts of the nation, and during the next few years, its appeal was made irresistibly in almost every state. It now exists in all the states of the Union, the Dominion of Canada, Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, Panama, Puerto Rico, Mexico, Cuba, and the Philippine Islands, with a total membership of 328,000, of whom 108,000 are insurance members and 220,000 associate members. Its mortuary reserve fund is $4,500,000, being over $1 million more than is required by law. It is one of the most successful fraternal societies ever organized, and the Irish-American Catholics have given to it the full strength of their enthusiasm and purpose. The temperance movement among Catholics was, from the visit of Father Matthew in 1849, largely Irish. The societies first formed were united by no bond until 1871, when the Connecticut societies formed a state union. Other states formed unions, and a national convention in Baltimore in 1872 created a national union. In 1878, there were 90,000 priests, laymen, women, and children in the Catholic Total Abstinence Benevolent Union. In 1883, the union was introduced into Canada, and in 1895, there were 150,000 members on the American continent. From the CTABU were formed the Knights of Father Matthew, a total abstinence and semi-military body, first instituted in St. Louis in 1872. The Catholic Knights of America, with a membership chiefly Irish-American, were organized in Memphis, Tennessee in 1877, and the advantages offered for insurance soon attracted 20,000 members. The decade of the 70s was prolific of Irish Catholic associations. The Catholic Benevolent Legion was founded in 1873, shortly followed by the Catholic Mutual Benevolent Association, the Catholic Order of Foresters, which started in Massachusetts and spread to other states, the Irish Catholic Benevolent Union, and the Society of the Holy Name, which latter, although tracing its origin to Lisbon in 1432, is yet dominantly Irish in America. In the large industrial centers, there are scores of Irish county and other societies composed of Irishmen and Irish Americans, organized for the service of country and faith, beneficence and education, and all dedicated to the uplifting of humanity and to the progress of civilization. The ancient genius for organization has not been lost. The spirit of brotherhood pulsates strongly in the Irish heart, and through its powerful societies, the race retains its place in the advance of mankind. References John M. Campbell, History of the Friendly Sons of St. Patrick and Hibernian Society. McGuire, The Irish in America. McGee, Irish Settlers in America. John O'Day, History of the Ancient Order of Hibernians and Ladies' Auxiliary in America. Michael Davitt, The Fall of Feudalism in Ireland. Cashman, Life of Michael Davitt. T.P. O'Connor, The Parnell Movement. Joseph Deneef, Recollections of the Irish Revolutionary Brotherhood. Articles in the Catholic Encyclopedia. Report of the Knights of Columbus, 1914. The Tidings, Los Angeles, 7th Annual Edition. End of section 20. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Section 21 of The Glories of Ireland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate Fallis. The Glories of Ireland, edited by Joseph Dunn and P. J. Lennox. The Irish in the United States, Part One, by Michael J. O'Brien, historiographer, American Irish Historical Society. Students of early American history will find in the colonial records abundant evidence to justify the statement of ramsay the historian of south carolina when he wrote in seventeen hundred eighty nine that the colonies which now form the united states may be considered as europe transplanted ireland england scotland france germany holland switzerland sweden poland and italy furnished 
the original stock of the present population and are generally supposed to have contributed to it in the order named for the last seventy or eighty years no nation has contributed so much to the population of america as ireland it will be astonishing to one who looks into the question to find that in face of all the evidence that abounds in american annals showing that our people were here on this soil fighting the battles of the colonists and in a later day of the infant republic thus proving our claim to the gratitude of this nation america has produced men so ignoble and disingenuous as to say that the irish who were here in revolutionary days were for the most part heartily loyal that the combatants were of the same race and blood and that the great uprising became in fact a contest between brothers although many writers have made inquiries into this subject nearly all have confined themselves to the period of the revolution we are of the fighting race and in our enthusiasm for the fighting man the fact seems to have been overlooked that in other noble fields of endeavour and in some respects infinitely more important men of irish blood have occupied prominent places in american history for which they have received but scant recognition the pioneers before whose hands the primeval forests fell prostrate the builders by whose magic touch have sprung into existence flourishing towns and cities where once no sounds were heard save those of nature and her wildest offspring the orators who roused the colonists into activity and showed them the way to achieve their independence the schoolmasters who imparted to the american youth their first lessons in intellectuality and patriotism all have their place in history and of these we can claim that ireland furnished her full quota to the american colonies it must now be accepted as an indisputable fact that a very large proportion of the earliest settlers in the american colonies were of irish blood for the irish have been coming here since the beginning of the english colonization it has been estimated by competent authorities that in the middle of the seventeenth century the english-speaking colonists numbered fifty thousand sir william petty the english statistician tells us that during the decade from sixteen forty nine to sixteen fifty nine the annual emigration from ireland to the western continent was upwards of six thousand thus making in that space of time sixty thousand souls or about one-half of what the whole population must have been in sixteen fifty nine and from sixteen fifty nine to sixteen seventy two there emigrated from ireland to america the yearly number of three thousand dobbs on irish trade dublin seventeen twenty nine prendergast another noted authority in the cromwellian settlement of ireland furnishes ample verification of this by the statistics which he quotes from the english records richard hacklett the chronicler of the first virginia expeditions in his voyages navigations traffics and discoveries of the english nation london sixteen hundred shows that irishmen came with raleigh to virginia in fifteen eighty seven and in fact the ubiquitous celts were with sir john hawkins in his voyage to the gulf of mexico twenty years earlier the famous work of john camden hotton entitled the original lists of persons of quality emigrants religious exiles political rebels serving men sold for a term of years etc 
who were brought to the virginia plantations between sixteen hundred and seventeen hundred as well as his list of the living and the dead in virginia in sixteen twenty three contains numerous celtic names and further evidence of these continuous migrations of the irish is contained in a book of entry for passengers passing beyond the seas in the year sixteen thirty two the virginia records also show that as early as sixteen twenty one a colony of irish people sailed from cork in the flying heart under the patronage of sir william noose and located at what is now newport news and some few years later daniel gookin a merchant of cork transported hither great multitudes of people and cattle from england and ireland in the william and mary college quarterly in the transcripts of the original records published by the virginia historical society and in all county histories of virginia there are numerous references to the irish redemptioners who were brought to that colony during the seventeenth century but the redemptioners were not the only class who came for the colonial records also contain many references to irishmen of good birth and education who received grants of land in the colony and who in turn induced many of their countrymen to emigrate planters named mccarty lynch o'neill sullivan farrell macdonnell o'brien and others denoting an ancient irish lineage appear frequently in the early records much that is romantic is found in the lives of these men and their descendants some of them served in the council chamber and the field their sons and daughters were educated to hold place with elegance and dignity with the foremost of the cavaliers and when in after years the great conflict with england began virginians of irish blood were among the first and the most eager to answer the call those historians who claim that the south was exclusively an anglo-saxon heritage would be completely disillusioned were they to examine the lists of colonial and revolutionary troops of celtic name who held the indians and the british at bay and who helped in those troublous times to lay the foundations of a great republic there is no portion of the atlantic seaboard that did not profit by the irish immigrations of the seventeenth century we learn from the irish state papers of the year fifteen ninety five that ships were regularly plying between ireland and newfoundland and so important was the trade between ireland and the far distant fishing banks that all english ships bound out always made provisions that the convoy out should remain forty-eight hours in cork in some of lord baltimore's accounts of his voyages to newfoundland he refers to his having sailed from ireland and to his return to ireland and so it is highly probable that he settled irishmen on his avalon plantations after baltimore's departure lord falkland also sent out a number of irish colonists and at a later date they were so largely reinforced by settlers from ireland that the celtic part of the population at this day is not far short of equality in numbers with the saxon portion hatton and harvey history of newfoundland page thirty two Pedley attributes the large proportion of Irishmen and the influence of the Catholics in Newfoundland to Lord Falkland's company, and Prowse, in his history, pages 200 to 201, refers to the large number of Irishmen in that colony who fled from Waterford and Cork during the troubled times which preceded the Williamite War, 1688 many of these in after years are known to have settled in new england but it was to maryland and pennsylvania that the greatest flow of irish immigration directed its course 
in the celebrated account of the voyage to maryland written in the year sixteen thirty four by mucius vitalestus the general of the jesuit order it is related that when the ark and the dove arrived in the west indies in that year they found the island of montserrat inhabited by a colony of irishmen who had been banished from virginia on account of their professing the catholic faith it is known also that there were many families in ireland of substance and good social standing who at their own expense took a venture in the enterprise of lord baltimore and afterwards in that of william penn and who applied for and received grants of land which as the deeds on record show were afterwards divided into farms bought and settled by o'briens mccarthys o'connors and many other of the ancient gaelic race the descendants of those heroic men whose passion for liberty while causing their ruin inspired and impelled their sons to follow westward the star of empire after the first english colonies in maryland were founded we find in all the proclamations concerning these settlements by the proprietary government that they were limited to persons of british or irish descent the religious liberty established in maryland was the magnet which attracted irish catholics to that province and so they came in large numbers in search of peace and comfort and freedom from the turmoil produced by religious animosities in their native land the major part of this irish immigration seems to have come in through the ports of philadelphia and charleston and a portion through chesapeake bay whence they passed on to pennsylvania and the southern colonies the certificates of land grants in maryland show that it was customary for those irish colonists to name their lands after places in their native country and i find that there is hardly a town or city in the old gaelic strongholds in ireland that is not represented in the nomenclature of the early maryland grants one entire section of the province named the county of new ireland by proclamation of lord baltimore in the year sixteen eighty four was occupied wholly by irish families this section is now embraced in cecil and harford counties new ireland county was divided into three parts known as new connaught new munster and new leinster new connaught was founded by george talbot from roscommon who was surveyor general of the province new munster by edward o'dwyer from tipperary and new leinster by brian o'daly from wicklow all of whom were in maryland prior to sixteen eighty three among the prominent men in the province may be mentioned charles o'carroll who was secretary to the proprietor john hart from county cavan who was governor of maryland from seventeen fourteen to seventeen twenty philip connor from kerry known in history as the last commander of old kent daniel delaney of the o delaney family from queen's county one of the most famous lawyers in the american colonies michael tawney or taney ancestor of the celebrated judge roger brook taney the Corsies from Cork, one of the oldest families in the state, the Kings from Dublin, and many others. The only place in the state bearing a genuine Irish name which has reached any prominence is Baltimore. Not only has the monumental city received its name from Ireland, but the tract of land on which the city is now situate was originally named in 1695 eli o'carroll after the barony of that name in kings and tipperary counties the ancient home of the clan o'carroll to subdivisions of the tract were given such names as dublin waterford tralee rapo tramore mallow kinsale lurgan coleraine tipperary antrim belfast derry kildare enniskellen wexford letterkenny lifford burr galway limerick and so on all indicating the nationality of the patentees as well as the places from which they came 
from such sources is the evidence available of the coming of the irish to maryland in large numbers and so it is that we are not surprised to find on the rosters of the maryland revolutionary regiments four thousand six hundred thirty three distinctive irish names exclusive of the large numbers who joined the navy and the militia as well as those who were held to guard the frontier from indian raids whose names are not on record however it is not possible now to determine the proportion of the revolutionary soldiers who were of irish birth or descent for where the nationality is not stated in the rosters all non-irish names must be left out of the reckoning the first census of maryland seventeen hundred ninety published by the united states government enumerates the names of all heads of families and the number of persons in each family a count of the irish names shows approximately twenty one thousand persons this does not take into account the great number of people who could not be recorded under that head as it is known there were many thousand irish redemptioners in maryland prior to the taking of the census and while no precise data exist to indicate the number of irish immigrants who settled in maryland i estimate that the number of people of irish descent in the state in seventeen ninety was not far short of forty thousand the land records and council journals of georgia of the last half of the seventeenth and the first half of the eighteenth century afford like testimony to the presence of the irish who crossed the sea and colonized the waste places of that wild territory and whose descendants in after years contributed much of the strength of the patriot forces who confronted the armed cohorts of carleton and cornwallis from the colonial records of georgia published under the auspices of the state legislature i have extracted a long list of people of irish name and blood who received grants of land in that colony they came with oglethorpe as early as seventeen hundred thirty five and continued to arrive for many years it was an irishman named mitchell who laid out the site of atlanta the metropolis of the south an o'brien founded the city of augusta and a mccormick named the city of dublin georgia from the records of the carolinas we obtain similar data many of an absorbingly interesting character and the number of places in that section bearing names of a decidedly celtic flavor is striking evidence of the presence of irish people the line of whose settlements across the whole state of north carolina may be traced on the high roads leading from pennsylvania and virginia hawk one of the historians of north carolina refers to the irish romanists who were resident in that province as early as seventeen hundred and williamson says that the most numerous settlers in the northwestern part of the province during the first half of the eighteenth century were from ireland the manuscript records in the office of the secretary of state refer to a shipload of immigrants who in the year seventeen sixty one came to the carolinas from dublin the names of the irish pioneers in the carolinas are found in every conceivable connection in the parochial and court records in the will books in the minutes of the general assembly in the quaint old records of the land and registers offices in the patents granted by the colonial government and in sundry other official records in public affairs they seem to have had the same adaptability for politics which among other things has in later days brought their countrymen into prominence florence o'sullivan from Kerry was surveyor general of south carolina in sixteen seventy one james moore a native of ireland and a descendant of the famous irish chieftain rory o'more was governor of south carolina in seventeen hundred matthew rowan from carrickfergus was president of the north carolina council 
during the term of office of his townsman governor arthur dobbs seventeen fifty four to seventeen sixty four john connor was attorney-general of the province in seventeen thirty and was succeeded in turn by david o'shiel and thomas mcguire cornelius hartnett hugh waddell and terence sweeney all irishmen were members of the court and among the members of the provincial assembly i find such names as murphy leary kearney mcluhan dunn keenan mcmanus ryan bourke logan and others showing an irish origin and in this connection we must not overlook thomas burke a native of the city of the tribes distinguished as lawyer soldier and statesman who became governor of north carolina in seventeen eighty one as did his cousin adnes burke also from galway who was judge of the supreme court of south carolina in seventeen seventy eight john rutledge son of dr john rutledge from ireland was governor of south carolina in seventeen seventy six and his brother edward became governor of the state in seventeen eighty eight but there were irishmen in the carolinas long before the advent of these and indeed irish names are found occasionally as far back as the records of those colonies reach they are scattered profusely through the will-books and records of deeds as early as sixteen seventy six and down to the end of the century and in a list of immigrants from barbados in the year sixteen seventy eight quoted by john camden hotton in the work already alluded to we find about one hundred twenty persons of irish name who settled in the carolinas in that year in seventeen nineteen five hundred persons from ireland transported themselves to carolina to take the benefit of an act passed by the assembly by which the lands of the yamasee indians were thrown open to settlers and ramsay history of south carolina volume one page twenty says of all countries none has furnished the province with so many inhabitants as ireland in the pennsylvania records one is also struck with the very frequent mention of irish names william penn had lived in ireland for several years and was acquainted with the sturdy character of its people and when he arrived on board the welcome in sixteen eighty two he had with him a number of irishmen who are described as people of property and people of consequence in sixteen ninety nine he brought over a brilliant young irishman james logan from lurgan who for nearly half a century occupied a leading position in the province and for some time was its governor but the first irish immigration to pennsylvania of any numerical importance came in the year seventeen seventeen they settled in lancaster county they and their descendants says rupp an impartial historian have always been justly regarded as among the most intelligent people in the county and their progress will be found to be but little behind the boasted efforts of the colony of plymouth in seventeen twenty seven as the records show one thousand one hundred fifty five irish people arrived in philadelphia and in seventeen twenty eight the number reached the high total of five thousand six hundred it looks as if ireland is to send all her inhabitants hither wrote secretary logan to the provincial proprietors in seventeen twenty nine for last week not less than six ships arrived the common fear is that if they continue to come they will make themselves proprietors of the province rupp's history of dauphin county the continuous stream of irish immigration was viewed with so much alarm by the legislature that in seventeen twenty eight a law was passed against these crowds of irish papists and convicts who are yearly powered upon us the convicts being the political refugees who fled from the persecutions of the english government 
but the operations of this statute were wholly nullified by the captains of the vessels landing their passengers at newcastle delaware and burlington new jersey and as one instance of this i find in the philadelphia american weekly mercury of august fourteenth seventeen twenty nine a statement to this effect it is reported from newcastle that there arrived there this last week about two thousand irish and an abundance more daily expected this expectation was realized for according to an account of passengers and servants landed in philadelphia between december twenty fifth seventeen twenty eight and december twenty fifth seventeen twenty nine which I find in the New England Weekly Journal for March 30th, 1730, the number of Irish who came in via the Delaware River in that year was 5,655, while the total number of all other Europeans who arrived during the same period was only 553. Holmes, in his Annals of America, corroborates this. The Philadelphia newspapers down to the year 1741 also contained many similar references, indicating that the flood of Irish immigration was unceasing, and that it was at all times in excess of that from other European countries. Later issues of the Mercury also published accounts of the number of ships from Ireland which arrived in the Delaware and from these it appears that from 1735 to 1738 sixty-six vessels entered Philadelphia from Ireland and fifty cleared thereto. And in the New York Gazette and Weekly Postboy of the years 1750 to 1752, I find under the caption, Vessels Registered at the Philadelphia Custom House, a total of 183 ships destined from or to Ireland, or an average of five sailings per month between Irish ports and the port of Philadelphia alone. A careful search fails to disclose any record of the number of persons who came in these ships, but from the fact that it is stated that all carried passengers as well as merchandise from Irish ports, we may safely assume that the human freight must have been very large. Spencer, in his History of the United States, says, In the years 1771 and 1772, the number of emigrants to America from Ireland was 17,350, almost all of whom emigrated at their own expense. A great majority of them consisted of persons employed in the linen manufacture or farmers possessed of some property, which they converted into money and brought with them. Within the first fortnight of August 1773, there arrived at Philadelphia 3,500 immigrants from Ireland, as most of the emigrants, particularly those from Ireland and Scotland, were personally discontent with their treatment in Europe. Their accession to the colonial population, it might reasonably be supposed, had no tendency to diminish or counteract the hostile sentiments toward Britain which were daily gathering force in America. Marmion, in his Ancient and Modern History of the Maritime Ports of Ireland, verifies this. He says that the number of Irish who came during the years 1771, 1772, and 1773 was 25,000. The bulk of these came in by way of Philadelphia and settled in Pennsylvania and the Virginias. The Irish were arriving in the province in such great numbers during this period as to be the cause of considerable jealousy on the part of other settlers from continental Europe. They were a vigorous and aggressive element, eager for that freedom which was denied them at home. Large numbers of them went out on the frontier. While the war whoop of the savage still echoed within the surrounding valleys, and his council fires blazed upon the hills, 
those daring adventurers penetrated the hitherto pathless wilderness and passed through unexampled hardships with heroic endurance they opened up the roads bridged the streams and cut down the forests turning the wilderness into a place fit for man's abode with their sturdy sons they constituted the skirmish line of civilization standing as a bulwark against indian incursions into the more prosperous and populous settlements between them and the coast from seventeen forty down to the period of the revolution hardly a year passed without a fresh infusion of irish blood into the existing population and as an indication that they distributed themselves all over the province i find in every town and county history of pennsylvania and in the land records of every section irish names in the greatest profusion they settled in great numbers chiefly along the susquehanna and its tributaries they laid out many prosperous settlements in the wilderness of western pennsylvania and in these sections irishmen are seen occupying some of the foremost and most coveted positions and their sons in after years contributed much to the power and commercial greatness of the commonwealth they are mentioned prominently as manufacturers merchants and farmers and in the professions they occupied a place second to none among the natives of the state in several sections they were numerous enough to establish their own independent settlements to which they gave the names of their irish home places several of which are preserved to this day it is not to be wondered at then that general harry lee named the pennsylvania line of the continental army the line of ireland ireland gave many eminent men to the commonwealth among whom may be mentioned john burns its first governor after the adoption of the constitution who was born in dublin george bryan also a native of dublin who was its governor in seventeen eighty eight james o'hara one of the founders of pittsburgh thomas fitzsimmons a native of limerick member of the first congress under the constitution which began the united states government and father of the policy of protection to american industries matthew carey from dublin the famous political economist and many others who were prominent as nation builders in the early days of the keystone state while the historians usually give all the credit to england and to english men for the early colonization of new england whose results have been attended with such important consequences to america and the civilized world ireland and her sons can also claim a large part in the development of this territory as is evidenced by the town land church and other colonial records and the names of the pioneers as well as the names given to several of the early settlements that the irish had been coming to new england almost from the beginning of the english colonization is indicated by an order entered in the massachusetts record under date of september twenty fifth sixteen thirty four granting liberty to the scottish and irish gentlemen who intend to come hither to sit down in any place up merrimack river this doubtless referred to a scotch and irish company which about that time had announced its intention of founding a settlement on the merrimack it comprised in all one hundred forty passengers who embarked in the eagle wing from carrick fergus in september sixteen hundred thirty six bringing with them a considerable quantity of equipment and merchandise to meet the exigencies of their settlement in the new country the vessel however never reached its destination and was obliged to return to ireland on account of the atlantic storms and there is no record of a renewal of the attempt in the massachusetts records of the year sixteen hundred forty volume one page two hundred ninety five is another entry relating to the persons come from ireland and in the town books of boston may be seen references to irishmen who were residents of the town in that year 
from local histories which in many cases are but verbatim copies of the original entries in the town books we get occasional glimpses of the irish who were in the colony of massachusetts bay between this period and the end of the century for example between 1640 and 1660, such names as O'Neill, Sexton, Gibbons, Lynch, Keeney, Kelly, and Hogan appear on the town records of Hartford, and one of the first schoolmasters who taught the children of the Puritans in New Haven was an Irishman named William Collins, who in the year 1640 came there with a number of Irish refugees from Barbados Island. An Irishman named Joseph Collins, with his wife and family, came to Lynn, Massachusetts, in 1635. Richard Duffy and Matthias Curran were at Ipswich in 1633. John Kelly came to Newbury in 1635 with the first English settlers of the town. David O'Killia, or O'Kelly, was a resident of Old Yarmouth in 1657, and I find on various records of that section a great number of people named Kelly, who probably were descended from David O'Killia. Peter O'Kelly and his family are mentioned as of Dorchester in 1696. At Springfield in 1656, there were families named Riley and O'Day, and Richard Burke, said to be of the male family of that name, is mentioned prominently in Middlesex County as early as 1670. The first legal instrument of record in Hampton County was a deed of conveyance in the year 1683 to one Patrick Riley of Lands in Chicopee, with a number of his countrymen, riley located in this vicinity and gave the name of ireland parish to their settlement john maloney and daniel mcginnis were at woburn in sixteen seventy six and michael bacon an irishman of woburn fought in king philip's war in sixteen seventy five john joyce was at lynn in sixteen thirty seven and i find the names of william healy william rail william barrett and roger burke signed to a petition to the general court of massachusetts on august seventeenth sixteen sixty four such names as mccarty gleason coggan lawler kelly hurley mcquaid and mccleary also appear on the cambridge church records down to sixteen ninety these are but desultory instances of the first comers among the irish to massachusetts selected from a great mass of similar data in the early history of every town in massachusetts without exception i find mention of irish people and while the majority came originally as poor redemptioners yet in course of time and despite puritanical prejudices not a few of them rose to positions of worth and independence perhaps the most noted of these was matthew lyon of vermont known as the hampton of congress who on his arrival in new york in seventeen sixty five was sold as a redemptioner to pay his passage money this distinguished american was a native of county wicklow other notable examples of irish redemptioners who attained eminence in america were george taylor a native of dublin one of pennsylvania's signers of the declaration of independence charles thompson a native of county tyrone the perennial secretary of the continental congress and william killen who became chief justice and chancellor of delaware some of the descendants of the irish redemptioners in massachusetts are found among the prominent new englanders of the past hundred years the puritans of massachusetts extended no welcoming hand to the irish who had the temerity to come among them yet as an historical writer has truly said by one of those strange transformations which time occasionally works it has come to pass that massachusetts to-day contains more people of irish blood in proportion to the total population than any other state in the union 
so great and so continuous was irish immigration to massachusetts during the early part of the eighteenth century that on st patrick's day in the year seventeen thirty seven a number of merchants who described themselves as of the irish nation residing in boston formed the charitable irish society an organization which exists even to the present day it was provided that the officers should be natives of ireland or of irish extraction and they announced that the society was organized in an affectionate and compassionate concern for their countrymen in these parts who may be reduced by sickness shipwreck old age and other infirmities and unforeseen accidents i have copied from the town books as reproduced by the city of boston one thousand six hundred irish names of persons who were married or had declared their intentions of marriage in boston between the years seventeen ten and seventeen ninety exclusive of nine hundred fifty six other irish names which appear on the minutes between seventeen twenty and seventeen seventy five in seventeen eighteen one of the largest single colonies of irish arrived in boston it consisted of one hundred families who settled at different places in massachusetts one contingent headed by edward fitzgerald located at worcester and another at palmer under the leadership of robert farrell while a number went to the already established settlement at londonderry new hampshire about the same time a colony of fishermen from the west coast of ireland settled on the cape cod peninsula and i find a number of them recorded on the marriage registers of the towns in this vicinity between seventeen nineteen and seventeen forty three in seventeen twenty a number of families from county tyrone came to shrewsbury and eight years later another large contingent came to leicester county from the same neighborhood who gave the name of dublin to the section where they located the annals of leicester county are rich in irish names on the town books of various places in this vicinity and on the rosters of the troops enrolled for the indian war irishmen are recorded and we learn from the records that not a few of them were important and useful men active in the development of the settlements and often chosen as selectmen or representatives on the minutes of the meetings of the selectmen of pelham spencer sutton charleston canton situate stoughton salem amesbury stoneham and other massachusetts towns irish names are recorded many years before the revolution in local histories these people are usually called scotch-irish a racial misnomer that has been very much overworked by a certain class of historical writers who seem to be unable to understand that a non-catholic native of ireland can be an irishman in an exhaustive study of american history i cannot find any other race where such a distinction is drawn as in the case of the non-catholic or so-called scotch irish in many instances this hybrid racial designation obviously springs from prejudice and a desire to withhold from ireland any credit that may belong to her although in some cases the writers are genuinely mistaken in their belief that the scotch as a race are the antithesis of the irish and that whatever commendable qualities the non-catholic irish are possessed of naturally spring from the scotch the first recorded irish settlement in maine was made by families named kelly and haley from galway who located on the Isles of Shoals about the year 1653. In 1692, Roger Kelly was a representative from the Isles to the General Court of Massachusetts and is described in local annals as King of the Isles. The large number of islands, bays, and promontories on the main coast bearing distinctive celtic names attest the presence and influence of irish people in this section in colonial times 
in seventeen twenty robert temple from cork brought to maine five shiploads of people mostly from the province of munster they landed at the junction of the kennebec and eastern rivers where they established the town of cork which however after a precarious existence of only six years was entirely destroyed by the indians for nearly a century the place was familiarly known to the residents of the locality as ireland the records of york lincoln and cumberland counties contain references to large numbers of irish people who settled in those localities during the early years of the eighteenth century the town books of georgetown curdery and kennebunkport of the period seventeen forty to seventeen seventy five are especially rich in irish names and in the saco valley numerous settlements were made by irish immigrants not a few of whom are referred to by local historians as men of wealth and social standing in the marriage and other records of limerick maine as published by the maine historical and genealogical recorder in the marriage registers of the first congregational church of scarborough and in other similarly unquestionable records i find a surprisingly large number of irish names at various periods during the seventeenth and eighteenth centuries in fact there is not one town in the province that did not have its quota of irish people who came either direct from ireland or migrated from other sections of new england the records of new hampshire and rhode island are also a fruitful source of information on this subject and the provincial papers indicate an almost unbroken tide of irish immigration to this section beginning as early as the year sixteen forty one of the most noted of exeter's pioneer settlers was an irishman named darby field who came to that place in sixteen thirty one and who has been credited by governor winthrop as the first european who witnessed the white mountains he is also recorded as an irish soldier for discovery and i find his name in the annals of exeter as one of the grantees of an indian deed dated april third sixteen hundred thirty eight as well as several other irish names down to the year sixteen sixty four in examining the town registers gazetteers and genealogies as well as the local histories of new hampshire in which are embodied copies of the original entries made by the town clerks i find numerous references to the irish pioneers and in many instances they are written down among others as the first settlers some are mentioned as selectmen town clerks representatives or colonial soldiers and it is indeed remarkable that there is not one of these authorities that i have examined out of more than two hundred that does not contain irish names from these irish pioneers sprang many men who attained prominence in new hampshire in the legislature the professions the military the arts and crafts and in all departments of civil life down to the present time in the marriage registers of portsmouth boscoin new boston antrim londonderry and other new hampshire towns are recorded in some cases as early as seventeen sixteen names of irish persons with the places of their nativity indicating that they came from all parts of ireland at hampton i find humphrey sullivan teaching school in seventeen fourteen while the name of john sullivan from limerick schoolmaster at dover and at berwick maine for upwards of fifty years is one of the most honored in early new hampshire history this john sullivan was surely one of the grandest characters in the colony of massachusetts bay and the record of his descendants serves as an all-sufficient reply to the anti-irish prejudices of some american historians he was the father of a governor of new hampshire and of a governor of massachusetts of an attorney-general of new hampshire and of an attorney-general of massachusetts of new hampshire's only major-general in the continental army 
of the first judge appointed by washington in new hampshire and of four sons who were officers in the continental army he was grandfather of an attorney general of new hampshire of a governor of maine and of a united states senator from new hampshire he was great-grandfather of an attorney general of new hampshire and great-great-grandfather of an officer in the thirteenth new hampshire regiment in the civil war in rhode island irish people are on record as far back as sixteen forty and for many years after that date they continued to come edward larkin was an esteemed citizen of newport in sixteen fifty five charles mccarthy was one of the founders of the town of east greenwich in 1677 while in this vicinity as early as 1680 are found such names as casey higgins mcginnis kelly murphy riley maloney healy delaney walsh and others of irish origin on the rosters of the colonial militia who fought in king philip's war 1675 are found the names of one hundred ten soldiers of irish birth or descent some of whom for their services at the battle of narragansett received grants of land in new hampshire and massachusetts the new england historical and genealogical register for eighteen forty eight contains some remarkable testimony of the sympathy of the people of ireland for the sufferers in this cruel war and the irish donation sent out from dublin in the year sixteen seventy six will always stand in history to ireland's credit and as an instance of her intimate familiarity with american affairs one hundred years prior to that revolution which emancipated the people of this land from the same tyranny under which she herself has groaned and yet what a cruel travesty on history it reads like now when we scan the official records of the new england colonies and find that the irish were often called convicts and it was thought that measures should be taken to prevent their landing on the soil where they and their sons afterwards shed their blood in the cause of their fellow colonists in the minutes of the provincial assemblies and in the reports rendered to the general court as well as in other official documents of the period are found expressions of the sentiment which prevailed against the natives of the island of sorrows only twenty years before the outbreak of king philip's war the government of england was asked to provide a law to prevent the importation of irish pappas and convicts that are yearly powered upon us and to make provision against the growth of this pernicious evil and the colonial courts themselves on account of what they called the cruel and malignant spirit that has from time to time been manifest in the irish nation against the english nation prohibited the bringing over of any irish men women or children into this jurisdiction on the penalty of fifty pounds sterling to each inhabitant who shall buy of any merchant shipmaster or other agent any such person or persons so transported by them this order was promulgated by the general court of massachusetts in october sixteen fifty four and is given in full in the american historical review for october eighteen ninety six with the convicts and the redemptioners came the irish schoolmaster the man then most needed in america and the fighting man he too was to the fore for when the colonies in after years called for volunteers to resist the tyranny of the british the descendants of the irish convicts were among the first and the most eager to answer the call End of section 21section twenty two of the glories of ireland this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org recording by kate fallis the glories of ireland edited by joseph dunn and p j lennox 
the irish in the united states part two by michael j o'brien historiographer american irish historical society although it does not appear that irish immigrants settled in the province of new york in such large numbers as in other sections yet as far back as the third quarter of the seventeenth century irish names are found on the records of the colony o'callaghan the eminent archivist and historian refers to dr william hayes formerly of Barry's Court, Ireland, as one of New York's physicians in the year 1647, and from the same authority we learn that there were settlers and Indian fighters in New Netherland named Barrett, Fitzgerald, Dowdell, Collins, and Quinn in 1657. In records relating to the war with the Esopus Indians, 1663, and in fact as early as 1658, frequent references are made to Thomas the Irishman, whose name was Thomas Lewis, a refugee from Ireland to Holland after the Cromwellian War. Lewis is on record in 1683 as one of the wealthiest merchants of New York and a large owner of real estate in the present downtown portion of the city. Such names as Patrick Hayes, John Daly, John Quigley, and Dennis McCarty appear among its businessmen between 1666 and 1672 and in a census of the city of new york of the year seventeen hundred three we find people named flynn walsh dooley gillen carroll ken gurney hart mooney moran lynch carney and others all free men of the city of new york in the poll list of the city from seventeen forty one to seventeen sixty one more than one hundred such names appear, while among the advertisers in the New York newspapers all through the 18th century I find a large number of characteristic Irish names. One would scarcely expect to find an Irishman in the old Dutch settlement of Beverwick as early as 1645. Yet such is the case, for Jan Andreessen, the Irishman von Dublin, John Anderson, the Irishman from Dublin, is mentioned as the owner of considerable landed property in the neighborhood of Albany and Catskill, and in every mention of this ancient pioneer, he is referred to as the Irishman. At Albany, between 1666 and 1690, we find people named Connell, Daly, Larkin, Shaw, Hogan, and Finn, all Irishmen, and in Jonathan Pearson's Genealogies of the First Settlers of the Ancient County of Albany, and in his Genealogies of the First Settlers of the Patent and City of Schenectady, I find 135 distinctive Irish names. These were mostly merchants, farmers, artisans, millers, and backwoodsmen, the pioneers, who, with their Dutch neighbors, blazed the trail of civilization through that section, rolled back the savage red man, and marked along the banks of the Hudson and Mohawk rivers the sites of future towns and cities. In the rate lists of Long Island between 1638 and 1675, I find Kelly, Dalton, Whalen, Condon, Barry, Powers, Quinn, Kane, Sweeney, Murphy, Riley, as well as Norman English and Anglo-Irish names that are common to Irish nomenclature. Hugh O'Neill was a prominent resident of Newtown, Long Island, in 1655. In a report to the Lord President, dated September 6, 1687, Governor Dongan recommended that natives of Ireland be sent to colonize here, where they may live and be very happy. Numbers of them evidently accepted the invitation, for many Irishmen are mentioned in the public documents of the province during the succeeding twenty years. 
that the irish continued to settle in the province all through the eighteenth century may be seen from the announcements in the new york newspapers of the time and other authentic records the most important of these in point of numbers and character of the immigrants were those made in orange county in seventeen twenty nine under the leadership of james clinton from longford and at cherry valley in otsego county twelve years later on the orange county assessment and revolutionary rolls and down to the year eighteen hundred there is a very large number of irish names and in some sections they constituted nearly the entire population in the northwestern part of new york irishmen are also found about the time of the franco-english war they were not only among those settlers who followed the peaceful pursuits of tilling and building but they were the men behind the guns who held the marauding indians in check and repelled the advances of the french through that territory in this war irish soldiers fought on both sides and in the journals of the marquis of montcalm may be seen references to the english garrison at oswego which in august seventeen fifty six surrendered to that same irish brigade by which they had been defeated eleven years before on the battlefield of fontenoy in the manuscripts of sir william johnson are also found some interesting items indicating that irishmen were active participants in the frontier fighting about that time and in one report to him dated may twenty eighth seventeen fifty six from the commandant of an english regiment reference is made to the great numbers of irish papists among the delaware and susquehanna indians who have done a world of prejudice to english interests the early records with hardly an exception contain irish names showing that the exiles from erin came to the province of new york in considerable numbers during the eighteenth century the baptismal and marriage records of the dutch reformed and protestant churches of new york city of the dutch churches at kingston albany schenectady and other towns the muster rolls of the troops enrolled for the french indian and revolutionary wars the land grants and other provincial records at albany the newspapers the town county and family histories and other early chronicles supplemented by authoritative publications such as those of the new york historical and genealogical and biographical societies these are the depositories of the evidence that thousands of irish people settled in the province of new york and constituted no inconsiderable proportion of the total population the majority of the irish residents of new york whose marriages are recorded in the dutch reformed church were doubtless of the catholic faith but as it was necessary to comply with the established law and also so that their offspring might be legitimate they could be bound in wedlock only by a recognized minister of the gospel as there was no catholic church in new york prior to seventeen eighty six the ceremony had to be performed in the dutch reformed or protestant church many of these catholics were refugees from ireland on account of the religious persecutions like the people of ireland in all ages they were devoted to their religion and while no doubt they eschewed for a while association with the established churches yet as time went on they and their children were gradually drawn into religious intercourse with the other sects until eventually they became regular communicants of those churches the variations which from time to time were wrought in their names brought them further and further away from what they had been in their new surroundings both social and religious they themselves changed so that their children who in many cases married into the neighboring dutch and french families became as wholly un-irish in manner and sentiment as if they had sprung from an entirely different race that fact however does not admit of their being now included in the category anglo-saxon in a work entitled names of persons for whom marriage licenses were issued by the secretary of the province of new york 
previous to 1784, compiled by Gideon J. Tucker, when Secretary of State, and taken from the early records of the office of the Secretary of State at Albany, we find ample corroboration of the church records. Page after page of this book looks more like some record of the province of Munster than of the province of New York. It is a quarto volume printed in small type in double columns, and there are eleven pages wholly devoted to persons whose names commence with Mac and three to the O's. Nearly every name common to Ireland is here represented. New York, as a province and as a state, is much indebted to Irish genius. Ireland gave the province its most noted governor in the person of Thomas Dongan from County Kildare, and in later years Sir William Johnson from County Meath, governor of the Indians from New York to the Mississippi. It gave the state its first governor, George Clinton, son of an immigrant from County Longford, and to the city its first mayor after the Revolution, James Duane, son of Anthony Duane from County Galway. Fulton, an Irishman's son, gave America priority in the conquest of the seas. Christopher Collis, a native of Cork, was the originator of the grand scheme which united the waters of the Atlantic and the lakes, one of the greatest works of internal improvement ever effected in the United States, while the gigantic project was carried to a successful end through the influence and direction of Governor DeWitt Clinton, the grandson of an Irishman. Many of the pioneer settlers of New Jersey were Irish. As early as 1683, a colony from Tipperary in Ireland, located at Cohansey in Salem County, and in the same year a number of settlers, also described as from Tipperary, Ireland, located in Monmouth County. In the county records of New Jersey, Irish names are met with frequently between the years 1676 and 1698. Several of the local historians testify to the presence and influence of Irishmen in the early days of the colony, and in the voluminous New Jersey archives may be found references to the large number of Irish redemptioners, some of whom, after their terms of service had expired, received grants of land, and in time became prosperous farmers and merchants. Perhaps the most noted Irishman in New Jersey in colonial days was Michael Carney, a native of Cork and ancestor of General Philip Carney of Civil War fame, who was secretary and treasurer of the province in 1723. All through the West and Southwest, Irishmen are found in the earliest days of authentic history. Along the Ohio, Kentucky, Wabash, and Tennessee rivers, they were the pioneers who first trod the wilderness of that vast territory. As early as 1690, an Irish trader named Doherty crossed the mountains into what is now Kentucky, and we are told by Filson, the noted French historian and explorer of Kentucky, that the first white man who discovered this region, 1754, was one James McBride, who, in all probability, was an Irishman. The first white child born in Cincinnati was a son of an Irish settler named John Cummins. The first house built on its site was erected by Captain Hugh McGarry, while the McGarrys, Dentons, and Hogans formed the first domestic circle in Kentucky. Prior to the Revolution, Indian traders from western Pennsylvania had penetrated into this region, and we learn from authentic sources that no small percentage of those itinerant merchants of the West were Irishmen. Among the leading and earliest colonists of the Bluegrass State, who accompanied Daniel Boone, the ubiquitous Irish were represented by men bearing such names as Mooney, McManus, Sullivan, Drennan, Logan, Casey, Fitzpatrick, Dunlevy, Cassidy, Duran, Doherty, Lynch, Ryan, McNeil, McGee, Riley, Flynn, and the noted McAfee brothers, all natives of Ireland or sons of Irish immigrants. Irishmen and their sons 
figured prominently in the field of early western politics in the kentucky legislature i find such names as connor cassidy cleary conway casey cavan doolin doherty geohagan mayer morrison moran mcmahon mcfall mcclanahan o'bannon powers and a number of others evidently of irish origin on the bench we find o'hara boyle and barry among the many distinguished men who reflected honor upon the west judge william t barry of lexington ranks high for great ability and lofty virtues simon kenton famed in song and story who battled with the indians in a hundred encounters and wrested kentucky from the savage was an irishman's son while among its famous indian fighters were colonels andrew hines william casey and john o'bannon majors bulger mcmullen mcgarry mcbride butler and cassidy and captains mcmahon malarkey doyle phelan and brady allen butler campbell montgomery and rowan counties kentucky are named after natives of ireland and boyle breckinridge carroll casey davies mcgoffin kenton mccracken meade menifee clinton and fulton counties were named in honor of descendants of irish settlers in the councils of the first territorial legislature of missouri were sullivan cassidy murphy mcdermott mcgrady flowerty mcguire dunn and hogan and among the merchants lawyers and bankers in the pioneer days of st louis there were a number of irishmen the most noted of whom melanfi gilhuley o'fallon connor o'hara dillon rankin mcginnis and walsh in all early histories of missouri towns and counties irish names are mentioned and in many instances they are on record as the first settlers and so it was all through the west in ohio indiana iowa and illinois across the rolling prairies and the mountains beyond the mississippi and the missouri in the earliest days of colonization of that vast territory we can follow the irish trek in quest of new homes and fortunes they were part of that irresistible human current that swept beyond the ranges of colorado and kansas and across the sierra nevada until it reached the pacific and in the forefront of those pathfinders and pioneers we find martin murphy the first to open a wagon trail to california from the east the names of don timoteo murphy of jasper o'farrell of dolans burks breens and hallorans are linked with the annals of the coast while that territory was still under spanish rule and when fremont crossed the plains and planted the bear flag beyond the sierras we find irishmen among his trusted lieutenants an irishman captain patrick connor first penetrated the wilderness of utah a descendant of an irishman hall j kelly was the explorer of oregon philip nolan and thomas o'connor were foremost among those brave spirits whose daring and persistency finally added the lone star state to the american union and the famous arctic explorer scientist and scholar dr alicia kent kane was a descendant of john o'kane who came from ireland to the province of new york in seventeen fifty two to form any reliable estimate of the numerical strength of the irish and their descendants in the united states would i believe be a hopeless task and while several have attempted to do so i am of the opinion that all such estimates should be discarded as mere conjecture indeed there is no standard or fixed rule or principle by which a correct judgment of the racial composition of the early inhabitants of the united states can now be formed and the available statistics on the subject are incomplete and confusing the greatest obstacle in determining this question is found in the names of the immigrants themselves with names such as smith mason carpenter and taylor white brown black and gray forest wood mountain and vale and 
other names that are similarly derived the first thought is that they are of english origin yet we know that for centuries past such names have been numerous in ireland and there are many irish families so named who are of as pure celtic blood as any bearing the old gaelic patronymics by a law passed in the second year of the reign of edward the fourth natives of ireland were forced to adopt english surnames this act was substantially as follows an act that irishmen dwelling in the counties of etc shall go apparelled like englishmen and wear their beards in english manner swear allegiance and take english surnames which surnames shall be of one town as sutton chester trim scrin cork kinsale or colours as white black brown or arts or sciences as smith or carpenter or office as cook butler etc and it is enacted that he and his issue shall use his name under pain of forfeiting of his goods yearly etc this act could be enforced only upon those irish families who dwelt within the reach of english law and as emigrants from those districts deprived of their pure celtic names came to america in an english guise and in english vessels they were officially recorded as english moreover numbers of irish frequently crossed the channel and began their voyage from english ports where they had to take on new names sometimes arbitrarily and sometimes voluntarily for purposes of concealment either by transforming their original names into english or adopting names similar to those above referred to these names were generally retained on this side of the atlantic so as not to arouse the prejudice of their english neighbours in complying with the statute above quoted some irish families accepted the rather doubtful privilege of translating their names into their english equivalents we have examples of this in such names as summers anglicized from mcgoran presumably derived from the gaelic word signifying summer smith from mcgowan meaning the son of the smith jackson and johnson a literal translation from mcshane meaning the son of john and whitcomb from cairnan meaning literally a white comb in addition to this in the case of some of those irish immigrants whose family names were not changed in ireland their descendants appear in a much disguised form in the colonial records through the mistakes of clergymen court clerks registrars and others who had difficulty in pronouncing gaelic names letters became inserted or dropped and the names were written down phonetically in the mutations of time even these names became still further changed and we find that the descendants of the irish themselves after the lapse of a generation or two deliberately changed their names usually by suppressing the milesian prefixes mac and o thus we have the laughlin and claflin families who are descended from a mclaughlin an irish settler in massachusetts in the seventeenth century the bryans from william o'brien a captain in sarfield's army who after the fall of limerick in sixteen ninety one settled in pasquatank county north carolina and one of whose descendants is william jennings bryan now secretary of state the donnells of maine from an o'donnell who located in the saco valley and at the land office at annapolis i have found the descendants of roger odu who came to maryland about sixteen sixty five recorded under the surnames of roger du and dewey i find dennis odive or odeer written down on the talbot county maryland records of the year sixteen sixty seven with his name reversed and to-day his descendants are known as dennis 
many such instances appear in the early records and when we find a new england family rejoicing in the name of navalis we know that the limit has been reached and while we cannot admire the attempt to disguise an ancient and honourable name we are amused at the obvious transposition of sullivan thus we see that numerous though the old irish names are on american records they do not by any means indicate the extent of the celtic element which established itself in the colonies so that there is really no means of determining exactly what ireland has contributed to the american commonwealth we only know that a steady stream of irish immigrants has crossed the seas to the american continent beginning with the middle of the seventeenth century and that many of those exiles from erin or their sons became prominent as leaders in every station in life in the new country nor is the first census of the united states any criterion in this regard for the obvious reason that the enumerators made no returns of unmarried persons this fact is important when we consider that the irish exodus of the eighteenth century was largely comprised of the youth of the country although the first census was made in seventeen ninety the first regular record of immigration was not begun until thirty years later and it is only from the records kept after that time that we can depend upon actual official figures during the decade following eighteen twenty ireland contributed more than forty per cent of the entire immigration to america from all european countries and the irish emigration statistics show that between eighteen thirty and nineteen o seven the number of people who left ireland was six million forty nine thousand four hundred thirty two the majority of whom came to america the Westminster Review, volume 133, page 293, in an article on the Irish Americans, puts a series of questions as follows. Is the American Republic in any way indebted to those Irish citizens? Have they, with their large numbers, high social standing, great places of trust, contributed aught to her glory, or added aught to her commercial greatness, refined her social taste, or assisted in laying the foundations of the real happiness of her people, the real security of her laws, the influence of her civic virtues, which more than anything else give power and permanency to a nascent and mighty nation? The answer is unquestionably a affirmative we have only to look back on the past and to scan the present state of american affairs to feel certain of this if it be further asked does this statement stand the test of strict investigation the answer must also be in the affirmative for in almost every line of progress the irish in america have contributed their share of leaders and pioneers thus proving that there are characteristics among even the poor Irish driven to emigration for an existence that are as capable of development as those possessed by any other race. When we scan the intellectual horizon, we see many men of great force of character, preachers and teachers, statesmen and scholars, philanthropists and founders of institutions, scientists and engineers, historians and journalists, artists and authors, lawyers and doctors, of Celtic race and blood, while in the industrial field, as builders of steamships and railroads, and promoters of public works, as merchants, manufacturers, and bankers, and in all other fields of endeavor, we find the american irish controlling factors in the upbuilding of the republic of the signers of the declaration of independence thornton taylor and smith were natives of ireland mckean reed and rutledge were of irish parentage lynch and carroll were grandsons of irishmen whipple and hancock were of irish descent on the maternal side and o'hart irish pedigrees 
declares that robert treat payne was a great-grandson of henry o'neill hereditary prince of ulster who changed his name to that of one of his maternal ancestors so as to save his estates it was an irishman who first read the immortal document to the public an irishman first printed it and an irishman published it for the first time with facsimiles of the signatures at least six american presidents had more or less of the celtic strain president jackson whose parents came from county down more than once expressed his pride in his irish ancestry Arthur's parents were from Antrim, Buchanan's from Donegal, and McKinley's grandparents came from the same vicinity. Theodore Roosevelt boasts among his ancestors two direct lines from Ireland, and the first American ancestor of President Polk was a Pollock from Donegal. The present occupant of the White House, Woodrow Wilson, is also of Irish descent among the distinguished vice presidents of the united states were george clinton and john c calhoun sons of immigrants from longford and donegal respectively and calhoun's successor as chairman of the committee on foreign relations was john smiley a native of newtownards county down among american governors since eighteen hundred we find such names as barry brady butler carroll clinton conway carney connolly curtin collins donaghy downey early fitzpatrick flanagan geary gorman hannigan kavanagh kearney logan lynch murphy moore mckinley mcgill meagre mcgrath mahone mccormick o'neill o'farrell or roan filey sullivan sharkey smith talbot and welsh all of irish descent today we have as governors of states glynn in new york dunn in illinois walsh in massachusetts o'neill in alabama burke in north carolina carey in wyoming mcgovern in wisconsin mccreary in kentucky and tenor in pennsylvania and not alone is the governor of the last-mentioned state a native of ireland but so also are its junior united states senator the secretary of the commonwealth and its adjutant general in the political life of america many of the sons of ireland have risen to eminence and in the legislative halls at the national capital the names of kelly fitzpatrick broderick casserly farley logan harlan hannigan adair barry rowan gorman kennedy lyon fitzgerald fair sewell kernan butler moore regan mahone walsh and flanagan are still spoken of with respect among the lawmakers of the nation william dera kelly served in congress for fifty years and it remained for james shields to hold the unique distinction of representing three different states at different times in the senate of the united states senator shields was a native of county tyrone in the judiciary have been many shining lights of irish origin the chief justice of the united states supreme court is edward d white grandson of a ninety-eight rebel and one of his ablest associates is joseph mckenna no more erudite or profound lawyer than charles o'connor has adorned his profession and it can be said with truth that his career has remained unrivalled in american history james t brady daniel doherty thomas addis emmett and charles o'neill were among the most eminent lawyers america has known while the names of dennis o'brien chief justice of the new york court of appeals john d o'neill who occupied a like elevated place on the bench of south carolina john d phelan of the alabama supreme court richard o'gorman charles p daly hugh rutledge morgan j o'brien and others of like origin are household words in the legal annals of america there is no state in the union where an irish american lawyer has not distinguished himself 
the history of medicine in the united states is adorned with the names of many physicians of irish birth or blood several irish surgeons rendered valuable services in the army of the revolution among whom are found doctors macdonough mchenry mccloskey mccalla burke irvine and williamson dr john cochran was appointed by washington surgeon general of the army dr james lina of charleston a native of ireland became surgeon general of south carolina in recognition of his valuable services to the patriot army dr john mckinley a native of ireland who was a famous physician in his day became the first governor of delaware dr ephraim mcdowell is known in the profession as the father of ovariotomy as is dr william j mcnevin the father of american chemistry dr john byrne of new york had a world-wide fame and his papers on gynaecology have been pronounced by the medical press as the best printed in any language one of the most conspicuous figures in medicine in the united states was dr jerome cochran of alabama doctors junius f lynch of florida charles mccrary of kentucky hugh mcguire and hunter mcguire of virginia matthew c mcgannon of tennessee and james lynch charles j o'hagan and james mcbride of south carolina are mentioned prominently in the histories of their respective localities as the foremost medical men of their times while in wisconsin the pioneer physician was dr william h fox and in oregon dr john mclaughlin among new york physicians who achieved high reputations in their profession were doctors thomas addis emmett frank a mcguire daniel e o'neill charles mcburney isaac h riley alfred l carroll howard a kelly joseph o'dwyer and james j walsh these and many others of irish descent have been honored by medical societies as leaders and specialists while it can be said that no surgeon of the present day has achieved such a world-wide reputation as dr john b murphy of chicago among experts in medico-legal science the names of doctors benjamin w mccready and william j o'sullivan of new york stand out prominently and among the most noted contributors to medical journals in the United States, and recognized as men of great professional skill and authorities in their respective specialties, have been Drs. F. D. Mooney of St. Louis, Thomas Fitzgibbon of Milwaukee, John D. Hanrahan of Rutland, James McCann and James H. McClelland of Pittsburgh, John A. Murphy and John McCurdy of Cincinnati, john keating of philadelphia john h murphy of st paul john w c o'neill of gettysburg and arthur o'neill of meadville pennsylvania indeed it can be said that american medical science owes an incalculable debt to irish genius theodore vale the presiding genius of the greatest telephone system in the world is irish and so is cardi its chief engineer morse the inventor of the telegraph was the grandson of an irishman henry o'reilly built the first telegraph line in the united states and john w mackey was the president of the commercial cable company john p holland the inventor of the submarine torpedo boat was a native of county clare and McCormick, the inventor of the reaping and mowing machine, was an Irishman's grandson. Sons of Irishmen have stood in the front rank of American statesmen and diplomats who represented their country abroad. To mention but a few, Richard O'Brien, appointed by Jefferson, American representative at Algiers, James Cavanaugh, minister to Portugal, and Louis McLean, minister to England in 1829, and afterwards Secretary of State in 1832. In recent years, an O'Brien has represented American interests in Italy and Japan, a Karens in Austria, an Egan in Chile, and another of the same name in Denmark, an O'Shaughnessy in Mexico, a Sullivan in Santo Domingo, and an O'Rear in Bolivia. 
among historians were john gilmary shea author of numerous historical works dr robert walsh a learned historian and journalist of the last century whose literary labors were extensive mcmahon and mcsherry historians of maryland burke of virginia o'callaghan hastings and murphy of new york ramsey of south carolina and williamson of north carolina all native irishmen or sons of irish immigrants in the field of american journalism have been many able and forcible writers of irish birth or descent hugh gain a belfast man founded the new york mercury in seventeen seventy five john dunlap founded the first daily paper in philadelphia john daly burke published the first daily paper in boston and william duane edited the aurora of philadelphia in seventeen ninety five all these were born in ireland william coleman founder of the new york evening post in eighteen hundred one was the son of an irish rebel of seventeen ninety eight thomas fitzgerald founded the philadelphia item thomas gill the new york evening star patrick walsh the augusta chronicle joseph medal the chicago tribune henry w grady edited the atlanta constitution michael d edited the detroit evening news for nearly fifty years richard smith the cincinnati gazette edward l godkin the new york evening post william laffin the new york sun and Horace Greeley, the New York Tribune. All of these were either natives of Ireland or sprung from immigrant Irishmen, as were Oliver of the Pittsburgh Gazette, O'Neill of the Pittsburgh Despatch, John Keating of Memphis, William D. O'Connor, and many other shining lights of American journalism during the last century. Fitz James O'Brien was a bright, particular star in the journalistic firmament, john mcgann achieved fame as a war correspondent patrick barry of rochester an extensive writer on horticultural and kindred subjects was a recognized leader of his craft in the united states and william darby son of patrick and mary darby and michael toomey were the ablest american geographers and writers on abstruse scientific subjects in the field of poetry we have had theodore o'hara the author of that immortal poem the bivouac of the dead john boyle o'reilly thomas dunn english author of ben bolt father abram ryan the poet priest of the south james whitcomb riley eleanor donnelly m f egan t a daly and joseph i c clark president of the american irish historical society to recount the successful men of affairs of irish origin it would be necessary to mention every branch of business and every profession recalling but a few daniel o'day patrick farrelly john and william o'brien alexander t stewart john castry joseph j o'donoghue william r grace john mcconville hugh o'neill alexander e orr william constable daniel mccormick and Dominic Lynch, all of New York, were dominant figures in the world of business. Thomas Mellon of Pittsburgh, John R. Walsh and the Cudahy brothers of Chicago, James Phelan, Peter Donahue, Joseph A. Donahoe, and John Sullivan of San Francisco, William A. Clark and Marcus Daly of Montana, George Mead, the Mises and the Nesbitts, Thomas Fitzsimmons and Thomas Dolan of Philadelphia, columbus o'donnell and luke tiernan of baltimore all these have been leading merchants in their day few american financiers occupy a more conspicuous place than thomas f ryan and no great industrial leader has reached the pinnacle of success upon which stands the commanding figure of james j hill both sons of irishmen the names of anthony n brady eugene kelly james s stranahan and james a farrell president of the united states steel corporation are household words in business and financial circles john keating the first paper manufacturer in new york seventeen seventy five thomas fay 
the first to manufacture wallpaper by machinery who won for his distinction the first gold medal of the american institute john and edward mclaughlin of new york for many years the leading publishers of illustrated books and john bannigan of providence one of the largest manufacturers of rubber goods in america were natives of ireland john o'fallon and brian melanthe of st louis and john mcdonough of baltimore who amassed great wealth as merchants were large contributors to charitable and educational institutions william w corcoran whose name is enshrined in the famous art gallery at washington contributed during his lifetime over five million dollars to various philanthropic institutions and one of the most noted philanthropists in american history and the first woman in america to whom a public monument was erected was an irish woman margaret howery of new orleans irishmen have shown a remarkable aptitude for the handling of large contracts and in this field have been prominent john h o'rourke james d leary james coleman oliver byrne and john d crimmins in new york john b macdonald the builder of new york subways george law projector and promoter of public works steamship and railroad builder and john roach the famous shipbuilder of chester pennsylvania john sullivan a noted american engineer one hundred years ago completed the middlesex canal and john mcgall murphy whose ability as a constructing engineer was universally recognized rendered valuable service to the united states during the civil war among pioneer shipbuilders in america are noted patrick tracy from wexford and simon forrester from cork who were both at salem massachusetts during the period of the revolution and rendered most valuable service to the patriot cause and the o'briens Kavanaugh's, and sewells in maine but it is not in the material things of life alone that the irish have been in the van thousands of americans have been charmed by the operas of victor herbert a grandson of samuel lover and with lovers of music the strains of patrick sarsfield gilmore's band still linger as a pleasant memory edward a mcdowell america's most famous composer was of irish descent the colossal statute of america on the dome of the national capital was executed by thomas crawford who was born in new york of irish parents in eighteen fourteen henry inman one of the very best of portrait painters was also born in new york of irish parents john singleton copley the distinguished artist came to boston from county clare in seventeen thirty six thompson the sculptor was born in queen's county another noted sculptor was william d o'donovan of virginia and augustus st gaudens one of the greatest sculptors of modern times was born in dublin other sculptors of Irish race have been elsewhere mentioned. Among America's most talented artists and portrait painters may be mentioned George P. Healy, William J. Hennessy, Thomas Moran, Henry Pelham, Henry Murray, John Neagle, and William McGrath, all of Irish birth or descent. Ireland has given many eminent churchmen to the United States the three american cardinals gibbons farley and o'connell stand out prominently as do archbishops carroll hughes mccloskey kenrick ryan ireland glennon corrigan and Keane, all of whom have shed lustre on the church history has given to an irishman francis mckeamy of donegal the credit of founding presbyterianism in america while among noted presbyterian divines of irish birth were james waddell known as the blind preacher of the wilderness thomas smith john hall francis allison william tennant and james mcgrady all men of great ability and influence in their day samuel finley president of princeton college in seventeen sixty one was a native of armagh and john blair smith famous as a preacher throughout the shenandoah valley and the first president of union college seventeen ninety five was of irish descent 
Among the pioneer preachers of the western wilderness were McMahon, Doherty, Quinn, Burke, O'Cool, Delaney, McGee, and many others of Irish origin. Irishmen and their sons have founded American towns and cities, and the capital of the state of Colorado takes its name from General James Denver, son of Patrick Denver, an emigrant from County Down in the year 1795. Sixty-five places in the United States are named after people bearing the Irish prefix O, and upwards of 1,000 after the Max, and there are 253 counties of the United States and approximately 7,000 places called by Irish family or place names. There are 24 Dublins, 21 Waterfords, 18 Belfasts, 16 Tyrones, ten limericks, nine antrums, eight sligos, seven derries, six corks, five kildares, and so on. Immigrant Irishmen have also been the founders of prominent American families. One of the most ancient of Irish patronymics, McCarthy, is found in the records of Virginia as early as 1635, and in Massachusetts in 1675, and all down through the successive generations, descendants of this sept were among the leading families of the communities where they located. In Virginia, the McCormick, Mead, Lewis, Preston, and Lynch families. In the Carolinas, the Canties, Neals, Bryans, and Butlers. And in Maryland, the Carrolls and Dulaneys are all descended from successful Irish colonizers. Even from this very incomplete summary, we can see that Irish blood, brain, and brawn have been a valuable acquisition to the building of the fabric of American institutions, and that the sons of Ireland merit more prominent recognition than has been accorded them in the pages of American history. The Pharisees of history may have withheld from Ireland the credit that is her due, but thanks to the never-failing guidance of the records, we are able to show that at all times, whether they came as voluntary exiles or were driven from their homes by the persecutions of government, her sons have had an honorable part in every upward movement in American life. Testimony adduced from the sources from which this imperfect sketch is drawn cannot be called into question, and its perusal by those who so amusingly glorify the Anglo-Saxon as the founder of the American race and American institutions would have a chastening influence on their ignorance of early American history, and would reopen the long vista of the years, at the very beginning of which they would see Celt and Teuton, Saxon and Gaul, working side by side, solidifying the fulcrum of the structure on which this great nation rests. References. The archives, registers, records, reports, and other official documents mentioned in the text. The various town, county, and state histories. The collections and publications of the following societies. Massachusetts Historical Society, Genealogical Society of Pennsylvania, New York Historical Society, 34 volumes, New York Genealogical and Biographical Society, 44 volumes, Maine Historical Society, Rhode Island Historical Society, Connecticut Historical Society, South Carolina Historical Society, and American Historical Society. New England Historical and Genealogical Register, 67 volumes, Boston, 1847 to 1913. New England Historical and Biographical Record, Hacklut, Voyages, Navigations, Traffics, and Discoveries of the English Nation, London, 1607. Dobbs, The Trade and Improvement of Ireland, Dublin, 1729. Hutchinson, History of Massachusetts from the First Settlement in 1628 until 1750, Salem, 1795. Proud, History of Pennsylvania, 1681 to 1770. Philadelphia, 1797 to 1798. 
savage genealogical dictionary of the first settlers of new england boston 1860 to 1862 morris editor the makers of new york philadelphia 1895 pope the pioneers of massachusetts boston 1900 the pioneers of maine and new hampshire boston 1908 Richardson, Sidelights on Maryland History, Baltimore, 1913. Spencer, History of the United States, Ramsey, History of the United States, Prendergast, Cromwellian Settlement of Ireland. End of section 22. Section 23 of the Glories of Ireland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Glories of Ireland, edited by Joseph Dunn and P. J. Lennox. Section 23, The Irish in Canada, by James J. Walsh, M.D., Ph.D., Lit.D., S.C.D. When Wolfe captured Quebec and Canada came under British rule, some of the best known of his officers and several of his men were Irish. After the peace was signed, many of them settled in Canada, not a few of them marrying French wives, and as a consequence there are numerous English, Scotch, and English names among the French-speaking inhabitants of Lower Canada. Two of Wolfe's officers, Colonel Guy Carleton, born at Straban in the county Tyrone, and General Richard Montgomery, born only seven miles away at Convoy in the same county, were destined to play an important role in the future history of Canada. Montgomery was in command of the Revolutionary Army from the colonies when it attempted to take Quebec, and Carleton, who had been a trusted friend of General Wolfe, was in command of the Canadian forces. The two men were the lives of their respective commands, and with the death of Montgomery, Carleton's victory was assured. Carleton was made Governor-in-Chief of Canada, and during the trying years of the early British rule of New France and the American Revolution, his tact did more than anything else to save Canada for the British. Bibeau, the French historian, says, quote, The man to whom the administration of the government was entrusted had known how to make the Canadians love him, and this contributed not a little to retain, at least within the bounds of neutrality, those among them who might have been able, or believed themselves able, to ameliorate their lot by making common cause with the insurgent colonies. End quote. Shortly after being made governor, Carleton went to England and secured the passage of the Quebec Act through the English Parliament, which gave the Canadian French assurance that they were to be ruled without oppression by the British government. Subsequently, in 1786, Carleton, as Lord Dorchester, became the first Governor-General of Canada, being given jurisdiction over Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, as well as Upper and Lower Canada, and to him, more than to any other, is due the early loyalty to the British Crown in the Dominion. After the army, the next important source of Irish population in Canada were the Loyalists, who, after the Revolution, removed from the United States to the British Dominions in America. There were probably many thousands of them, more than enough to make up for the French who left Canada for France when the territory passed over to England. Among the Irish Loyalists who went to Canada was the Reverend John Stuart, who had become very well known as a missionary in the Mohawk Valley before the Revolution, and who, though born a Presbyterian, was destined to win the title of the Father of the Church of England in Upper Canada. When the first Canadian Parliament met in December 1792, Edward O'Hara was returned for Gaspé in Lower Canada, and Darcy McGee could boast that henceforward Lower Canada was never without an Irish representative in its legislative councils. When the question of settling Upper Canada with British colonists came up, Colonel Talbot, a County Dublin man, was the most important factor. He obtained a large grant of land near what is now London and attracted settlers into what was at that time a wilderness. The tract settled under his superintendence now comprises 29 townships in the most prosperous part of Canada. The maritime provinces had been under British rule before the fall of Quebec and contained a large element of Irish population. 
in Newfoundland in 1753, out of a total population of some 13,000, Davin says that there were nearly 5,000 Catholics, chiefly Irish. In 1784, a great new stimulus to Irish immigration to Newfoundland was given by Father O'Connell, who in 1796 was made Catholic Bishop of the island. Newfoundland, for its verdure, the absence of reptiles, and its Irish inhabitants, was at this time called Transatlantic Ireland, and Bonnie Castle says that more than one half of the population was Irish. In 1749, Governor Cornwallis brought some 4,000 disbanded soldiers to Nova Scotia and founded Halifax. Ten years later, it was described as subdivided into Halifax proper, Irish town or the southern, and Dutch town or the northern suburbs. The inhabitants numbered 3,000, one-third of whom were Irish. They were among the most prominent men of the city and province. In the Privy Council for 1789 were Thomas Corcoran and Charles Morris. Morris was the president of the Irish Society, and Matthew Cahill the sheriff of Halifax in that year. A large number of Irish from the north of Ireland settled in Nova Scotia in 1763, calling their settlement Londonderry. They provided a fortunate refuge for the large numbers of Irish Presbyterians who were expelled from New England by the intolerant Puritans the following year. They also welcomed many Loyalists who came from New York and the New England states after the acknowledgment of the independence of the American colonies by Great Britain. Between the more eastern settlers around Halifax and those in the interior, the greater part of the population of Nova Scotia was probably Irish in origin. It was in the maritime provinces that the first step in political emancipation for Catholics under British rule was made. In 1821, Lawrence Cavanaugh, a Roman Catholic, was returned to the assembly of the province for Cape Breton. He would not subscribe to the Declaration on Transubstantiation in the oath of office tendered him, and as a consequence, was refused admittance to the assembly. But he was elected again and again, and six years afterwards, Judge Halliburton, better known by his nom de plume of Sam Slick, in an able speech, seconded the motion to dispense with the Declaration, and Kavanaugh was permitted to take the oath without the Declaration. The War of 1812 brought over from Ireland a number of Irish soldiers serving in the British Army, many of whom, after the war, settled down and became inhabitants of the country. They were allotted farmlands and added much to Canada's prosperity. A type of their descendants was Sir William Hingston, whose father was at this time a lieutenant adjutant in the Royal 100th Regiment, the Dublins. Sir William's father died when his son was a mere boy, but the lad supported his mother, worked his way through the medical school, saved enough money to give himself two years in Europe, and became a great surgeon. He was elected three times mayor of Montreal, serving one term with great prestige under the most trying circumstances. He afterwards became a senator of the Dominion and was knighted by Queen Victoria. Prince Edward Island was settled mainly by the Scotch and French, and yet many Irish names are to be found among its old families. It was ceded to Great Britain in 1763, and the first governor appointed was Captain Walter Patterson, whose niece, Elizabeth Patterson, was married to Jerome Bonaparte in Baltimore in 1803. Captain Patterson was so ardent an Irishman that through his influence he had an act passed by the Assembly changing the name of the island to New Ireland, but the home government refused to countenance the change. At this time, the island was known as St. John's, and the name Prince Edward was given to it in honor of the Duke of Kent in 1789. One of the most popular governors of the island was Sir Dominic Daly, knighted while in office. He was a member of a well-known Galway family, and first came to America as secretary to one of the governors. He afterwards became provincial secretary for Lower Canada. Canada suffered from the aftermath of the revolutions which took place in Europe during the early part of the 19th century. The year 1837 saw two revolutions, one in Upper, the other in Lower Canada, though neither of them amounted to more than a flash in the pan. As might be expected, there were not a few Irish among the disaffected spirits who fostered these revolutions. 
Their experience at home led them to know how little oppressed people were likely to obtain from the British government, except by a demonstration of force. There were serious abuses, especially the family compact, the lack of anything approaching constitutional guarantees in government, and political disabilities on the score of religion. However, most of the Irish in Canada were ranged on the side of the government. Sir Richard Bonney Castle, writing in 1846, said, quote, The Catholic Irish, who have been long settled in the country, are by no means the worst subjects in this transatlantic realm, as I can personally testify, having had the command of large bodies of them during the border troubles of 1837-8. to They are all loyal and true, end quote. Above all, Bonnie Castle pledged himself for the loyalty of the Irish Catholic priesthood. One of the Irishmen who came into prominence in the rebellions of 1837 was Edmund Bailey O'Callaghan, the editor of The Vindicator, the newspaper by means of which Papineau succeeded in arousing much feeling among the people of Lower Canada and fomented the revolution. O'Callaghan escaped to the United States and settled at Albany, where he became the historian of New York State. To him, more than to any other, we owe the preservation of the historical materials out of which the early history of the state can be constructed. Rare volumes of the Jesuit relations, to the value of which for historical purposes he had called special attention, were secured from his library for the Canadian Library at Ottawa. Towards the middle of the 19th century, when the population of Ireland reached its highest point of over 8 million, the pressure on the people caused them to emigrate in large numbers, and then the famine came, to drive out great crowds of those who survived. In proportion to its population, Canada received a great many more of these Irish emigrants than did the United States. Unfortunately, the conditions on board the emigrant sailing vessels in those days cost many lives. They were often becalmed and took months to cross the ocean. My grandmother, coming in the 30s, was 93 days in crossing, landing at Quebec after seven weeks on half rations, part of the time living on nothing but oatmeal and water. Ship fever, the dreaded typhus, broke out on her vessel, as on so many others, and more than half of the passengers perished. Many, many thousands of the Irish emigrants thus died on shipboard, or shortly after landing. In 1912, the ancient order of Hibernians erected near Quebec a monument to the victims. In spite of the untoward conditions, emigration continued unabated, and in 1875, in the population of Ontario, Quebec, New Brunswick, and Nova Scotia, it was calculated that the Irish numbered 846,414, as compared with 706,369 English, and 549,946 Scotch, Hatton quoted by Davin in The Irishman in Canada. It had become clear that Canada would prosper more if united than in separate provinces jealous of each other. The first move in this direction came from the maritime provinces, where the Irish element was so much stronger than elsewhere, and when a conference of the leading statesmen of these provinces was appointed to be held at Charlottetown, PEI, September 1864, representatives of Upper and Lower Canada asked to be allowed to be present, to bring forward a plan for a federation of all the British provinces in North America. The British North America Act was passed and received the royal assent, the Queen appointing July 1st, 1867, as the formal beginning of the Dominion of Canada. Among the men who were most prominent in bringing about Federation, and who came to be known as the Fathers of Confederation, were several distinguished Irishmen. Thomas Darcy McGee was the best known, and probably did more than any other Canadian to make the idea of Confederation popular by his writings and speeches. He had come to Canada as a stranger, edited a newspaper in Montreal, and was elected to the Assembly after a brief residence, in spite of the opposition cries of Irish adventurer and stranger from abroad, and was subsequently elected four times by acclamation, and was Minister of Agriculture and Education, and Canadian Commissioner to the Paris Exposition of 1867. His letters to the Earl of Mayo, pleading for the betterment of conditions in Ireland, were quoted by Gladstone during the Home Rule movement as, quote, a prophetic voice from the dead coming from beyond the Atlantic. End quote. 
Another of the Fathers of Confederation was the Honorable Edward Whalen, born in the County Mayo, who as a young man went to Prince Edward Island, where he gained great influence as a popular journalist. He was an orator as well as an editor, and came to have the confidence of the people of the island, and hence was able to do very much for Federation. A third of the Fathers of Confederation from the Maritime Provinces was the Honorable, afterwards Sir Edward Kenny, who, when the first cabinet of the new Dominion was formed, was offered and accepted one of the portfolios in recognition of the influence which he had wielded for Canadian Union. At all times in the history of Canada, the Catholic hierarchy has been looked up to as thoroughly conservative factors for the progress and development of the country. After the Irish immigration, most of the higher ecclesiastics were Irish by birth or descent, and they all exerted a deep influence not only on their own people, but on their city and province. One of the fathers of Confederation was Archbishop Connolly of Halifax, of whom the most distinguished Presbyterian clergyman of the lower provinces said the day after his death, quote, I feel that I have not only lost a friend, but as if Canada had lost a patriot. In all his big-hearted Irish fashion, he was ever at heart, in mind and deed, a true Canadian. End quote. Among his colleagues of the hierarchy were such men as his predecessor, Archbishop Walsh, Archbishop Lynch, the first metropolitan of Upper Canada when Toronto was erected into an archbishopric, Bishop Hogan of Kingston, Archbishop Hannon of Halifax, Archbishop Walsh of Toronto, and Archbishop O'Brien of Halifax, all of whom were esteemed as faithful Canadians, working for the benefit of their own people more especially, but always with a larger view of good for the whole Commonwealth of Canada. The Irish continued to furnish great representative men to Canada. The first governor, Guy Carleton, was Irish, and his subsequent governor generalship as Lord Dorchester did much to make Canada loyal to Great Britain. During the difficult times of the Civil War in the United States, Lord Monk, a Tipperary man, was the tactful governor general, quote, like other Irish governors, singularly successful in winning golden opinions, end quote, Davin. Probably the most popular and influential of Canada's governors general was Lord Dufferin, another Irishman. Some of the most distinguished of Canadian jurists, editors, and politicians have been Irishmen, and Irishmen have been among her great merchants, contractors, and professional men. In our own time, Sir William Hingston, among the physicians, Sir Charles Fitzpatrick, among the jurists, and Sir Thomas George Shaughnessy, among the administrative financiers, are fine types of Irish character. References Davin, The Irishman in Canada, Toronto, 1877. McGee, Works. Tracy, The Tercentenary History of Canada, New York, 1908. Walsh, Sir William Hingston in the American Catholic Quarterly, January, 1911. Edmund Bailey O'Callaghan in the Records of the American Catholic Historical Society, 1907. McKenna, A Century of Catholicity in Canada and the Catholic World, Volume 1, page 229. End of section 23. Recording by Owen Cook in Pottawatomie Ceded Land on Canada Day, 2017. Section 24 of The Glories of Ireland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. The Glories of Ireland, edited by Joseph Dunn and P.J. Lennox. Section 24. The Irish in South America by Marion Mulhall. 1. From the Spanish Conquest to the War of Independence. South America, although comparatively little known until recent times to the outside world, contains much to interest the missionary, the scientist, the historian, the traveler, and the financier. The 20th century will probably see hundreds following in the footsteps of their predecessors. In the meantime, the brilliant achievements of numerous Irish men and women in that part of the world are falling into oblivion, and call for a friendly hand to collect the fragments of historical lore connected with their exploits. This paper will cover three periods. One, from the Spanish conquest to the War of Independence. Here, the principal actors were maritime explorers, buccaneers, and mercantile adventurers. Two, the War of Independence from 1810 to 1826. 
In this period, Irishmen performed feats of valor worthy to rank with those in Greek or Roman history. 3. Since the independence, a period of commercial and industrial development in which Irishmen have played a foremost part. It has been said that George Barlow, the companion of Sebastian Cabot, was an Irishman. Cabot was the first Britisher to sail up the Rio de la Plata, and gave it its name just 35 years after the discovery of America. Barlow was in the service of the King of Spain, and in that country met Cabot, who had been appointed pilot major to His Majesty in the year 1518. In 1577, we read of the famous Admiral Drake's expedition to the River Plate, which he reached on April 14, 1578. Evidently, it was a successful one in the opinion of Queen Elizabeth, for on Drake's return to Plymouth, September 26, 1580, she came aboard his ship and knighted him. There seem to have been three Irishmen on this expedition, Fenton, Merrick, and Ward. Fenton, who was in command of two vessels, was attacked by a Spanish squadron between Brazil and the River Plate, and the battle continued by moonlight until one of the Spaniards was sunk. The Spanish historian adds that Fenton might have sunk another of the enemy's ships, but refrained because there were several women on board. Lozana, in his history, mentions a revolution in Paraguay in 1555, which was headed by an Irishman named Nicholas Coleman. This revolution was quickly suppressed by the Spanish viceroy, Irala, but Coleman led a second revolution in 1570, when Captain Rigueline was the governor of Guayra. The mutineers named Coleman for their chief, put their treasures into canoes, and floated down the Piranha until their boats were capsized by some rapids, probably the falls of Apipe in Misiones. The viceroy, on hearing of the revolt, sent troops to bring back the fugitives, and the latter were treated with unusual clemency. Lozana describes Coleman as a daring, turbulent buccaneer. For fifteen years he seems to have played an important part in Guayra. His subsequent fate is unknown. In 1626, an expedition commanded by James Purcell, an Irishman, established itself on the island of Tucohos, in the mouth of the Amazon. Captain Charles O'Hara was sent by Governor Aranya from Montevideo in March 1761, to destroy the old landmarks of Rio Negro and Ching between the dominions of Portugal and Spain. The officer next under him was Lieutenant Charles Murphy, afterwards governor of Paraguay. This expedition suffered great hardships. Several of the expeditions of the privateers of the 18th century sailed from Ireland. Dampier, a skillful navigator, went on a cruise to intercept the Spanish galleons returning from the river plate with booty supposed to be worth 600,000 pounds sterling. He sailed from Kinsale in September 1703 with two vessels, and no doubt amongst the crews were many Irishmen. It was on this expedition that Alexander Selkirk, a Scotch sailor, was put on shore at Juan Fernandez in 1704, where he remained until rescued by Captain Rogers, who commanded the Duke, a vessel of 320 tons, which sailed from Cork on September 1, 1708. Touched by chance at Juan Fernandez and found the original of Defoe's remarkable story Robinson Crusoe, who presented a wild appearance dressed in his goatskins. In 1765, Captain McNamara, with two vessels called the Lord Clive and the Ambuscade, mounting between them 104 guns, attempted to take Colonia in front of Buenos Aires from the Spaniards. Having shelled the place for four hours, McNamara expected every moment to see a white flag hoisted, when, by some mishap, the Lord Clive took fire and 262 persons perished. The Spaniards fired upon the poor fellows in the water, only 78 escaping to land. McNamara was seen to sink. His sword was found a few years ago by a Colonia fisherman, who presented it to the British consul at Montevideo. Most of the Irish names still extant in the Argentine provinces, such as Sarsfield, Carroll, and Butler, are probably derived from these captives. Among the descendants of the survivors of McNamara's expedition may be mentioned the ablest lawyer ever known in Buenos Aires and for many years Prime Minister, the late Dr. Velez Sarsfield, and also Governor O'Neill. The year 1586 saw an expedition of a very different character, consisting of the first Jesuits sent to convert Paraguay, under the direction of Father Thomas Field, an Irishman, and son of a Limerick doctor. 
Their vessel fell into the hands of British privateers off the Brazilian coast, but the sea rovers respected their captives, and after sundry adventures the latter landed at Buenos Aires, whence they proceeded overland to Cordoba. The year following they set out for Paraguay, where Father Field and his companions laid the foundation of the Jesuit Commonwealth of Misiones, which had such wonderful development in the following two centuries as to cause Voltaire to admit that, quote, the Jesuit establishment in Paraguay seems to be the triumph of humanity, unquote. Another Irish Jesuit, Father Thaddeus Ennis, appears in authority in Misiones shortly before the downfall. In 1756, when Spain ceded San Miguel and other missions to Portugal, Father Ennis was entrusted with the removal lower down to Parana of such tribes as refused to become Portuguese subjects. Yet another Jesuit, Father Falconer, son of an Irish Protestant doctor in Manchester, who had himself studied medicine, was one of the most successful travelers and missionaries of the 18th century. Among his friends in London was a ship captain who traded from the coast of Guinea to Brazil, carrying slaves for the company recently established by Queen Anne's patent, and he it doubtless was who prevailed on the young physician to try a seafaring life. In one of his voyages as ship surgeon, from Guinea to Buenos Aires, he fell ill at the latter port, and, there being no hotels, he had the good fortune to enjoy the hospitality of the Jesuit superior, Father Mahoney, whose name proclaims his Irish nationality. Such was the impression made on Falconer by the kindness of the Jesuits, that he shortly afterwards was received into the church and entered as a novice in the College of St. Ignatius at Buenos Aires. He spent the first years of his missionary career in Misiones and Tucumán. Later on, he was dispatched by his superior to Patagonia, and his success there during 27 years was almost equal to what has already been mentioned of Father Field in Paraguay. He converted many tribes and traversed nearly every part of Patagonia from Rio Negro to Magellan Straits and as far inland as the Andes. He knew most of the Indian tongues and by his winning manners and knowledge of medicine gained a great influence over the savages. When he published his life and travels, such was the effect of his book upon the King of Spain that he at once ordered surveys and settlements to be made along the Patagonian coast which Father Falconer represented as exposed to seizure by the first adventurer who should land there. Father Falconer's book has been translated into French, German, and Spanish. He returned to England and died at Spetchley, Worcestershire, near the end of the 18th century. In 1774, the Bishop of Ayacucho was Dr. James O'Fellon, who rebuilt the old Cathedral of Pasco. His father was an Irish officer in the Spanish army. 2. The War of Independence Towards the close of the 18th century, the Pitt administration lent a willing ear to a Venezuelan patriot, General Miranda, who proposed that Great Britain should aid South America to expel the Spanish rulers and set up a number of independent states. Spain, being the ally of France and paying an annual subsidy to Napoleon, it became, moreover, the object of England to seize the treasure ships periodically arriving from the River Plate. Hostilities having broken out in Europe in 1803, an English squadron under an Irish commander, Captain Moore, captured in the following year some Spanish galleons laden with treasure at the mouth of the River Plate. In June 1806, Major General William Carr Beresford, with a British squadron, cast anchor about 12 miles from Buenos Aires, and, with a force of only 1,635 men, took possession of that city of 60,000 inhabitants. The indignation which such a humiliation at first caused among the people was in large measure calmed by the manifesto which the conquering commander issued on the occasion. In the memoirs of General Belgrano, we read, quote, It grieved me to see my country subjugated in this manner, but I shall always admire the gallantry of the brave and honorable Beresford in so daring an enterprise, unquote. Beresford was, however, unable to hold his ground, for the Spaniards got together an army of 10,000 men and retook the city. Beresford was made prisoner, but after five months' detention, he and his brother officers, among whom was another Irishman, Major Fay, managed to escape. Thus ended the expedition of this brave general, who nevertheless had covered himself and his little army with glory, for he held Buenos Aires as a British colony for 45 days, and had he been properly supported from home, the result would, in all probability, have been vastly different. General Beresford was one of the most distinguished men of his time. 
he was the illegitimate son of the Marquis of Waterford, entered the army at sixteen, and served in every quarter of the globe. After his defeat at Buenos Aires, he captured Madeira and was made governor of that island. In 1808, he successfully covered the retreat of Sir John Moore to Corunna, a difficult feat for which he received a marshal's baton and was made commander-in-chief in Portugal. In 1811, he defeated Marshal Sul at Albuera and subsequently took part in the victories of Salamanca and Vitoria. For these services, he was made Duke of Elvis, and the British government conferred on him in 1814 the title of Baron Beresford of Albuera and Dungannon. The same year, he was sent as minister to Brazil, and on his return was created Viscount. He married the widow of Thomas Hope, the banker, and settled down on his estates in Kent, where he died in 1854. The brilliancy of Beresford's achievement in capturing Buenos Aires with a handful of men had dazzled the minds of English statesmen, who felt that 10,000 British troops were enough to subdue the whole of the vast continent of South America. In May 1807, an expedition comprising several frigates and transports with 5,000 troops appeared off Montevideo from England. A month later, Lieutenant General Whitlock arrived with orders to assume the chief command and among his officers were the gallant Irishman, Major Vandeleur, who commanded a wing of the 88th Regiment, and Lieutenant Colonel Nugent of the 38th. Whitlock endeavored but failed to retake Buenos Aires. During the siege, a small detachment of Spanish troops under Colonel James Butler, after a terrific conflict in which they sold their lives dearly, were all killed. Agreeably to Colonel Butler's request, his remains were buried on the spot he had so valiantly defended, and his tombstone was visible there until 1818. It is a remarkable fact that several of the South American countries, Mexico, Peru, and Chile, were governed by viceroys of Irish birth in the critical period preceding the independence, although Spanish law forbade such office to any but Spaniards born. It was in recognition of gallant services in Spain, in combination with the Duke of Wellington, that General O'Donohue was made Viceroy of Mexico in 1821, but the elevation of the great Viceroy of Peru, Ambrose O'Higgins, was due to the splendid talents of administration already displayed by him during 20 years of service in Chile. He was born at Summerhill, County Meath, about 1730. An uncle of his was one of the chaplains at the Court of Madrid, and at his expense O'Higgins was educated at a college in Cadiz. He then entered the Spanish Engineer Corps, and in 1769 was given the command of the commission sent to Chile to strengthen the fortifications of Valdivia. He was made Captain General of Chile in 1788, was subsequently created Marquis of Osorno, and in 1796 was nominated Viceroy of Peru, a position which he held until his death in 1801. The great viceroy left only one son, Bernardo Higgins, who succeeded General Carreras in the supreme command of the Patriot Army against the Spaniards in 1813. In 1817, O'Higgins took a principal part in the victory of Chacabuco and was almost immediately appointed Supreme Director of Chile, with dictatorial powers. During his administration, which lasted six years, he gave every proof of his fitness for the position. But alas, it was the misfortune of South America to surpass the republics of antiquity in the ingratitude shown towards its greatest benefactors. It is then not surprising to find that the father of his country, as O'Higgins is affectionately styled, was deposed by a military revolution and obliged to take refuge in Peru, from which country he never returned. General Miller and Lord Cochrane, in their memoirs, give frequent testimony to the honesty and zeal of Bernard O'Higgins. He was always treated as an honored guest in Lima, in which city he died on October 24, 1842. He left a son, Demetrio O'Higgins, a wealthy landowner, who contributed large sums for the Patriot Army against Spain. Among other Irish commanders in Chile and Peru, who, during the War of Independence, fought their way to dignity and rank, was General McKenna, the hero of Membriar. He was born in 1771 at Clower, County Tyrone, his mother belonged to the ancient Irish sept of O'Reilly, whose estates were confiscated after the fall of Limerick in 1691. General Tomond O'Brien, who won his spurs at the Battle of Chacabuco, seems to have been born in the south of Ireland about 1790. He joined the Army of San Martin and accompanied that general through the campaigns of Chile and Peru until the overthrow of the Spanish regime and the proclamation of San Martin as protector of Peru. 
On the day, July 28, 1821, when independence was declared at Lima, the protector took in his hand the standard of Pizarro and said, quote, This is my portion of the trophies. Unquote. Then, taking the state canopy of Pizarro, a kind of umbrella always borne over the viceroys in processions, he presented it to General O'Brien, saying, quote, This is for the gallant comrade who fought so many years by my side in the cause of South America. Unquote. The inscription on the canopy in O'Brien's hand says that it was brought to Peru on Pizarro's second journey from Spain. Little did the viceroys think that its last owner would be an Irishman. General O'Connor, one of the most distinguished soldiers of the War of Independence, played an important part in the final victory of Ayachuco. For his gallantry on that day, he was promoted to the rank of general by the commander-in-chief, General Bolivar. After the War of Independence, he became Minister of War in Bolivia. General O'Connor went to South America as an ensign in the Irish Legion under General Devereux. He claimed direct descent from Roderick O'Connor, last King of Ireland, 1186. Captain Esmond also fought in the War of Independence. He was brother to the then baronet Sir Thomas Esmond of County Wexford. In later years, Captain Esmond was employed by the Peruvian government to report on some proposed canals at Tarapeca. The vessel in which he embarked was never more heard of. Colonel Charles Carroll had served in Spain, but joined the Chilean army after independence was gained. He was one of the most popular officers in the army and met with a sad fate. Being sent with too small a detachment against the savage Indians, their commander, Benavides, cut his forces in pieces and murdered all the officers in a most cruel manner. O'Carroll had his tongue cut out and was then butchered. Lieutenant Colonel Moran, who commanded the Colombian Legion at the Battle of Ayachuco, probably came out in the Legion of General Devereux. Colonel, afterwards General O'Leary, was first aide-de-camp to General Bolivar, the Liberator, and received his last breath. He was nephew to the famous Father Arthur O'Leary. Bolivar employed him on various missions of great trust and says, quote, he acquitted himself with great ability, unquote. After the war, General O'Leary was appointed British Chargé d'Affaires in Bogota and died in Rome in 1868. General Arthur Sandes, a native of Dublin, was entrusted with an important garrison in Peru on the close of the War of Independence. Admiral Brown, the distinguished commander and hero of the War of Independence, whose exploits may be ranked like those of Nelson, above all Greek, above all Roman fame, was born at Foxford County Mayo in Ireland on the 22nd of June, 1777. His father emigrated with his family to Pennsylvania. A ship captain, who was about to sail from Philadelphia, offered to take the intelligent Irish boy with him, and the offer was promptly accepted. During 20 years, he seems to have voyaged to many countries. At one time, we find him at Archangel. Brown had been in Buenos Aires just two years when the Patriot government offered him command of a squadron to commence hostilities against the Spanish Navy, then mistress of all the coasts and waters of South America. On the memorable 8th of March, 1814, Brown sailed out of the port of Buenos Aires with three ships to commence a campaign, which was destined to destroy the Spanish Navy in this part of the waters of the New World. With him went his fellow countrymen, Captains Seaver and Kearney. Brown's next exploits were against Spanish shipping in the Pacific, and his entirely successful campaign at sea against Brazil, in which he gained the mastery by his wonderful skill, courage, and perseverance, keeping at bay the great naval power of that country, which consisted at one time of fifty war vessels, with his few small, ill-supplied, and ill-armed craft. After these great exploits, Brown spent some months among the wild scenery of Mayo, so dear to him in boyhood and, returning to Buenos Aires, devoted himself to the quiet life of a country gentleman. He died surrounded by his family and friends on May 3, 1857, and the day of his funeral was one of national mourning. His widow erected a monument to his memory in the Recoleta Cemetery, and in 1872, the municipality of Buenos Aires granted a site for a public statue on the Pasco Julio, which so often rang with the plaudits of the people as they welcomed to this great Irishman returning from victory. No brighter pages occur in the history of the New World than those which commemorate the gallantry and self-devotion of the Irish soldiers who aided South Americans to throw off the yoke of Spain. 
in 1819, an Irish legion of 1,729 men arrived under the command of General Devereux, a Wexford landowner called the Lafayette of South America, to fight in the campaign of General Bolivar. Devereux was distinguished for his great bravery. After the War of Independence, he returned to Europe, being commissioned to form a company for mining operations in Colombia, which country had appointed him envoy extraordinary to various European courts. Colonel Ferguson and Captain Talbot were both Irishmen, and among the last survivors of Devereux's legion. It is computed that one-third of the Irishmen who came out under General Devereux died in hospital. It was this legion which won the decisive battle of Carabobo, June 26, 1821, going into action 1,100 strong and leaving 600 on that hard-fought field. Among the officers who composed Bolivar's Albion Rifles, we find the Irish names of Piggott, Tallon, Peacock, Felon, O'Connell, McNamara, Fanshaw, French, Reynolds, Byrne, and Haig, and the medical officer was Dr. O'Reilly. We find mention in General Millar's memoirs of Dr. Moore, an Irishman, who attended Bolivar in most of his campaigns, and was devotedly attached to the person of the Liberator. Lieutenant Colonel Hughes, Major Maurice Hogan, Lieutenant William Cao, Captain Lawrence McGuire, Lieutenant Colonel S. Collins, also served in the struggle for independence. The period of independence found a small number of Irish residents in Buenos Aires, mostly patrician families, such as Dillon, McMurrow, Murphy, French, O'Gorman, Orr, Butler, and O'Shea, who had been exiled or had fled from Ireland and obtained the King of Spain's permission to settle in Spanish America. The descendants of these families are now so intermarried in the country that they have mostly forgotten the language and traditions of their ancestors, but they occupy high positions in political, legal, and commercial circles. 3. The Period After the Declaration of Independence A remarkable influx of settlers from Ireland occurred between 1825 and 1830 to work in the Saladeros, or salt mines, of the Irish merchants Brown, Dowdall, and Armstrong. Previous to this, a few Irish mechanics and others had come from the United States. In 1813, Bernard Kieran came from New Brunswick. He seems to have devoted himself to science, as the papers mention his discovery of a comet in the Magellan Clouds on March 19, 1830. His son, James Kiernan, became editor of the government paper Gazeta Mercantile in 1823 and held this post for 20 years. His death occurred in 1857. There is reason to believe that the first Irishman who landed in Buenos Aires in the 19th century, exclusive of Beresford's soldiers, was James Coyle, a native of Tyrone, who came in the Agriabla in 1807 and died in 1876 at the age of 86. In 1830, some survivors of an Irish colony of 300 persons in Brazil made their way to Buenos Aires. They had come out from Europe on the bark Reward in 1829. The banker, Thomas Armstrong, who arrived in Buenos Aires in 1817, occupied the foremost place for half a century in the commerce of that city. He was of the ancient family of Armstrong in the King's County, one of whose members was General Sir John Armstrong, founder of Woolwich Arsenal. Having married into the wealthy family of Villanueva, he became intimately connected with all the leading enterprises of the day, such as railways, banks, loans, etc., he took no part in politics, but interested himself in charities of every kind. In 1865, another Irishman, James P. K. Hill, introduced into Peru from the United States the first complete machinery for sugar growing and refining. Still another Irishman, Peter Sheridan, was one of the chief founders of the sheep farming industry in Argentina. His family claimed descent from the same stock in County Cavan as Richard Brinsley Sheridan, the great statesman and dramatist. Sheridan died at the age of 52 in 1844 and was succeeded in the estancia, or sheep farming business, by his nephew James, whose brother, Dr. Hugh Sheridan, had served under Admiral Brown. The number and wealth of the Irish estancieros, or sheep farmers, in Argentina have never been exactly ascertained, but after the old Spanish families, they are the most important. It would be impossible to give all the Irish names to be met with. Some of them own immense tracts of land. Men whose fathers arrived in Argentina without a shilling are today worth millions. Their estancia houses display all the comforts of an American or English home, their hospitality is proverbial, 
and most of them have built on their land fine schools and beautiful little chapels, in which the nearest Irish priest officiates. Many of the partidos, or districts, of the various provinces of Argentina may be compared to Irish counties, the railway stations being called after the owners of the land on which they are situated. Among the earliest families settled in Argentina in the farming industries, we find Dugans, Torneys, Harringtons, O'Briens, Dowlings, Gainers, Murphys, Moores, Dillons, O'Rourkes, Kennys, Raths, Caseys, Norrises, O'Farrells, Browns, Hams, Duffies, Ballastees, Gayans, and Garrigans. Dr. Santiago O'Farrell, son of one of the earliest Irish pioneers, holds a foremost position among the distinguished lawyers of the present day. An Irish engineer, Mr. John Coughlin, gave Buenos Aires its first waterworks. The British Hospital has, at present, for its leading surgeon, a distinguished Irishman, Dr. Luke O'Connor. A son of Peter Sheridan, educated in England, has left the finest landscapes of South America by any artist born in America. He died at Buenos Aires in his 27th year, 1861. Among the public men of Irish descent 50 years ago in Buenos Aires are to be mentioned the distinguished lawyer and politician Dalmacio Velez Sarsfield and John Dillon, Commissioner of Immigration. Dillon was the first to start a brewery in Buenos Aires, for which purpose he brought out workmen and machinery from Europe. All of his sons occupied distinguished positions. Richard O'Shea, President of the Chamber of Commerce in Buenos Aires, was born at Seville of an old Irish family banished by William III. Among the many valuable citizens of Buenos Aires who perished during the cholera of 1868 was Dr. Leslie, a native of Cavan, whose benevolence to the poor was unceasing. Henry O'Gorman, for some years chief of police in Buenos Aires, and afterwards governor of the penitentiary, was descended from an Irish family which went to Buenos Aires in the 18th century. His brother, Canon O'Gorman, was one of the dignitaries of the Archdiocese and director of the Boys' Reformatory. General Donovan, son of an Irish Dr. Donovan of Buenos Aires, had command of one of the sections of the New Indian Frontier. The first Irish chaplain was Father Burke, a venerable friar mentioned by Mr. Love in 1820 as over 70 years of age and much esteemed. When Rivadavia suppressed the orders in 1822, he allowed Father Burke to remain in the convent of Santo Domingo. After his death, the Irish residents in 1828 petitioned Archbishop Murray of Dublin for a chaplain. Accordingly, the Reverend Patrick Moran was selected, and he arrived in Buenos Aires in 1829. He died in the following year and was succeeded by the Reverend Patrick O'Gorman from Dublin, who continued as chaplain during 16 years till his death in 1847. The year 1843 is memorable for the arrival of Reverend Anthony Fay, with whose name the advancement of the Irish in Argentina will be forever identified. This great patriarch was born at Lachre, County Galway, in 1804, and made his ecclesiastical studies at St. Clement's Convent of Irish Dominicans at Rome. Being sent to the western states of America, he passed ten years in Ohio and Kentucky, after which, on the invitation of the Irish community of Buenos Aires, and by permission of the superior of his order, he came to the River Plate at a time when the prospects of the country and the Irish residents were far from promising. The history of the Irish community since that time is in some measure a recital of the labors of Father Fay. He it was who helped his countrymen to choose and buy their lands, which are now of such enormous value. Their increasing numbers and prosperity in the camp districts obliged him to endow each of the provincial partidos with a resident chaplain. Most of these clergymen were educated in Dublin and soon showed their zeal not merely in religious but also in social spheres. Irish reading rooms, libraries, and schools sprang up and laid the foundation for the refined Irish life of the present day in those districts. Among other services, Father Fay founded the Irish Convent, bringing out some Sisters of Mercy under Mrs. Mary Evangelist Fitzpatrick from Dublin, to whom he gave it in charge. Father Fay died in harness in 1871 of yellow fever. He attended a poor Italian woman, and on returning home was at once taken ill. He lasted only three days and expired peacefully, a martyr to his sacred calling. He died so poor that Mr. Armstrong had to discharge for him some small debts, and five others of his countrymen paid his funeral expenses. A fitting memorial of the deceased priest, the Fay College for Irish Orphan Boys in Argentina, 
has been erected in Buenos Aires, and a magnificent monument of Irish marble carved in Ireland also perpetuates his fame. The priests still living who were co-workers with Father Fahey and appointed by him to various partidos are Monsignor Samuel O'Reilly, deservedly beloved by his parishioners, and the Reverend Father Flannery, whose appointment to San Pedro brought a great influx of Irish farmers into that district. Among those who have gone to enjoy their eternal reward are the brothers, Reverend Michael and Reverend John Leahy, both of whom were indefatigable during the yellow fever in Buenos Aires. Reverend Father Molady, Reverend Patrick Lynch, Reverend James Curran, and Monsignor Curley were also among the Irish priests of that time. The Fahey College is entrusted to the care of the Marist brothers, who are largely Irish. The community of Holy Cross of the Passionist Fathers, who have as provincial the distinguished North American scholar Father Fidelis Kent Stone, is almost entirely composed of Irish and Irish Americans. They have several establishments in various provinces of Argentina. Irish priests are to be met with all over the country. In Patagonia and the Chaco, we also find a number of Protestant missionaries sent out by the Irish branch of the South American Missionary Society. Archdeacon Dillon succeeded Father Fahey as Irish chaplain in Buenos Aires, and, although by birth and education an Irishman, he became one of the principal dignitaries of the archdiocese. He was for some time professor of theology in the ecclesiastical seminary of Buenos Aires, and accompanied Archbishop Escalada as theologian to the Vatican Council in 1869. He was the founder of the Southern Cross in 1874, the Irish weekly paper which is now so ably edited by the gifted Irishman Mr. Gerald Foley. The first daily paper to appear in English in South America was The Standard, founded in 1861 by Michael G. Mulhall, the distinguished statistician, and is still one of the leading papers in the country. In conducting it, Michael G. Mulhall was joined by his brother Edward T. Mulhall in 1862 and for many years it was continuously under their care. The Standard still remains in the Mulhall family, and has for its editor a cousin of the former editors, Mr. John Mulhall, who wisely directs its course. The Argentina, an important paper in Spanish, was founded a few years since by Edward T. Mulhall, Jr., a brilliant son of the late Edward Mulhall of the Standard. The Hiberno-Argentine Review, a new Irish weekly, is edited by another able Irishman, James B. Sheridan. In Rio de Janeiro, the Anglo-Brazilian Times was founded in 1864 by an Irishman, Mr. Scully, who also wrote an important book on Brazil. Ireland had also its representatives in South American diplomacy and the making of treaties. As early as 1809, Colonel James Burke was sent by Lord Strangeford, British minister at Rio, on a confidential mission to Buenos Aires to negotiate the establishment of a separate kingdom on the River Plate with the Princess Charlotte as queen. In 1867, Mr. Gould, an Irishman, British chargé d'affaires, endeavored to mediate between the allies Brazil and Argentina and President Lopez of Paraguay, but without success. Stephen H. Sullivan, British Chargé d'Affaires for Chile, signed the Treaty of Commerce and Navigation between England and Chile on the 10th of May, 1852. He was afterwards appointed British Minister at Lima, where he was murdered. The late Chilean ministers to Buenos Aires and London, William Blessed Ghana and Albert Blessed Ghana, were the sons of an Irish Dr. Blessed from Sligo, who settled in Chile. In 1859, George Fagan signed a treaty with General Guido for compensation of losses to British subjects during the civil wars after the independence. The mining industry had among its pioneers brave sons of Erin. J.O. French went to Buenos Aires in 1826, and after an arduous mountain journey arrived at the foot of the Cerro Morado, where he found auriferous ores. Chevalier Edmund Temple, an Irish gentleman who had served in Spain in a dragoon regiment, also landed in Buenos Aires in 1826 and started across the Pampas, then almost uninhabited, until he came to the mountainous country where the Potosi mines were situated. In one of the defiles he lost his favorite horse, and in his book he bids a touching farewell to the friendly steed which had shared with him so many toils and dangers. Temple's successor in the Argentine mining provinces was Major Ricard Seaver, a member of an old County Dublin family. Several books of travel in South America have been published by Irish writers during the last 50 years. 
McCann's Travels in the Argentine Provinces, 1846-49, to contains much that is valuable concerning the history and manners of the country. Major Rickard Seaver issued in 1863 an interesting narrative of his crossing the Andes. Consul Hutchinson, an Irishman, published in 1864 his book, Argentine Gleanings, which was followed by another in 1869 called South American Recollections. Robert Crawford, an Irish engineer, led an expedition from Buenos Aires in November 1871 across the Indian Pampas and over the pass of the Planchon in the Andes to survey an overland route to Chile, and subsequently published an interesting account of his journey. The first book printed and published in English in South America was The Handbook of the River Plate, written by Michael G. Mulhall, and published by The Standard in 1861. The same author also published The Rural Code of Buenos Aires in 1867 and The Handbook of Brazil in 1877. In 1871, he published an account of his travels among the German colonies in Rio Grande do Sul. Twenty years ago, the writer of this sketch published Between the Amazon and the Andes and The Story of the Jesuit Missions of Paraguay. These books derive special interest from the fact that she was the first foreign woman ever seen in Coyaba, the capital of Mato Grosso, whither she accompanied her husband 2,500 miles from either the Atlantic or the Pacific seaboard. They arrived as far as the Diamantina Mountains, beyond Cuyaba, and saw the little rivers which form the sources of the mighty Amazon. Casting a glance over South America, we see in every country and province evidences of Irish genius employed not only in fighting, but in the development of natural resources. To quote Consul Cooper's report to the Foreign Office in London, quote, The progress of Buenos Aires is mainly due to the industrious Irish sheep farmers, unquote. No other nationality contributed so largely to the export trade of the country. At one time, it was shown by the tables of Mr. Dugan and other wool exporters that the quantity of the staple industry yearly sold by Irishmen in Buenos Aires exceeded that sold by all other nationalities. In later years, the Irish sheep farmers in the province of Buenos Aires have turned their lands into wheat lands, and the great industries of the country, sheep and cattle, have been moved to the outside camps, especially to that wonderful grazing region in the Andean Valleys recently visited by Colonel Roosevelt and his party. It may be interesting to mention that at the first English races ever held in South America, on November 6, 1826, the principal event, in which ten horses ran, was easily won by an Irish horse with the appropriate name of Shamrock. References Beaumont, Travels in Buenos Aires, 1828 Wilson, Travels in South America, 1796. Pinkerton, Travels, 1808. Captain Waddell, Cape Horn and South Atlantic Surveys. Major Gillespie, Buenos Aires and Provinces. Mrs. Williams, on Humboldt's Travels, 1826. Captain Master, at home with the Patagonians, 1891. Hadfield, Notes of Travel in Brazil and La Plata, 1863. Hinchcliffe, South American Sketches, 1862. Captain Burton, Highlands of Brazil. Ross Johnston, A Vacation in the Argentine Alps, 1867. McCann, Travels in the Argentine Provinces, 1846 to 1849. Hutchinson, Argentine Gleanings and South American Recollections. Major Seaver, Crossing the Andes. Crawford, Across the Pampas. V. McKenna, Life of O'Higgins, Life of Diego Romagro, History of Santiago, History of Valparaiso, McKenna, Archives of Spanish America, 50 volumes, Miller, Memoirs, Lives of Belgrano and San Martin, Mulhall, English in South America. End of section 24. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Section 25 of The Glories of Ireland This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jenny Adamson The Glories of Ireland, edited by Joseph Dunn and P.J. Lennox. Section 25 The Irish in Australasia by Brother Leo 
FSCMA. Should one be called upon to give in brief the history of the Irish in the land of the Southern Cross, he could do nothing more to the purpose than to relate the story of the Holy House of Australia. The episode, indeed, is characteristic not merely of the Irish in Australia, but of the Irish in every land and clime where they have striven and conquered. On the 14th of November, 1817, there landed in Sydney an Irish Cistercian father, Jeremiah F. Flynn. He had heard in Rome of the spiritual destitution of the Irish Catholics in Australia, and he secured the permission of his superiors to minister to the needs of his compatriots in the Antipodes. Shortly after his arrival, he celebrated Mass in the house of an Irishman named William Davis, who had been transported for making pikes for the insurgents in the days of 98, and then, on the first opportunity that presented itself, he sought the authorization of the colonial governor to exercise the functions of his sacred ministry. Far from hospitable was the reception accorded him by Governor Macquarie. The priest was told, with the bluntness characteristic of British officialdom, that the presence of no popish missionary would be tolerated in the settlement, and that the profession of the Protestant form of belief was obligatory on every person in the penal colony. With the example of the priesthood hunted down like wolves before him, Father Flynn saw but one consistent course to pursue. His fellow Catholics, his fellow Irishmen, were in sore need of his help. That help they must receive, even though the civil powers refused their sanction. So, for several months, he went about as secretly as he could, hearing confessions, offering the holy sacrifice, and breaking the bread of good counsel. During this trying period, Davis was his host and defender and friend. Eventually, the presence of the priest was detected. He was arrested and promptly sent back to England. Before the ship sailed, he tried repeatedly to return to the house of Davis, where the Blessed Sacrament was preserved in a cedar clothes press but the surveillance of his captors was strict and unsleeping. So in the dwelling of the convict Irishman, the sacred species remained. Before this unwanted repository, Davis kept a light ever burning day and night, and day and night crept the loyal Irishmen of the settlement to kneel in prayer before the impoverished shrine. The Holy House of Australia, as the Davis dwelling came to be known, remained the only Catholic church in the colony until 1821, when two Irish priests, Father John Joseph Terry of Cork and Father Philip Connolly of Kildare, were permitted to attend to the spiritual needs of the Irish Catholics. Their coming marked the beginning of religious toleration in Australia and the termination of the sufferings and sacrifices of the Irish colonists, several of whom had had to pay dearly for their religious convictions. Davis himself had been twice flogged and once imprisoned for refusing to attend Protestant service. Today, on the site of the Holy House of Australia, stands the Church of St. Patrick. Davis gave the land and the sum of £1,000 to the church, and his fellow exiles contributed according to their means. This episode in the history of the Irish in Australia pays a touchingly eloquent tribute to the spirit of loyalty to God and country, which has characterised the sons and daughters of St. Patrick everywhere whither their feet have strayed. It is the spirit which has made the Irish play so conspicuous a role in the civic and commercial history of Australasia. Originally known as New Holland, Australia became an English penal colony after the outbreak of the Revolutionary War in the United States of America. An Irish element came into the colony in the last decade of the 18th century when, during the Orange Reign of Terror, upwards of a thousand people from the west of Ireland were deported by the Ulster magistrates and by Lord Carhampton the notorious Satanides, who was charged with the pacification of Connaught. And during the first three decades of the 19th century, the stream of Irish transportation flowed on. As a result of the tithes agitation, the charter and reform movements, the combination laws and the corn laws, many more Irish men were forced across the sea. It was not until 1868 that the convict system was permanently abolished. It is difficult for us of a later day to realise the meaning of that word, transportation. Let us form some conception of what the Irish exiles suffered from the graphic picture painted in colours, sombre but not untrue, by one who knew from first-hand experience the lot of the political prisoner. Writes Dr Ullathorne in The Horrors of Transportation, 
Take any one of you, my dear readers, separate him from his wife, from his children, from all those whose conversation makes life dear to him. Cast him on the ends of the earth. Let him there fall among reprobates who are the last stain and disgrace of our common nature. Give him those obscene-mouthed monsters for his constant companions and consolers. Let the daily vision of their progress from infamy to infamy, until the demon that inspires them has exhausted invention and the powers of nature together, be his only example. House him at night in a bark hut on a mud floor, where he has less comfort than your cattle in their stalls. Awake him from the troubled dreams of his wretched wife and outcast children to feel how far he is from their help, and take him out at sunrise, work him under a burning sun and a heartless overseer, and the threat of the lash until the nightfall. Give him not a penny's wages but sorrow. Leave him no hope but the same dull, dreary round of endless drudgery for many years to come. Let him see no opening by which to escape, but through a long, narrow prospect of police courts, of jails, of triangles, of death cells, and of penal settlements. Let him all the while be clothed in a dress of shame that shows to every living soul his degradation. And if he dare to sell any part of that clothing, then flog him worse than any dog. And thus, whilst severed from all kindness and all love, whilst the stern harsh voice of his taskmaster is grating in incessant jars within his ear, take all rest out of his flesh, and plant the thorn. Take all feeling out of his heart, and leave the withered core. Take all peace out of his conscience, and leave the worm of remorse. And then let any one come and dare to tell me that the man is happy because he has bread and meat. Is it not here, if ever there was such a case, where the taste of bread is a taste of misery, and where to feed in prolonged life is to feed in lengthen our sorrow? And in pondering these things, do not those strong words of sacred scripture bring down their load of truth in heavy trouble to our thoughts, that their bread is loathsome to their eye, and their meat unto their soul? But the bright side of the story of the Irish in Australia and New Zealand unfolds in the subsequent years. The men who had been sent forth from Erin with the brand of the convict upon them became the founders of a new commonwealth. To them were joined the numerous voluntary settlers who, attracted by the natural resources of the island continent, and especially by the gold discoveries of the fifties, migrated to Queensland, Victoria and New South Wales. When, in 1858, William E. Gladstone sought to establish a new colony to be known as North Australia, he opened a fresh field for Irish initiative. As a result of his effort, there stands today, on a terrace overlooking Port Curtis, the city of Gladstone, the terminal of the Australian railway system. It was here, according to Cardinal Moran, that in 1606 Mass was first celebrated in Australia, when the Spaniards sought shelter in the harbour of the Holy Cross. The first government resident at Gladstone was Sir Maurice Charles O'Connell, a relative of the Great Liberator. He was four times acting governor of Queensland. The list of Irish pioneer settlers in Australasia is a lengthy one. The name of Thomas Poynton stands out prominently. He was a New Zealand pioneer who had married an Irish girl in Sydney. The devotion of Poynton and his wife to the faith of their fathers is evidenced by the fact that he several times made the long journey from his home to Sydney to interest the church authorities in the wants of the New Zealand Irish Catholics, and that she twice made the same arduous trip to have her children baptised. Thomas Mooney has the distinction of being the first Irish pioneer in Western Australia, and yet another Irishman, Cassidy by name, carried out a policy of benevolent assimilation by marrying the daughter of a Maori chief. Among the pioneer ecclesiastics were Father William Kelly of Melbourne and Father John Mackencrow, a native of Tipperary and a Maynooth man, who for 30 years and more was a prominent figure in the religious and civic life of New South Wales. Father John Brady, another pioneer priest, became Bishop of Perth. Irish names occupy a conspicuous and honoured place in the roster of the Australian Episcopate. Notable on the list are Bishop Francis Murphy of Adelaide, who was born in County Meath, and Archbishop Daniel Murphy of Sydney, a native of Cork, the man who delivered the eulogy on the occasion of Daniel O'Connell's funeral at Rome. 
but scant reference can here be made to the illustrious primate of Australia, Cardinal Moran, Archbishop of Sydney from 1884 to 1911, who was such a potent force in the land of his adoption, and whose masterly history of the Catholic Church in Australasia puts him in the forefront of ecclesiastical historians. On his death he was succeeded in the See of Sydney by another Irishman, Archbishop Michael Kelly of Waterford. Archbishop O'Reilly of Adelaide is a recognised authority on music and has written several pamphlets on that subject. A Galway man, Dr T.J. Carr, a great educator, is now, 1914, Archbishop of Melbourne, and Clare man, Dr J.P. Clune, holds sway in Perth. Irish men in Australia have figured largely in the iron and coal industries, in the irrigation projects, in the manufacturing activities and in the working of the gold mines. But they have likewise distinguished themselves in other fields of endeavour. Prominent on the beadroll of Australian fame stand the names of Sir Charles Gavin Duffy, 1816-1903, founder of the Nation newspaper in Dublin, member of the British House of Commons and afterwards Premier of Victoria and Speaker of the Legislative Assembly, and his sons, John Gavin Duffy and Frank Gavin Duffy, public-spirited citizens and authorities on legal matters. The Currens, father and son, active in the public life of Sydney, were afterwards members of the British Parliament. Distinguished in the records of the Australian judiciary are Judges Quinlan, Casey, Brennan and O'Dowd. The Reverend J. Milne Curran, FGS, is a geologist who has achieved more than local fame. Other Irishmen who have loomed large in Australasian affairs are Daniel Brophy, John Cuman, Augustus Leo Kenny, James Coughlin, Sir Patrick Buckley, Sir John O'Shaughnessy and Nicholas Fitzgerald. Louis C. Brennan, C.B., who was born in Ireland in 1852, emigrated to Australia when a boy and, while working in a civil engineer's office in Melbourne, conceived the idea of the Brennan torpedo, which he afterwards perfected and then, in 1897, sold the invention to the British Admiralty for £110,000. Another Brennan, Frank by name, is President of the Knights of Our Lady of the Southern Cross and has been a Labour member of the Federal Parliament since 1911. A third, Christopher John, is Assistant Lecturer in Modern Literature in the University of Sydney and a fourth, James, of the Diocese of Perth, was made a Knight of St Sylvester by Pius X in 1912. Young Australia and New Zealand may be as the world goes, but already both have much to their credit in the domains of music, art and literature. And here, as usual, the Irish have been to the fore. In the writing of poetry, history and fiction, the Celtic element has been especially distinguished. Not to speak of the writers mentioned elsewhere in this sketch, scores of Irish men and women have been identified with the development of an Australian literature, which, though delightfully redolent of the land whence it sprang, nevertheless possesses the universal note which makes it a truly human product. Many years ago, one of the most gifted of Irish-Australian singers, Eva of the Nation, voiced a tentative plaint. O oh, barren land, O oh, blank bright sky, methinks it were a noble duty to kindle in that vacant eye the light of spirit, beauty, to fill with airy shapes divine thy lonely plains and mountains, the orange grove, the bower of vine, the silvery lakes and fountains, to wake the voiceless, silent air to soft, melodious numbers, to raise thy lifeless form so fair from those deep spellbound slumbers. Oh, whose shall be the potent hand to give that touch informing, and make thee rise, O southern land, to life and poesy warming? Mrs. O'Doherty herself, who long lived in that Queensland which she thus apostrophised, helped in no uncertain way to answer her own question. So did John Farrell, the author of the truly remarkable Jubilee Ode of 1897 and of a collection of poems which include the well-known How He Died. And so, long before, had the non-Catholic Irishman, Edward O'Shaughnessy, who went to Australia as a convict but who laughed in lockstep and made music with his chains. James Francis Hogan, author and journalist, was born in Tipperary in 1855 and shortly afterward was brought by his parents to Melbourne where he received his education. On his return to Ireland, he was elected to represent his native country in Parliament. 
He is an authority on Australian history and in his book on the Gladstone Colony has given us a fine specimen of modern historical method. With him must be mentioned Roderick Flanagan, whose history of New South Wales appeared in 1862. Other Irish names distinguished in Australasian literature are those of the New Zealand poet Thomas Bracken, Roderick Quinn, Desmond Byrne, J.B. O'Hara, the eccentric convict writer George Barrington Waldron, Victor J. Daly, Bernard O'Dowd, Edwin J. Brady, the Reverend J.J. J. Malone and the Reverend W. Kelly. Finally, the Irish in Australia have done more than their share in the work of education and social service. Under Irish auspices, several of the Catholic teaching congregations, including the Christian Brothers and the Presentation Nuns, were introduced, and their work has borne goodly fruit. A mighty power for good is the Hibernian Australasian Benefit Society. The organisation, which was founded in 1871, has spread rapidly and has a large active membership. Truly, the land of the Southern Cross is not the dimmest jewel in the coronet of Ireland's glories. References Hogan, The Irish in Australia, 1888 The Gladstone Colony, 1898 Menel, Dictionary of Australian Biography, 1892 Duffy, Life in Two Hemispheres, 1903 Kenny, The Catholic Church in Australia to the Year 1840 Moran, History of the Catholic Church in Australasia, 1898. Davitt, Life and Progress in Australasia, 1898. Bonwick, The First Twenty Years of Australia, 1883. Flanagan, History of New South Wales, 1862. Byrne, Australian Writers, 1896. Wilson, The Church in New Zealand, 1910. Hocken, A Bibliography of the Literature Relating to New Zealand, 1909. End of section 25. Recording by Jenny Adamson. Section 26 of The Glories of Ireland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. The Glories of Ireland. Edited by Joseph Dunn and P.J. Lennox. The Irish in South Africa. By A. Milliard Hatteridge. The tide of emigration from Ireland has set chiefly towards America and Australia. In South Africa, therefore, the Irish element among the colonists has never been a large one. But despite its comparatively small numbers, it has been an important factor in the life of South Africa. Here, as in so many other countries, it has been the glory of the sons of Aaron to be a missionary people. To their coming is due the very existence of the Catholic Church in these southern lands. When Dr. Ullathorne touched at the Cape on his way to Australia in 1832, he found at Cape Town a single priest for the whole of South Africa, an English Benedictine, who soon afterwards returned to Europe in broken health. Few Irish immigrants had by that time found their way to the Cape. They began to arrive in numbers only after the famine year. The founder of the Catholic hierarchy in South Africa was the Irish Dominican Patrick R. Griffith, who in 1837 was sent to Cape Town by Gregory XVI as the first vicar apostolic of Cape Colony. His successors at the Cape, Bishops Grimley, Leonard, and Rooney, have all been Irishmen, and nine in every ten of their flock have from the first been Irish by birth or descent. 
in the earlier years of bishop griffith's episcopate there was a large garrison in south africa on account of the kaffir wars many of these soldiers were irishmen at grahamstown in eighteen forty four the soldiers of an irish regiment stationed there did most of the work of building st patrick's church one of the oldest catholic churches in south africa they worked without wages or reward of any kind purely out of their devotion to their faith giving up most of their leisure to this voluntary labor ten years after bishop griffith's appointment pius the ninth separated natal and the eastern districts of cape colony from cape town and erected the eastern vicariate apostolic once more an irish prelate was the first bishop aden Devereux, who was consecrated by bishop griffith at cape town in the christmas week of eighteen forty seven the great emigration from ireland had now begun and a stream of immigrants was arriving at the cape bishop Devereux fixed his residence at port elizabeth and of his four successors up to the present day three have been irish bishop moran who went out to port elizabeth in eighteen fifty four was consecrated at carlow in ireland by archbishop afterwards cardinal cullen the third vicar apostolic was bishop reichards and the present bishop is another irishman dr hugh mcsherry who received his consecration from the hands of cardinal logue at st patrick's cathedral at armagh until the discovery of the diamond deposits in what is now the kimberley district some forty years ago the irish immigrants had chiefly settled in the ports and along the coast but among the crowds who went to seek their fortunes at the diamond fields were large numbers of adventurous irishmen the mission church established at kimberley became the center of a new bishopric in 1886 when the vicariate of kimberley which for some time included the orange free state was established and an irish oblate father anthony Garan, was appointed its first bishop he was succeeded in 1901 by his namesake and fellow countryman the present bishop matthew Garan. the gold discoveries on the witwatersrand about johannesburg produced another rush into the interior in the days after the first transvaal war a great city of foreign immigrants the Uitlanders, grew up rapidly on the upland where a few months before there had been only a few scattered boer farms irishmen from cape colony and natal from ireland itself and from the united states formed a large element in the local mining and trading community they were mostly workers few of them found their way into the controlling financier class which was largely jewish the irish were better out of the circle of international gamblers whose intrigues finally produced the terrible two years bloodshed of the great south african war many engineers of the mines were irish americans huge consignments of mining machinery arrived from the united states and many of the engineers who came to fit it up remained in the employ of the mining companies until after the war the transvaal and johannesburg had depended ecclesiastically on the vicar apostolic of natal but in 1904 a transvaal vicariate was erected and once more the first bishop was an irishman 
Dr. William Miller, O.M.I. We have seen how Irish the South African Episcopate has been from the very outset. Most of the clergy belong to the same missionary race, as also do the nuns of the various convents and the Christian brothers who are in charge of many of the schools. Of the white Catholic population of the various states of the South African Union, the greater part are Irish. There are about 25,000 Irish in Cape Colony, in a total population of over two millions. There are some 7,000 in Natal, 1,500 in Kimberley, and about 2,000 in the Orange River Colony. In the Transvaal, chiefly in and about Johannesburg, there are some 12,000 Irish. A few thousand more are to be found scattered in Griqualand and Rhodesia. As has been already said, the total numbers are not large in proportion to that of the population generally, and they belong chiefly to the industrial and trading classes. The most notable names among them are those of prelates, priests, and missionaries, who have founded and built up the organization of the Catholic Church in South Africa. But there are some names of note also in civil life. Sir Michael Galway was for many years Chief Justice of Natal. The Honorable A. Wilmot who has not only held high official posts, but has also done much to clear up the early history of South Africa, is Irish on the mother's side. Mr. Justice Scheel is a judge of the Cape Courts. Iyer and Woodbine are Irish names among the makers of Rhodesia. And amongst those who have done remarkable work in official life may also be named Sir Geoffrey Lagden, Sir William St. John Carr, and the Honorable John Daverin. Lagden was for many years British resident in Basutoland, the Switzerland of South Africa, where the native tribes are practically independent under a British protectorate. Griffith, the paramount chief of the Basuto nation, has been a Catholic since 1911. Sir Geoffrey's tactful policy and wise counsels did much to promote the prosperity of this native state, and during the trying days of the South African War, he was able to secure the neutrality of the tribesmen. In the Boer Wars, Irishmen fought with distinction on both sides. General Colley, who fell at Majuba, in the First Boer War, was a distinguished Irish soldier. Another great Irishman, General Sir William Butler, has written the story of Colley's life. Butler himself was in command of the troops at the Cape before the Great War. If his wise counsels had been followed by the government, the war would undoubtedly have been avoided. He refused to have any part in the war-provoking policy of Rhodes and Chamberlain, and warned the home government that an attack on the Dutch republics would be a serious and perilous enterprise. When the war came, England owed much to the enduring valor of Irish soldiers and to the leadership of Irish generals. One need only name General Hart, of the Irish Brigade, General French, who relieved Kimberley, and who is now, 1914, Field Marshal and Commander-in-Chief of the British Army in France, General Mann, who raised the siege of Mafeking, Colonel Moore of the famous Connick Rangers, now, 1914, Commandant and chief military adviser of the Irish National Volunteers, and finally Lord Roberts, who took over the chief command and saved the situation after the early disasters. Lord Kitchener, who acted as Roberts' chief of staff, succeeded him 
in the command and brought the war to an end by an honorable treaty with the boer leaders is a native of ireland but of english descent and he passed most of his boyhood in ireland in county kerry where his father had bought a small property i used to know an irish franciscan lay brother who told me he had taught the future soldier many games when he was quite a little fellow of the regiments which took part in the war none won a higher fame than the munster and the dublin fusiliers and the conic rangers it was in recognition of their splendid valor that the new regiment of irish guards was added to the british army but the majority of irishmen sympathized with the boer republics and many of them fought under the boer flag of these were legally british subjects but many were naturalized burghers of the transvaal and many more were united states citizens irish americans from the rand gold mines there were two small irish brigades under the boer flag those of mcbride and lynch the latter now a member of the british house of commons and an engineer corps commanded by colonel blake an american at the very first battle before ladysmith it was one of the irish brigades that kept the boer guns in action bringing up ammunition under a rain of shell fire during the boer retreat and robert's advance on pretoria blake's engineers were always with the boer rear guard and successfully destroyed every mile of the railway as they went back blake had served in the united states cavalry had learned mining while on duty in nevada and had then gone to seek his fortune in johannesburg the great leader of the boer armies now the prime minister of the new south africa which has happily arisen out of the storm of war has irish connections louis botta lived before the war in the southeast transvaal not far from lang's neck and near neighbors of his were a family of irish settlers bearing the honored name of emmet the emmets and the botas were united by ties of friendship and intermarriage and one of the emmets served with louis botta during the war the irish colonists of south africa kept their love for faith and fatherland but as in the united states they have thoroughly and loyally thrown in their lot with the new country of which they have become citizens few in number though they are they are an important factor in the new dominion for their national tradition inspires them with civic patriotism and their religion gives them a high standard of conduct and puts before them as guides in the work of life and the solution of the problems of the day the christian principles of justice and charity references government census returns south africa catholic directory for british south africa cape town since 1904 the catholic magazine cape town wilmot and chase history of cape colony london 1896 teal history of south africa five volumes london 1888 to 1893 for the war period the times history of the south african war and the british official history end of chapter 26 Recording by John Brandon. Section 27 of The Glories of Ireland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Glories of Ireland, edited by Joseph Dunn and P.J. Lennox. Section 27, Irish Language and Letters, by Douglas Hyde, LLD. M -R -I -A. The Celtic languages consist of two divisions, 
a the gaelic or irish division and b the kimrick or welsh division between them they comprise a irish scotch gaelic and manx and b welsh armorican and cornish all these languages are still alive except cornish which died out about a hundred years ago of all these languages irish is the best preserved and it is possible to follow its written literature back into the past for some thirteen hundred years while much of the most interesting matter has come down to us from pagan times it has left behind it the longest the most luminous and the most consecutive literary track of any of the vernacular languages of europe except greek alone for centuries the irish and their language were regarded by the english as something strange and foreign to europe it was not recognized that they had any relationship with the greeks or romans the french the germans or the english the once well-known statesman lord lyndhurst in the british parliament denounced the irish as aliens in religion in blood and in language bop in his great comparative grammar refused them recognition as indo-europeans and Pott, in 1856, also denied their European connection. It was left for the great Bavarian scholar, John Caspar Zeus, to prove to the world in his epoch-making Grammatica Celtica, published in Latin in 1853, that the Celts were really Indo-Europeans, and that their language was of the highest possible value and interest. From that day to the present, it is safe to say that the value set upon the Irish language and literature has been steadily growing amongst the scholars of the world, and that in the domain of philology, Old Irish now ranks close to Sanskrit for its truly marvellous and complicated scheme of word forms and inflections, and its whole verbal system. The exact place which the Celtic languages, of which Irish is philologically far the most important, hold in the Indo-European group has often been discussed. It is now generally agreed upon that, although both the Celtic and Teutonic languages may claim a certain kinship with each other, as being both of them Indo-European, still the Celtic is more nearly related to the Greek and the Latin groups, especially to the Latin. All the Indo-European languages are more or less related to one another. We Irish must acknowledge a relationship, or rather a very distant connecting tie, with English. But to trace this home, Irish must be followed back to the very oldest form of its words, and English must be followed back to Anglo-Saxon, and, when possible, to Gothic. The hard mutes, p, t, k, of Celtic, and for that matter of Sanskrit, Zend, Greek, Latin, Slavonic, and Lithuanian, will be represented in Gothic by the corresponding soft mutes, b, d, g, and the soft mutes in Celtic by the corresponding hard mutes in Gothic. Thus we find the Irish Gia, god, in the Anglo-Saxon Tiu, the god of war, whose name is perpetuated for all time in Tuisdag, now Tuesday, and we find the Irish Death in the Anglo-Saxon Toth, now Tooth, and so on. But of all the Indo-European languages, Old Irish possesses by far the nearest affinity to Latin, and this is shown in a great many ways, not in the vocabulary merely, but in the grammar, which for philologists is of far more importance, as, for example, the B future, the passive in R, the genitive singular and nominative plural of O stems, etc. Thus the Old Irish for man, nominative fer, genitive fir, dative fir, Accusative fern, plural nominative fir, genitive fern, is derived from the older forms wiros, wiri, wiro, wiron, nominative plural, wiri, genitive plural, wiron, which everyone who knows Latin can see at a glance correspond very closely to the Latin inflections vir, viri, viro, virum, nominative plural viri, etc. So much for the language. When did this language begin to be used in literature? This question depends upon another. When did the Irish begin to have a knowledge of letters? When did they begin to commit their literature to writing? And whence did they borrow their knowledge of this art? The oldest alphabet used in Ireland, of which remains exist, appears to have been the Ogham, or Oam, which is found in numbers of stone inscriptions, dating from about the third century of our era on. About 300 such inscriptions have already been found, most of them in the southwest of Ireland, but some also in Scotland and Wales, 
and even in Devon and Cornwall. Wherever the Irish Gael planted a colony, he seems to have brought his Ogham writing with him. The Irishman who first invented the Ogham character was probably a pagan who obtained a knowledge of Roman letters. He brought back to Ireland his invention, or, as is more likely, invented it on Irish soil. Indeed, the fact that no certain trace of Ogham writing has been found upon the European continent indicates that the alphabet was invented in Ireland itself. An inscription at Killeen Cormac, County Kildare, survives, which seems to show that the Roman alphabet was known in Ireland in pagan times. Ogham is an alphabet suitable enough for chiseling upon stones, but too cumbrous for the purposes of literature. For this, the Roman alphabet must have been used. The Ogham script consists of a number of short lines, straight or slanting, and drawn either below, above, or through one long stem line. This stem line is generally the sharp angle between two faces or sides of a long upright rectangular stone. Thus four cuts to the right of the long line stand for S, to the left of it they mean C, passing through it, half on one side and half on the other, they mean Z. The device was rude, but it was applied with considerable skill, and it was undoubtedly framed with much ingenuity. The vowels, occurring most often, are also the easiest to cut being scarcely more than notches on the edge of the stone. The inscription generally consists of the name of the dead warrior over whom the memorial was raised. It usually begins on the left corner of the stone facing the reader, and is to be read upwards, and is often continued down on the right-hand angular line as well. The language of the Ogham inscriptions is very ancient, and nearly the same forms occur as in what we know of Old Gaulish. The language, in fact, seems to have been an antique survival, even when it was first engraved in the 3rd or 4th century. The word forms are probably far older than those used in the spoken language of the time. This is a very important conclusion, and it must have a far-reaching bearing upon the history of the earliest epic literature. Because if forms of language, much more ancient than any that were then current, were employed on pillar stones in the 3rd or 4th century, it follows that this obsolescent language must have survived either in a written or a regularly recited form. This immediately raises the probability that the substance of Irish epic literature, which was written down on parchment in the 6th or 7th century, really dates from a period much more remote, and that all that is purely pagan in it was preserved for us in the same antique language as the Ogham inscriptions before it was translated into what we now call Old Irish. The following is the Ogham alphabet as preserved on some 300 ancient pillars and stones in the probably 9th century treatise in the Book of Ballymote and elsewhere. Each letter consists of one to five parallel strokes in increasing order as follows. Above the stem line, H, D, T, C, Q. Below the stem line, B, L, V, S, N. Diagonally across it, M, G, ng z r vertically across it in short notches a o u e i there are a great many allusions to this Ogham writing in the ancient epics especially in those that are purely pagan in form and conception and there can be no doubt that the knowledge of letters must have reached ireland before the island became christianized with the introduction of Christianity and of Roman letters, the old Ogham inscriptions, which were no doubt looked upon as flavoring of paganism, quickly fell into disuse and disappeared, but some inscriptions, at least, are as late as the year 600 or even 800. In the thoroughly pagan poem, The Voyage of Bran, which such authorities as Tsima and Kuno Maya both consider to have been committed to parchment in the 7th century, we find it stated that Bran wrote the 50 or 60 quatrains of the poem in Ogham. Cuchulain constantly used Ogham writing, which he cut upon wands and trees and standing stones, for Queen Maeve's army to read, and these were always brought to his friend Fergus to decipher. Cormac, king of Cashel, in his glossary, tells us that the pagan Irish used to inscribe the wands they kept for measuring corpses and graves with Ogham characters, and that it was a source of horror to anyone even to take it in his hand. St. Patrick, in his confession, the authenticity of which no one doubts, describes how he dreamt that a man from Ireland came to him with innumerable letters. In Irish legend, Ogma, 
one of the Tuatha de Danann, who was skilled in dialects and poetry, seems to be credited with the invention of the Ogham alphabet, and he probably was the equivalent of the Gaulish god Ogmios, the god of eloquence, so interestingly described by Lucian. We may take it, then, that the Irish pagans knew sufficient letters to hand down to Irish Christians the substance of their pagan epics, sagas, and poems. We may take it for granted, also, that the greater Irish epics, purely pagan in character, utterly untouched in substance by that Christianity which so early conquered the country, really represent the thoughts, manners, feelings, and customs of pagan Ireland. The effect of this conclusion must be startling indeed to those who know the ancient world only through the medium of Greek and Roman literature. To the Greek and to his admiring master, the Roman, all outside races were simply barbarians, at once despised, misinterpreted, and misunderstood. We have no possible means of reconstructing the ancient world as it was lived by the ancestors of some of the leading races in Europe, the Gauls, Spaniards, Britons, and the people of all those countries which trace themselves back to a Celtic ancestry, because these races have left no literature or records behind them, and the Greeks and Romans, who tell us about them, saw everything through the false medium of their own prejudices. But now, since the discovery and publication of the Irish sagas and epics, the descendants of these great races no longer find it necessary to view their own past through the colored and distorting glasses of the Greek or the Roman, since there has now opened for them, where they least expected to find it, a window through which they can look steadily at the life of their race, or of one of its leading offshoots, in one of its strongholds, and reconstruct for themselves with tolerable accuracy the life of their own ancestors. It is impossible to overrate the importance of this for the history of Europe, because neither Teutons nor Slavs have preserved pictures of their own heroic past dating from pagan times. It is only the Celts, and of these the Irish, who have handed down such pictures drawn with all the fond intimacy of romance, and descriptions which exhibit the life of Western Europeans at an even earlier culture stage in the evolution of humanity, than do the poems of Homer. This conclusion, to which a study of the literature invites us, falls in exactly with that arrived at from purely archaeological sources. Professor Ridgway of Cambridge University, working on archaeological lines, expresses himself as follows, quote, From this survey of the material remains of the Latin period found actually in Ireland, and from the striking correspondence between this culture and that depicted in the Tyne Bocugne, and from the circumstance that the race who are represented in the epic is possessing this form of culture, resemble in their physique the tall, fair-haired, grey-eyed Celts of Britain and the continent, we are justified in inferring, one, that there was an invasion or invasions of such peoples from Gaul in the centuries immediately before Christ, as is described by the Irish traditions, and two, that the poems themselves originally took shape when the Latin culture was still flourishing in Ireland. But as this could hardly have continued much later than A.D. 100, we may place the first shaping of the poems not much later than that date, and possibly a century earlier." End quote. This conclusion would make the earliest putting together of the Irish epics almost contemporaneous with Augustus Caesar. So much for the history and growth of Irish letters. References Brash, Ogham Inscribed Monuments of the Gael, 1879 McAllister, Studies in Irish Epigraphy, Volume 1, 1897, Volume 2, 1902, Volume 3, 1907. Rees, In Proceedings of the Scottish Society of Antiquaries, Edinburgh, 1892. Ridgeway, Date of the First Shaping of the Cuchulain Saga, 1905, In Proceedings of the British Academy, Volume 2. Joyce, Social History of Ancient Ireland, Volume 1, Chapter 2. Preface to Facsimile Edition of the Book of Ballymoat. End of section 27. Recording by Owen Cook in Pottawatomie Ceded Land. Section 28 of The Glories of Ireland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Olson Fytak, Los Angeles. The Glories of Ireland. Edited by Joseph Dunn and P. J. Lennox. Section 28. Native Irish Poetry 
by Professor Georges Dautin. Note. This chapter was written in French by M. Dautin, who is a distinguished professor and dean at the University of Renac, France. The translation into English has been made by the editors. By the year 1200 of the Christian era, a time at which the other national literatures of Europe were scarcely beginning to develop, Ireland possessed, and had possessed for several centuries, a Gaelic poetry, which was either the creation of the soul of the people, or else was the work of the courtly bards. This poetry was at first expressed in rhythmical verses, each containing a fixed number of accented syllables and hemisticks separated by a pause. Christlim, Christ Reum, Christ Indaghat, Christ Indium, Christ Isum, Christ Uasum, Christ Desum, Christ Uasum. This versification, one of the elements of which was the repetition of words or sounds at regular intervals, was transformed about the eighth century into a more learned system. Thenceforward, alliteration, assonance, rhyme, and a fixed number of syllables constituted the characteristics of Irish verse. Misa okus panguraban, hichtar nachar friasandan, bita men masam friserlich, mumen makin im sechthert. As we see, the consonants in the rhyme words were merely related. L, R, N, N, G, M, D, H, G, H, B, H, M, H, C, H, T, H, F could rhyme together just as could G, G, D, D, B, B. Soon the poets did not limit themselves to end rhymes, which ran the risk of becoming monotonous, but introduced also internal rhyme, which set up what we may call a continuous chain of melody. Is ere caram dore, ara reda agone, se homat a engel hind, o shind go athorele. This harmonious versification was replaced in the seventeenth century by a system in which account was no longer taken of consonantal rhyme or of the number of syllables. The rules of Irish verse have nothing in common with classical Latin meters, which were based on the combination of short and long syllables. In low Latin, indeed, we find occasionally alliteration, rhyme, and a fixed number of syllables, but these novelties are obviously of foreign origin and date from the time when the Romans borrowed them from the nations which they called barbarous. We cannot prove beyond yea or nay that they are of Celtic origin, but it is extremely probable that they are, for it is among the Celts both of Ireland and of Wales that the harmonizing of vowels and of consonants has been carried to the highest degree of perfection. This learned art was not acquired without long study. The training of a poet, Filet, lasted twelve years or more. The poets had a regular hierarchy. The highest in rank, the Olav, knew 350 kinds of verse and could recite 250 principal and 100 secondary stories. The Olams lived at the court of the kings and the nobles, who granted them freehold lands. Their persons and their property were sacred, and they had established in Ireland schools in which the people might learn history, poetry, and law. The bards formed a numerous class of a rank inferior to the filet. They did not enjoy the same honors and privileges. Some of them even were slaves. According to their standing, different kinds of verse were assigned to them as a monopoly. The Danish invasions in the ninth century set back for some time the development of Irish poetry, but when the Irish had driven the fierce and aggressive sea-rovers from their country, 
there was a literary renaissance. This was in turn checked by the Anglo-Norman invasion in the 12th century, and thereafter the art of versification was no longer so refined as it had formerly been. Nevertheless, the Bardic schools still existed in the 17th century, more than 400 years after the landing of Strongbow, and in them students followed the lectures of the Olams for six months each year, or until the coming of spring, exercising both their talents for composition and their memory. A catalogue of Irish poets, which has recently been made out, shows that there were more than a thousand of them. We have lost many of the oldest poems, but the Irish scribes often modernized the texts which they were copying. Hence the language is not always a sufficient indication of date, and it is possible that, under a comparatively modern form, some very ancient pieces may have been preserved. Even if the poems attributed to Amergin do not go back to the 10th century B.C., as has been claimed for them, they are in any case old enough to be archaic, and certain poems of the mythological cycle are undoubtedly anterior to the Christian era. We have reason to believe that there have been preserved some genuine poems of Finn Macumal, 3rd century, a hymn by St. Patrick, D. 461, some greatly altered verses of St. Columcille, D. 597, and certain hymns written by saints who lived from the 7th to the 9th century. The main object of the most celebrated of the ancient poets up to the end of the 12th century was to render history, genealogy, toponymy, and lives of saints readier of access and easier to retain by putting them into verse form, and it is the names of those scholars that have been rescued from oblivion, while lyric poetry, having as its basis nothing more than sentiment, has remained for the most part anonymous. After the Anglo-Norman invasion, the best poet seems to have been Don Cadach Morodali, d. 1244. Of later date were Teg Magdere, fifteen seventy to sixteen fifty two, Teg Dal O'Higgin, d sixteen fifteen, and Yokadech O'Hasi, who belonged to the seventeenth and eighteenth centuries. The new school, which abandoned the old rules, and whose inspiration is now personal, now patriotic, is represented by Kena, Keens or laments, Abran, hymns, or Eislingi, visions composed among others by Geoffrey Keating, D.C. 1650, David Obrodar, C. 1625 to 1698, Egan O'Reilly, C. 1670, C. 1734, John MacDonnell, 1691 to 1754. William O'Heffernan, F. L. seventeen fifty, John O'Tawmy, seventeen o six to seventeen seventy five, and Andrew McGrath, D. C. seventeen ninety. The greatest of the eighteenth century Irish poets was Owen Rowe O'Sullivan, C. seventeen forty eight to seventeen eighty four, whose songs were sung everywhere, and who in the opinion of his editor, Father Dinin, is the literary glory of his country, and deserves to be ranked among the few supreme lyric poets of all time. If, in order to study the subjects treated by the poets, we lay aside didactic poetry and confine ourselves to the ancient poems from the 7th to the 11th century, we shall find in the latter a singular variety. They were at first dialogues or monologues, now found incorporated with the sagas of which they may have formed the original nucleus. Thus, in the voyage of Bran, we have the account of the Isles of the Blessed and the discourse of the King of the Sea. 
in the expedition of Loger Macrinachan the brilliant description of the fairy hosts, in the death of the sons of Unsech, the touching farewell of Deirdre to the land of Scotland, and her lamentation over the dead bodies of the three warriors, and in the lay of Fothard Canan, the strange and thrilling speech of the dead lover, returning after the battle to the tryst appointed by his sweetheart. Other poems seem never to have figured in a saga, like the song of Crede, daughter of Goere, in which she extols the memory of her friend Dinartach and the affecting love scenes between Liaden and Kurtir, or like the bardic songs designed to distribute praise or blame. The funeral panegyric on King Nial in alternate verses, the song of the sword of Carol, and the satire of Macongline against the monks of Cork. Religious poetry comprised lyric fragments, which were introduced into the lives of the saints, and there formed a kind of Christian saga, or else were based on holy writ, like the Lamentation of Eve, hymns in honor of the saints, like the hymn to St. Michael by Mael Isu, pieces such as the famous hymn of St. Patrick, and philosophic poems like that keen analysis of the flight of thought which dates from the tenth century. At a time when the poets of other lands seem wholly engrossed in the recital of the deeds of men, one of the great and constant distinguishing marks of poetry in Ireland, whether we have to do with a short note set down by a scribe on the margin of a manuscript, or with a religious or profane poem, is a deep, personal and intimate love of nature expressed not by detailed description but more often by a single picturesque and telling epithet thus we have the hermit who prays god to give him a hut in a lonely place beside a clear spring in the wood with a little lark to sing overhead or we have marban who rich in nuts crab apples sloes watercress and honey refuses to go back to the court to which the king, his brother, presses him to return. Now we have the description of the summer scene, in which the blackbird sings and the sun smiles. Now the song of the sea and of the wind, which blows tempestuously from the four quarters of the sky. Again the winter song, when the snow covers the hills, when every furrow is a streamlet, and the wolves range restlessly abroad, while the birds, numbed to the heart, are silent. Or yet again the recluse in his cell, humorously comparing his quest of ideas to the pursuit of the mice by his pet cat. This deep love of inanimate and animate things becomes individualized in those poems in which every tree, every spring, every bird is described with its own special features. If we remember that these original poems, which, before the twelfth century, expressed thoughts that were scarcely known to the literature of Europe before the eighteenth, are besides clothed in the rich garb of a subtle harmony, what admiration, what respect, and what love ought we not to show to that ancient Ireland which, in the darkest ages of Western civilization, not only became the depositary of Latin knowledge and spread it over the continent, but also had been able to create for herself new artistic and poetic forms. References Hyde, Love Songs of Canacht, Dublin, 1893 Irish Poetry, An Essay in Irish with Translation in English and a Vocabulary, Dublin, 1902. The Religious Songs of Connacht, London, 1906. Meyer, Ancient Gaelic Poetry, Glasgow, 1906. A Primer of Irish Metrics with a Glossary and an Appendix containing an Alphabetical List of the Poets of Ireland. Dublin, 1909. Dotin Dunn, The Gaelic Literature of Ireland, Washington, 1906. 
Meyer, Selections from Ancient Irish Poetry, 2nd Edition, London, 1913. Best, Bibliography of Irish Philology and of Printed Irish Literature, Dublin, 1913. Lof, La Métrique Galoise, Paris, 1902. Thurnason, Mitalische Vaslehren, Irische Text, 3. Bouy la Dublin, 1910. End of section 28. Recording by Linda Olson Fitak, Los Angeles. Section number 29 of The Glories of Ireland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Glories of Ireland, edited by Joseph Dunn and P. J. Lennox. Irish Heroic Sagas by Eleanor Hull. Ireland has the unique distinction of having preserved for mankind a full and vivid literary record of a period otherwise, so far as native memorials are concerned, clouded in obscurity. A few fragmentary suggestions derived from ancient stone monuments or from diggings in tumuli and graves are all that Gaul or Britain have to contribute to a knowledge of that important period just before and just after the beginning of our era, when the armies of Rome were overrunning Western Europe and were brought, for the first time, into direct contact with the Celtic peoples of the West. Almost all that we know of the early inhabitants of these countries comes to us from the pens of Roman writers and soldiers, Posidonius, Caesar, Diodorus, Tactus. We may give these observers credit for a desire to be fair to peoples they sometimes admired and often dreaded. But conquerors are not always the best judges of the races they are engaged in subduing, especially when they are ignorant of their language, unversed in their lore and customs, and unused to their ways. Valuable as are the reports of Roman authorities, we feel at every point the need of checking them by native records. But the native records of Gaul, and in large part also those of Britain and Wales, have been swept away. Caesar is probably right in saying that the Druids, who were the learned men of their race and day, committed nothing to writing. If they did, whatever they wrote has been irrevocably lost. But Ireland was exempt from the sweeping changes, brought about through long periods of Roman and Saxon occupation. No great upheaval from without disturbed the native political and social conditions up to the coming of the Norse and Danes, about the beginning of the ninth century. Agricola, standing on the western coast of Britain, looked across the dividing channel and reflected upon the beneficial connection that the conquest of Ireland would have formed between the most powerful parts of the Roman Empire. But fortunately for the literature of Ireland, if not for her history, he never came. The early incursions of the Scotty, or Irish, were eastward into England, Wales, and Gaul and there seemed to have been few return movements towards the West. Ireland pursued her path of native development undisturbed. It is to this circumstance that she owes the preservation of so much of her native literature. A great body of material, historical, religious, poetic, romantic, showing marks of having originated at a very early time, and a great variety and interest. At what period this literature first began to be written down we do not know. Erosius tells us that a traveler named Athicus spent a considerable time in Ireland early in the 5th century, examining their volumes, which tends to prove that there was writing in Ireland before St. Patrick. But the native bard must have made writing superfluous. The man who could, at a moment's notice, recite any one out of the 350 stories which might be called for, besides poetry, genealogies, and travel records, was worth many books. Only a few were expert enough to read his writings, but all could enjoy his tales. The earliest written records that we have now existing date from the 7th or 8th century, but undoubtedly there is preserved for us in these materials a picture of social conditions going back to the very beginning of our era, and Covell, with the stray stage of civilization, known as archaeology, as La Tena or Late Celtic, to help his memory the early Shanishi, or storyteller, grouped his romantic story store under different heads, such as tains, or cattle spoils, feasts, elopements, sieges, battles, destructions, tragical deaths, 
but it is easy for us now to group them in another way and to class together the series of tales referring to the duitha de dedanin or ancient deities those belonging to the red branch cycle of king kokobar and kuchilain those relating to finn and the legends of the kings the hundred or more tales belonging to the second group are especially valuable for social history on account of the detailed descriptions they give of customs dress weapons habits of life and ethical ideas to the historian folklorist and student of primitive civilizations they are documents of the highest importance it seems likely that the red branch cycle of tales including the epic tale of the tain or cattle spoil of Kulenge, which has gathered round itself a number of minor tales had some basis of historical fact and arose in the period of ulster's predominance to celebrate the deeds of a band of warlike champions who flourished in the north about the beginning of the christian era no one who has visited the raths of the Aman macha near ma where stood the traditional site of the ancient capital of ulster or has followed the well-defined and massive outworks of rath kelcher and the forts of the other heroes whose deeds the tales embody could doubt that they had their origin in great events that once happened there the topography of the tales is absolutely correct or again when we cross over into Kanat, the remains of rath cronin near the ancient palace of the amazonian queen medb testify to similar events she it was who in her pillow talk with her husband alia declared that she had married him only because in him did she find the strange bride gift which her imperious nature demanded a man without stinginess without jealousy without fear it was in her desire to surpass her husband in wealth that she sent the combined armies of the south and west into ulster to carry off a famous bull the brown bull of cooley the only match in ireland for one possessed by her spouse this raid forms the central subject of the tain Boculange. the motive of the tale and the kind of life described in it alike show the primitive conditions out of which it had rise it belongs to a time when land was plenty for the scattered inhabitants to dwell upon but stock to place upon it was scarce the possession of herds was necessary not only for food and the provisioning of troops but as a standard of wealth proof of position any means of exchange everything was estimated before the use of money by its value in keen or herds when med and ale compare their possessions to find out which of them is better than the other their herds of cattle swine and horses are driven in their ornaments and jewels their garments and vats and household appliances are displayed the pursuit of the cattle of neighboring tribes was the prime cause of the innumerable raids which made every man's life one of perpetual warfare much more so than the acquisition of land or the avenging of wrongs hence a motive that may seem to us insufficient and remote as the subject of a great epic arose out of the necessities of actual life cattle driving is the oldest of all occupations in ireland the conditions we find described in these tales show us an open country generally unenclosed by hedges or walls the chariots can drive straight across the province there are no towns and the stopping places are the large farmers dwellings open inns known as houses of hospitality fortified by surrounding raths or earthen walls the only private property and land in a time when the tribe land was common that we hear of at this period within these borders lay the pleasure grounds and gardens of the cattle sheds for the herds which the great landowners or chief loaned out to the smaller men in return for services rendered here were trained in the arts of industry and fine needlework the daughters of the chief men of the tribe and their foster sisters drawn from the humbler families around them the rivers as a rule formed the boundaries of the provinces and the fords were constantly guarded by champions who challenged every wayfarer to single combat if he could not show sufficient reason for crossing the borderland these combats were fought actually in the fort itself and all wars began in a long series of single hand-to-hand -hand combats between equal champions before the armies as a whole engaged each other to fight was every man's prime duty and the man who had slain the largest number of his fellows was acclaimed as the greatest hero it was the proud boast of the conal kernanch the victorious that seldom had a day passed in which he had not challenged a conotman and a few nights in which a conotman's head had not formed his pillow 
It shows the primitive savagery of the period that skulls of enemies were worn dangling from the belt and were stored up in one of the palaces of Iman Maka as trophies of valor. So warlike were the heroes that even during friendly feasts their weapons had to be hung up in a separate house, lest they should spring to arms in rivalry with their own fellows. Yet in spite of this rude barbarism of outward life, the warriors had formed for themselves a high and exacting code of honor, which may be regarded as the first steps toward what in later times and other countries became known as chivalry, save that there is in the acts of Irish heroes a simplicity and sincerity which puts them on a higher level than the obligatory courtesies of more artificial ages. Generosity between enemies was carried to an extraordinary pitch, twice over in fights with different foes. Connell Kiernack binds his right hand to his side in order that his enemy, who had lost one hand, may fight on equal terms with him. The two severest combats sustained by Cuculin, the youthful Ulster champion, in the long war of the Tain, are those with Locke the Great and Ferdinand, both first-rate warriors, who had been forced by the wiles of Meb into unwilling conflict against their young antagonist. In their youth they had been fellow pupils in the school of the Amazon Sikath, who had taught them both alike the arts of war. When Locke the Great, as a dying request, prays Kulikain to permit him to rise, so that he may fall on his face and not backwards toward the men of Aaron, lest hereafter it should be said that he fell in flight. Kulika replies, That will I will surely, for it is a warrior's boon thou cravest. And he steps back to allow the wounded man to reverse his position to the ford. The tale of Kulikan's combat with Ferdiad had become classic. Nothing more pathetic or more full of the true spirit of chivalry is to be found in any literature. Each warrior estimates nobly the prowess of the other. Each sorrowfully recalls the memory of his old friendships and expeditions made together. When Frigidid falls, his ancient comrade pours out over him a passionate lament. Each night, when the day's combat is over, they throw their arms round each other's neck and embrace. Their horses are put up in the same paddock, and their charioteurs sleep beside the same fire. Each night, Kulikane sends to his wounded friend a share of the herbs that are applied to his own wounds, while to Kulikane, Ferdiad sends a fair half of the pleasant, delicate food supplied to him by the man of Aaron. We may recall, too, Kulikane's act of compassion toward Queen Meb near the close of the Tain. Her army is flying in rout homeward across the Shannon, closely pursued by Kulikane. As he approaches the ford, he finds Queen Medeba lying prostrate on the bank. Unable any longer to guard the retreat of her army, she appeals to her enemy to aid her. And Kulaklane, with that lovable boyish delight in acts of supreme generosity, which is always ascribed to him, undertakes to shield the retreat of the disordered host from his own troops and to see them safely across the river, while Medb reposes peacefully in a field hard by. The spirit which actuates the heroes is well expressed by Kulaklane when his friends would restrain him from going forth to his last fight, knowing that in that battle he must fall. I had rather than the whole world's gold, and then the earth's riches that death had ere now befallen me. So would not this shame and testimony of reproach now stand recorded against me. For in every tongue this noble old saying is remembered. Fame outlives life. The Irish tales surpass those of the Arthurian cycle in simplicity, in humor, and in human interest. The characters are not mere types of fixed virtues and vices. They have each a strongly marked individuality, consistently adhered to through the multitude of different stories in which they play a part. This is especially the case with regard to the female characters. Emmer, Deirdre, Etan, Grain may be said to have introduced into European literature new types of womanhood, quite unlike in their sprightliness and humor, their passionate affection and heroic qualities, to anything found elsewhere. Stories about women play a large part in ancient Irish literature. Their elopements, their marriages, their griefs, and tragedies form the subject of a large number of tales. Among the list of tales that any bard might be called upon to recite, the courtships or wooings probably formed a favorite group. They are of great variety and beauty. The Irish, indeed, may be called the inventors of the love tale for modern Europe. 
the gravest effect of this literature a defect which is common to all early literature before coming under the chastening hand of the master is undoubtedly its tendency to extravagance though much dependent upon the individual writer some being stylus some not and all were prone to frequent and, and grotesque exaggerations the lack of restraint and self-criticism is everywhere apparent the old irish writer seems incapable of judging how to shape his material with a view to presenting it in its best form thus we have the feeling even with regard to the tain beau challenge that what has come down to us is rather the rough-shaped material of an epic than a completed design the single stories and the groups of stories that have been handled and rehandled at different times but only occasionally as in the story of deirdre the sorrowful tale of the sons of usnick or in the later versions of the wooing of emmer or the book of leinster version of the wooing of ferb do we feel that a competent artist has so formed his story the best possible value has been extracted from it yet in spite of their defects the old heroic sagas of ireland have in them a stimulating force and energy and an element of fine and healthy optimism which is strangely at variance with the popular conception of the melancholy of irish literature and which wherever they are known make them the fountainhead of a fresh creative inspiration this stimulating of the imagination is perhaps the best gift that a revived interest in the old native romance of ireland has to bestow references the originals of many of the tales of the kulachin cycle of romances will be found usually accompanied by english or german translations in the volumes of ursh Uresh, text review celtique sheetscrift fur celt phil iru irish text society volume two atlantis proceed of the r irish academy irish mss series and todd lecture series english translations of the tain de boulange lou and ubl versions miss winifred's faraday 1904 ll version with conflate readings but by joseph dunn 1914 of various stories e hole the kuklang saga in irish literature 1898 a h leahy heroic romances of ireland 1905 to 6 the courtship of ferb 1902 french translations in the arbois de jubainvis et poppy celtic on ireland german translations in thur mason sagan odin alien ireland 1901 free rendering by s o grady in the coming of the kulikine 1904 and in his history of ireland the heroic period 1878 for full bibliography see r i best bibliography of irish philology and printed literature 1913 and joseph dunn's tain beau pages 32 through 36 1914 end of section 29 recording by april 6090 california united states of america section number 30 of the glories of ireland this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Kavanagh, Antwerp. The Glories of Ireland, edited by Joseph Dunn and P. J. Lennox, section number 30. Irish Precursors of Dante, by Sidney Gunn, M.A. One of the supreme creations of the human mind is the Divine Comedy of Dante and undoubtedly one of its chief sources is the literature of ancient Ireland. Dante himself was a native of Florence, Italy, and lived from 1265 to 1321. Like many great men, he incurred the hatred of his countrymen, and he spent, as a result, the last twenty years of his life in exile with a price on his head. He had been falsely accused of theft and treachery, and his indignation at the wrong thus done him, and at the evil conduct of his contemporaries led him to write his poem, in which he visits hell, purgatory, and paradise, and learns how God punishes bad actions, and how he rewards those who do his will. To the writing of his poem Dante brought all the learning of his time, all its science, and an art that has never been surpassed, perhaps never equalled. Of course he did not know any Irish, but he knew Italian, 
and the then universal tongue of the learned, Latin, in both of which were tales of visits to the other world, and the greater part of these tales, as well as those most resembling Dante's work, in form and spirit, were Irish in origin. All peoples have traditions of persons visiting the realms of the dead. Homer tells of Odysseus going there, Virgil is the same of Aeneas, and the Oriental peoples, as well as the Germanic races, have similar tales. But no people have so many or such finished accounts of this sort as the ancient Irish. In pagan times in Ireland, one of the commonest adventures attributed to a hero was a visit to Tirna Mio, the land of the living, or Tirna Nog, the land of the young. And this supernatural world was reached in some cases by entering a fairy mound and going beneath the ground to it, and in others by sailing over the ocean. Of the literature of pagan Ireland, though much has come down to us, we have only a very small fraction of what once existed. And what we have has been transmitted and modified by persons of later times in different culture, who, both consciously and unconsciously, have changed it, so that it is very different from what it was in its original form. But the subject and the main outline still remain, and we have many accounts of both voyages and underground journeys to the other world. The oldest voyage is, perhaps, that of Maldown, which Tennyson has transmuted into English under the title The Voyage of Maldoon. This is a voyage undertaken for revenge, but vengeance, as Sir Walter Scott has pointed out in his preface to the two drovers, springs in a barbarous society from a passion for justice. And it is this instinct for justice that inspires the Irish hero to endure and to achieve what he does. Christianity has preserved this legend and added to it its own peculiar quality of mercy. And this illustrates one of the characteristics of Ireland's pagan literature. It is imperfectly Christian and can readily be made to express the Christian point of view. Another voyage of pagan Irish literature is the voyage of Bran. In this tale, Idealism is the inspiration that leads the hero into an unknown world. A woman appears who is invisible to all but Bran, and whose song of the beauteous supernatural land beyond the wave is heard by none but him, so that, after refusing to go with her for the first time she appears, at length he steps into her boat of glass and sails away to view the wonders and taste the joys of the other world. In these tales we have two main elements, one real and one ideal. The real element is the fact that the ancient Irish unquestionably made voyages and visited lands which the fervid Celtic imagination and the lapse of time transformed into the wonderful regions of legends. The stories are thus early geographies, and they show unmistakably a knowledge of Western Europe and of the Canary Islands, or some other tropical regions. Perhaps also some have gone so far as to claim they are reminiscent of voyages to America. The ideal element is no less important as indicating achievement, for it shows that the Irish poets of pagan times had not only realised, but had succeeded in making their national traditions embody the fact that love of justice and aspiration for knowledge are the foundations of all enduring human achievement and all perfect human joy. Christianity therefore found moral and spiritual ideas of a highly developed order in pagan Ireland and it did not hesitate to adopt whatever in the literature of the country illustrated its own teachings. And not only were these stories of visits to the other world full of suggestions as to ways of enforcing Christian doctrine, but the Irish church and men of Irish birth were the most active in spreading the faith in the early centuries of its conquest of Western Europe. For these reasons it is not strange that all the early Christian versions of the spirit world were of Irish origin. We find the earliest in the ecclesiastical history of the Venerable Bede, who died in 735. It is the story of how an Irishman of great sanctity, Fersius by name, was taken in spirit by three angels to a place from which he looked down and saw the four fires that are to consume the world, those of falsehood, avarice, discord, fraud and impiety. In this there is the germ of some very fundamental things in Dante's poem. And we know that Dante knew Bede, and had probably read his history, for he places him in paradise and mentions him elsewhere in his works. In Bede's work there is also another version, and though in this second case the man who visits the spirit world is not an Irishman, but a Saxon named Drithelm, yet the story came to Bede through an Irish monk named Hengils. So it too is connected with Ireland, and it also contains much that is developed further in the Divine Comedy. 
One of the most celebrated of the works belong to this class of so-called visionary writings is the Fis or Vision, which goes under the name of the famous Irish saint Adamnan, who was poetically entitled the High Scholar of the Western World. This particular vision, the Fis Adam Nine, is remarkable among other things for its literary quality, which is far superior to anything of the time, and for the fact that it represents the highest level of the school to which it belonged, and that it is the most important contribution made to the growth of the legend within the Christian Church prior to the advent of Dante. Another Irish vision of great popularity all over Europe in the Middle Ages is the Voyage of St. Brendan. This is known as the Irish Odyssey, and it is similar to the pagan tales of Maldun and Bran, except that instead of its hero being a dauntless warrior seeking vengeance or a noble youth seeking happiness, he is a Christian saint in quest of peace, and instead of the perils of the way being overcome by physical force or the favour of some capricious pagan deity, they are averted by the power of faith and virtue. The Voyage of St. Brendan, like its pagan predecessors, has a real and an ideal basis, and in both respects it shows an advancement over its prototypes. It contains some very poetic touches and is credited with being the source of some of the most effective features of Dante's poem. Its great popularity is shown by the fact that Caxton, the first English printer, published a translation of it in 1483, so that it was among the first books printed in English, and for that reason must have been one of the best-known works of the time. Dante undoubtedly knew it, for he was a great scholar in the learning of his day, and especially in ecclesiastical history and the biography of saints. Another vision of Irish origin that Dante and other writers have borrowed from is that of an Irish soldier named Tundale. He is said to have been a very wicked and proud man who refused to a friend who owed him for three horses an extension of time in which to pay for them. For this he was struck down by an invisible hand so that he remained apparently dead from Wednesday till Saturday when he revived and told a story of a visit to a world of the dead that has many features later embodied in the Divine Comedy. Tundale's vision is said to have taken place in 1149. Dante probably wrote his poem between 1314 and 1321. The Irish also produced another legend of this sort that was enormously and universally popular and became the chief authority on the nature of heaven and hell in the story of St. Patrick's Purgatory. St. Patrick was said to have been granted a view of heaven and hell and a certain island in Loch Derg and Donegal was reputed to be the spot in which he had begun his journey. And there it was said, those who desired to purge themselves of their sins could enter, as he had entered, and come back to the world again, provided their faith was strong enough. This legend was probably known in Ireland from a very early time, but it had spread all over Western Europe by the 12th century. Henry of Saltry, a Benedictine monk of the Abbey of that name in England, wrote an account in Latin of the descent of an Irish soldier named Owen into St. Patrick's Purgatory in 1153, and this story soon became the subject of poetic treatment all over Europe. We have several French versions, one by the celebrated French poetess Marie de France, who lived about 1200, and there are others in all the languages of Europe, besides evidence of its wide circulation in the original Latin. Its importance is shown by the fact that it is mentioned by Matthew Paris, the chief English historian of the 13th century, and also by Frossard, the well-known French analyst of the 14th century, while Calderon, the great Spanish dramatist, has written a play based on the legend. Dante undoubtedly knew of Marie de France's version, as well as the original of Henry de Saltre, and probably others besides. From what has been said, it will be seen that Dante's masterpiece is largely based on literature of Irish origin, but there are other superlative exhibitions of human genius of which the same is true. One of these is the story of Tristan and Isolde. Tristan is the paragon of all knightly accomplishments, the most versatile figure in the entire literature of chivalry, while Isolde is an Irish princess. By a trick of fate, these two drink a love potion inadvertently and become irresistibly enamoured of each other, although Isolde is betrothed to King Mark of Cornwall, and Tristan is his nephew and ambassador. The story that follows is infinitely varied, intensely dramatic, delicately beautiful, and tenderly pathetic. It has been treated by several poets of great genius, among them Gottfried of Strasbourg, the greatest German poet of his time, and Richard Wagner, but all the beauty and power in the works of these men existed in the original Celtic form of the tale, and the later writers have only discovered it and brought it to light. The same thing is true of the Arthurian legends, and the story of the Holy Grail. Dante knew of King Arthur's fame, and mentions him in the Inferno. 
To Dante, he was a Christian hero, and the historical Arthur may have been a Christian, but much in the story goes back to the pagan Celtic religion. We can find in Irish literature many references that indicate a belief in a self-sustaining, miraculous object similar to the Holy Grail. And the fact that this object was developed into a symbol of some of the deepest and most beautiful Christian truths show the high character of the civilization and literature of ancient Ireland. References Wright, St. Patrick's Purgatory, London, 1844 Crap, The Legend of St. Patrick's Purgatory, Baltimore, 1900 Becker, Medieval Visions of Heaven and Hell, Baltimore, 1899 Shackford, Legends and Satires, Boston, 1913 Mayer and Nutt, The Voyage of Bran, edited and translated by K. Meyer with an essay on the Irish version of The Happy Other World and the Celtic Doctrine of Rebirth by A. Nutt, two volumes, London, 1895. Boswell, an Irish precursor of Dante, London, 1908. End of section 30. Section 31 of The Glories of Ireland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Glories of Ireland, edited by Joseph Dunn and P. J. Lennox. Irish Influence on English Literature by E. C. Quiggin, M. A. Among the literary peoples of the West of Europe, the Irish, in late medieval and early modern times, were singularly little affected by the frequent innovations in taste and theme which influenced Romance and Teutonic nations alike. To such an extent is this true that one is often inclined to think that far-off Iceland was to a greater degree in the general European current than the much more accessible Erin. During the age of chivalry, conditions in Ireland were not calculated to promote the growth of epic and lyric poetry after the continental manner. Some considerable time elapsed before the Norman barons became fully hibernicized, previous to which their interest may be assumed to have turned to the compositions of the Trouvères. In the early Norman period, the poets of Ireland might well have begun to imitate romance models, but strange to say, they did not, and for this various reasons might be assigned. The flowing verses of the Anglo-Norman were impossible for men who delighted in the trammels of the native prosody, and in the heyday of French influence, the patrons of letters in Ireland probably insisted on hearing the foreign compositions in their original dress as these nobles were doubtless sufficiently versed in Norman French to be able to appreciate them. But a still more potent factor was the conservatism of the hereditary Irish poet families. A close corporation, they appear to have resented every innovation, and were content to continue the tradition of their ancestors. The direct consequence of this tenacious clinging to the fashions of bygone days rendered it impossible, nay, almost inconceivable, that the literary men of Ireland should have exerted any profound or immediate influence upon England or Western Europe. Yet nowadays few serious scholars will be prepared to deny that the island contributed in considerable measure to the common literary stock of the Middle Ages. We might expect to find that direct influence, as a general rule, can be most easily traced in the case of religious themes. Here, in the literature of vision, so popular in Ireland, a chord was struck which continued to vibrate powerfully until the time of the Reformation. In this branch the riotous fancy of the Celtic monk caught the medieval imagination from an early period. Bede has preserved for us the story of Fursey, an Irish hermit who died in France, A.D. 650. The greatest Irish composition of this class, with which we were acquainted, the vision of Adamnan, does not appear to have been known outside the island, but a later work of a similar nature met with striking success. This was the vision of Tundale, to Nudgal, written in Latin by an Irishman named Marcus at Regensburg, about the middle of the twelfth century. It seems probable that this work was known to Dante, and in addition to the numerous continental versions there is a rendering of the story into Middle English verse. Closely allied to the visions are the Imrama, or Voyages, Latin Navigationis. The earliest romances of this class are secular, e.g. Imram Meldwin, which provided Tennyson with the framework of his well-known poem. However, the notorious love of adventure on the part of the Irish monks inevitably led to the composition of religious romances of a similar kind. 
The most famous story of this description, The Voyage of St. Brendan, found its way into every Christian country in Europe, and consequently figures in the South English Legendary, a collection of versified lives of saints made in the neighborhood of Gloucester towards the end of the thirteenth century. The episode of St. Brendan and the Whale, moreover, was probably the ultimate source of one of Milton's best-known similes in his description of Satan. Equally popular was the visit of Sir Owain to the Purgatory of St. Patrick, which is also included in the same Middle English Legendary. Ireland further contributed, in some measure, to the common stock of medieval stories which were used as illustrations by the preachers, and in works of an edifying character. When we turn to purely secular themes, we find ourselves on much less certain ground. Though the discussion as to the origins of the romance of Uther's son, Arthur, continues with unabated vigor, many scholars have come to think that the Celtic background of these stories contains much that is derived from Hibernian sources. Some writers in the past have argued in favor of an independent survival of common Celtic features in Wales and Ireland, but now the tendency is to regard all such coincidences as borrowings on the part of Kimrick craftsmen. At the beginning of the twelfth century a new impulse seems to have been imparted to native minstrelsy in Wales, under the patronage of Griffith ap Cynan, Prince of Gwynedd, who had spent many years in exile at the court of Dublin. Some of the Welsh rhapsodists apparently served a kind of apprenticeship with their Irish brethren, and many things Irish were assimilated at this time, which, through this channel, were shortly to find their way into Anglo-French. Thus it may now be regarded as certain that the name of the fair sword Excalibur, by Geoffrey called Caliburnus, Welsh, Calitfilch, is taken from Caladbolg, the far-famed broadsword of Fergus MacRoig. It does not appear that the whole framework of the Irish sagas was taken over, but, as Windish points out, episodes were borrowed, as well as tricks of imagery. So, to mention but one, the central incident of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight is doubtless taken from the similar adventure of Cuchulain in Bricria's Feast. The share assigned to Irish influence in the Matière de Bretagne is likely to grow considerably with the progress of research. The fairy lore of Great Britain undoubtedly owes much to Celtic fantasy. Of this Chaucer, at any rate, has little doubt, as he writes, In the old days of the King Arthur, of which that Britons speak in great honour, all was this land fulfilled of fairy, the elf queen with her jolly company danced full oft in many a green maid. And here again there is a reasonable probability that certain features were borrowed from the wealth of story current in the neighbouring isle. Otherwise it is difficult to understand why the Queen of Fairy should bear an Irish name, Mab, from Irish Maeve. And curiously enough, the form of the name Rathaf suggests that it was borrowed through a written medium and not by oral tradition. On the other hand, it is incorrect to derive Puck from Irish Puka, as the latter is undoubtedly borrowed from some form of Teutonic speech. So all embracing a mind as that of the greatest English dramatist could not fail to be interested in the gossip that must have been current in London at the time of the wars in Ulster. References to kerns and gallow glasses are fairly frequent. He had evidently heard of the marvellous powers with which the Irish bards were credited, for, in As You Like It, Rosalind exclaims, I was never so berhymed since Pythagoras's time, that I was an Irish rat, which I can hardly remember. Similarly, in King Richard III, mention is made of the prophetic utterance of an Irish bard, a trait which does not appear in the poet's source. Any statements as to Irish influence in Shakespeare that go beyond this belong to the realm of conjecture. Professor Kittredge has attempted to show that in Sir Orfeo, upon which the poet drew for portions of the plot of A Midsummer Night's Dream, the Irish story of Etain and Meter was fused with the medieval form of the classical tale of Orpheus and Eurydice. Direct influence is entirely wanting, and it is difficult to see how it could have been done otherwise. Even in the case of the Elizabethan poet, who spent many years in the south of Ireland, there is no trace of Hibernian lore or legend. Spencer, indeed, tells us himself that he had caused some of the native poetry to be translated to him, and had found that it savoured of sweet wit and good invention. But Ireland plays an infinitesimal part in the Fairy Queen. The scenery round Kilcolman Castle forms the background of much of the incident in Book V. Marble far from Ireland brought is mentioned in a simile in the second book, where we also read, 
as when a swarm of gnats at eventide out of the fens of Allen do arise. But Ireland supplied no further inspiration. The various plantations of the seventeenth century produced an Anglo-Irish stock which soon asserted itself in literature. As a typical example, we may take the author of The Vicar of Wakefield. At his first school at Lissoy, Oliver Goldsmith came under Thomas Byrne, a regular shanachy, possessed of all the traditional lore, with a remarkable gift for versifying. It was under this man that the boy made his first attempts at verse, and his memory is celebrated in the deserted village. There, in his noisy mansion, skilled to rule, the village master taught his little school. A man severe he was, and stern to view. Unfortunately, Goldsmith was removed to Elfin at the age of nine, and although he retained an affection for Irish music all his life, his intimate connection with Irish Ireland apparently ceased at this point. Sweet Auburn, loveliest village of the plain, is doubtless full of reminiscences of the poet's early years in Westmeath, but the sentiments, the rhythm, and the language are entirely cast in an English mould. We may mention in passing that it has been suggested that Swift derived the idea of the kingdom of Lilliput from the Irish story of the adventures of Fergus MacLeod among the leprechauns. All that can be said is that this derivation is not impossible, though the fact that the tale is preserved only in a single manuscript rather points to the conclusion that the story did not enjoy great popularity in the seventeenth and eighteenth centuries. We have seen that Goldsmith was removed from an Irish atmosphere at a tender age, and this is not the only instance of the frowning of fortune upon the native literature. When the fame of the ancient bards of the Gael was noised from end to end of Europe, it was through the medium of Macpherson's forgeries. Fingal caught the fleeting fancy of the moment in a manner never achieved by the true oceanic lays of Ireland. The Relics of Irish Poetry, published by Miss Brooke, by subscription in Dublin in 1789, to vindicate the antiquity of the literature of Erin, never went into a second edition. And although some of the pieces contained in that volume have been reprinted in such undertakings of a learned character as the volumes of the Dublin Oceanic Society, J. F. Campbell's Lorna Hayne and Cameron's Reliquae Celticae, they have aroused little interest among those ignorant of the Irish tongue. During the nineteenth century the number of poets who drew upon Ireland's past for their themes increased considerably. The most popular of all is unquestionably the author of the Irish Melodies. But here again, the poet owes little or nothing to vernacular poetry. The mould is English. The sentiments are those of the poet's age. Moore's acquaintance with the native language can have been but of the slightest. And in the case of Mangan, we are told that he had to rely upon literal versions of Irish pieces furnished him by O'Donovan or O'Curry. Of the numerous attempts to reproduce the over-elaboration of rhyme to which Irish verse has ever been prone, Father Prout's Bells of Shandon is perhaps the only one that is at all widely known. When the legendary lore of Iceland became accessible to men of letters, owing to the labors of O'Curry, O'Donovan, and Hennessy, and the publication of various ancient texts by the Irish Archaeological Society, it was to be expected that an attempt would be made by some poet of Erin to do for his native land what the Wizard of the North had accomplished for Scotland. The task was undertaken by Sir Samuel Ferguson, who met with conspicuous success. His most ambitious effort, Conger, deals in epic fashion with the story of the Battle of Moira. Others, in similar strain, treat the story of Conair Mor and Deirdre, whilst others, such as the Tain Quest, are more in the nature of ballads. Ferguson did more to introduce the English reading public to Irish story than would have been accomplished by any number of bald translations. His diction is little affected by the originals, and he sometimes treats his materials with great freedom, but his achievement was a notable one, and he has not infrequently been acclaimed as the national poet. It is perhaps invidious to single out any living author for special mention, but this brief survey cannot close without noticing the dramatic poems of W. B. Yeats, the latest poet who attempts to present the old stories in an English dress. His plays, On Byla's Strand, Deirdre, and others, have become familiar to English audiences through the excellent acting of the members of the Abbey Theatre Company. The original texts are now much better known than they were in Ferguson's day, and Mr. Yeats, consequently, cannot permit himself the same liberties. 
Similarly, it is only during the last twenty-five years that the language of Irish poetry has been carefully studied, and Mr. Yeats has this advantage over his predecessors, that on occasion, e.g. in certain passages in the King's Threshold, he is able to introduce with great effect reminiscences of the characteristic epithets and imagery which formed so large a part of the stock and trade of the medieval bard. References Friedel and Meyer, La Vision de Tondal, Paris, 1907 Boswell, An Irish Precursor of Dante, London, 1908 Cambridge History of English Literature, Volume 1, Chapters 12 and 16 Windisch, Das Keltische Britannien, Leipzig, 1912 More especially, Chapter 37 Dictionary of National Biography, Gwynn Thomas More, English Men of Letters Series, London, 1905 End of section 31section 32 of the glories of ireland this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by linda olson fitak los angeles the glories of ireland edited by joseph dunn and p j lennox section 32 Irish Folklore by Alfred Percival Graves Among savage peoples there is at first no distinction of a definite kind between good and bad spirits, and when a distinction has been reached, a great advance in a spiritual direction has been made. For the key to the religion of savages is fear, and until such terror has been counteracted by belief in beneficent powers, Civilization will not follow, but the elimination of the fear of the unseen is a slow process. Indeed, it will exist side by side with the belief in Christianity itself, after a modification through various stages of better pagan belief. Ireland still presents, in its more out-of-the-way districts, evidence of that strong persistence in the belief in maleficent or malicious influences of the pre-Christian powers of the air, which it seems difficult to eradicate from the Celtic imagination. In the celebrated poem entitled The Breastplate of St. Patrick, there is much the same attitude on the part of Patrick towards the Druids and their powers of concealing and changing, of paralyzing and cursing, as was shown by Moses towards the magicians of Egypt, Indeed, in Patrick's time, a belief in the world of fairies existed even in the king's household, for when the two daughters of King Leary of Ireland, Ethnia the Fair and Fidelma the Ruddy, came early one morning to the well of Clebach to wash, they found there a synod of holy bishops with Patrick. And they knew not whence they came, or in what form, or from what people, or from what country. But they supposed them to be Dwin Sheikh, or gods of the earth, or a phantasm. Colgan explains the term Dwin Sheikh thus. Fantastical spirits, he writes, are by the Irish called men of the she, because they are seen, as it were, to come out of the beautiful hills to infest men, and hence the vulgar belief that they reside in certain subterranean habitations, and sometimes the hills themselves are called by the Irish Sheed or Shida. No doubt, when the princesses spoke of the gods of the earth, reference was made to such pagan deities as Baal, Dagda the Great, or the Good God, Aina the Moon, goddess of the water and of wisdom, Mananan Maclear, the Irish Neptune, Chrome, the Irish Ceres, and even the Benevolent, whose relations to the Irish Oirfi resembled those of Apollo towards Orpheus, and to the allegiance they owed to the elements, the wind and the stars. But besides these pagan divinities and powers, and quite apart from them, the early Irish believed in two classes of fairies. In the first place, 
a hierarchy of fairy beings well and ill disposed not differing in appearance to any degree and at any rate from human beings good spirits and demons rarely visible during the daytime and in the second place there was the magic race of the didanan who after conquest by the benesians transformed themselves into fairies and in that guise continued to inhabit the underworld of the irish hills and to issue thence in support of irish heroes or to give their aid against other fairy adversaries there is another theory to account for the fairy race it is that they are angels who revolted with satan and were excluded from heaven for their unworthiness but were not found evil enough for hell and therefore were allowed to occupy that intermediate space which has been called the other world it is still a moot point with the irish peasantry as it was with the irish saints of old whether after being compelled to dwell without death among rocks and hills lakes and seas bushes and forest till the day of judgment the fairies then have the chance of salvation indeed the fairies are themselves believed to have great doubts of a future existence though like many men entertaining undefined hopes of happiness and hence the enmity which some of them have for mankind who they acknowledge will live eternally thus their actions are balanced between generosity and vindictiveness towards the human race mr w y evans wentz a m of leland stanford university california and jesus college oxford has received an honorary degree from the latter university for his thesis the fairy faith in celtic countries its psychical origin and nature a most laborious as well as ingenious work whose object is to prove that the origin of the fairy faith is psychical and that fairyland being thought of as an invisible world within which the visible world is immersed as an island in an unexplored ocean actually exists and that it is peopled by more species of living beings than this world because incomparably more vast and varied in its possibilities this may be added as a fourth theory to account for the existence of fairies and it may be further stated here that the irish popular belief in ghosts attributes to some of their departed spirits much of the same violence and malice with which fairies are credited mr jeremiah curtin gives striking instances of this kind in his book the folklore of west kerry it became necessary therefore for the gales who believed in the preternatural powers of the fairies for good and ill to propitiate them as far as possible on may eve accordingly cattle were driven into wraths and bled there some of the blood being tasted the rest poured out in sacrifice men and women were also bled on these occasions the seekers for buried treasure over which fairies were supposed to have influence immolated a black cock or a black cat to propitiate them again a cow suffering from sickness believed to be due to fairy malice was bled and then devoted to st martin if it recovered it was never sold or killed the first new milk of a cow was poured out on a ground to propitiate the fairies and especially on the ground within a fairy wrath the first drop of any drink is also thrown out by old irish people if a child spills milk the mother says that's for the fairies leave it to them and welcome slops should never be thrown out of doors without the warning take care of water lest fairies should be passing invisibly and get soiled by the discharge eddies of dust upon the road are supposed to be caused by the fairies and tufts of grass sticks and pebbles are thrown into the centre of the eddy to propitiate the unseen beings some fairies of life size who live within the green hills or under the raths are supposed to carry off healthy babes to be made fairy children their abstractors leaving weak changelings in their place similarly nursing mothers are sometimes supposed to be carried off to give the breast to fairy babes 
and handsome young men are spirited away to become bridegrooms to fairy brides again folk suffering from falling sickness are supposed to be in that condition owing to the fatigue caused by nocturnal rides through the air with the fairies whose steeds are bewitched rushes blades of grass straws fern roots and cabbage stalks the latter to be serviceable for the purpose should be cut into the rude shapes of horses before the metamorphosis can take place iron of every kind keeps away malignant fairies thus a horseshoe nailed to the bottom of the churn prevents butter from being bewitched here is a form of charm against the fairies who have bewitched the butter every window should be barred a great turf fire should be lit upon which nine irons should be placed the bystanders chanting twice over an irish come butter come peter stands at the gate waiting for a buttered cake as the irons become heated the witch will try to break in asking the people to take the irons which are burning her off the fire on their refusing she will go and bring back the butter to the churn the irons may then be removed from the fire and all will go well if a neighbour or stranger should enter a cottage during the churning he should put his hand to the dash or the butter will not come a small piece of iron should be sewed into an infant's clothes and kept there until the child is baptized and salt should be sprinkled over his cradle to preserve the babe from abduction the fairies are supposed to have been conquered by an iron weaponed race and hence their dread of the metal to recover a spellbound friend stand on all hallows eve at crossroads or at a spot pointed out by a wise woman or a fairy doctor when you have rubbed fairy ointment on your eyelids the fairies will become visible as the host sweeps by with its captive whom the gazer will then be able to recognize a sudden gust announces their approach stooping down you will then throw dust or milk at the procession whose members are then obliged to surrender your spellbound friend if a man leaves home after his wife's confinement some of his clothes should be spread over the mother and infant or the fairies may carry them off it is good for a woman but bad for a man to dream of fairies it betokens marriage for a girl misfortune for a man who should not undertake serious business for some time after such dreaming fairy changelings may be recognized by tricky habits constant crying and other unusual characteristics it was customary to recover the true child in the following way the changeling was placed upon an iron shovel over the fire when it would go shrieking up the chimney and the bona fide human child would be restored it was believed that fairy changelings often produced a set of small bagpipes from under the clothes and played dance music upon them till the inmates of the cottage dropped with exhaustion from the effects of the step dancing they were compelled to engage in on Samhain eve the night before the first of november or as it is now called all hallows night or halloween all the fairy hills or shees are thrown wide open and the fairy host issues forth as mortals who are bold enough to venture near may see naturally therefore people keep indoors so as not to encounter the spectral host the superstition that the fairies are abroad on Samhain night still exists in ireland and scotland and there is a further belief no doubt derived from it that the graves are open on that night and that the spirits of the dead are abroad salt as already suggested is regarded to be so lucky that if a child falls he should always be given three pinches of salt and if a neighbour calls to borrow salt it should not be refused even though it be the last grain in the house an infant born with teeth should have them drawn by the nearest smith and the first teeth when shed should be thrown into the fire lest the fairies should get hold of what had been a part of you those who hear fairy music are supposed to be haunted by the melody 
and many are believed to go mad or commit suicide in consequence. The fairies are thought to engage in warfare with one another, and in the year 1800 a specially sanguinary battle was believed to have been fought between two clans of the fairies in County Kilkenny. In the morning, the hawthorns among the fences were found crushed to pieces and drenched with blood. In popular belief, fairies often go hunting, and faint sounds of fairy horns, the baying of fairy hounds, and the crackling of fairy whips are supposed to be heard on these occasions, while the flight of the hunters is said to resemble in sound the humming of bees. Besides the life-sized fairies, who are reputed to have these direct dealings with human beings, there are diminutive preternatural beings who are also supposed to come into close touch with men. Among these is the Luchriman, Le Hrogan, or Brog Maker, otherwise known as Leprechaun. He is always found mending or making a shoe, and, if grasped firmly, and kept constantly in view, will disclose hidden treasure to you, or render up his sparona shillinge, or purse of the inexhaustible shilling. He can only be bound by a plough chain or woollen thread. He is the symbol of industry which, if steadily faced, leads to fortune, but if lost sight of, is followed by its forfeiture. Love in idleness is personified by another pygmy, the Jenkanach, love-talker. He does not appear like the leprechaun, with a purse in one of his pockets, but with his hands in both of them, and a dudeen, short pipe, in his mouth, as he lazily strolls through lonely valleys making love to the foolish country lasses and gostering with the idle boys. To meet him meant bad luck and whoever was ruined by ill-judged love was said to have been with the Jean Connach. Another evil sprite was the clubber a jolly, red-faced, drunken little fellow, always found astride of a wine-butt, singing and drinking from a full tankard in a hard drinker's cellar, and bound by his appearance to bring its owner to a speedy ruin. Then there were the Lannan sheikhs, or native muses, to be found in every place of note to inspire the local bard, and the banshees, banshees, fairy women, attached to each of the old Irish families and giving warning of the death of one of its members with piteous lamentations. Black Joanna of the Boyne, Shubanduch na Boyne, appeared on Halloween in the shape of a great black fowl, bringing luck to the home whose Baneti, woman of the house, kept the dwelling constantly clean and neat. The Puka, who appeared in the shape of a horse, and whom Shakespeare is by many believed to have adapted as Puck, was a goblin who combined horseplay with viciousness, but also at times helped with the housework. The Dulagan was a churchyard demon, whose head was of a movable kind, Dr. Joyce writes. You generally meet him with his head in his pocket, under his arm, or absent altogether. Or if you have the fortune to light upon a number of the Dulagans, you may see them amusing themselves by flinging their heads at one another, or kicking them for footballs. An even more terrible churchyard demon is the fascinating phantom that waylays the widower at his wife's very tomb, and poisons him by her kiss when he has yielded to her blandishments. Of monsters the Irish had and still believe in, the piast, Latin bestia, huge dragon or serpent confined to lakes by St. Patrick till the Day of Judgment, but still occasionally seen in their waters. In old Finian times, namely the days of Finn and his companion knights, the Piasts, however, roamed the country, devouring men and cattle in large numbers, and some of the early heroes are recorded to have been swallowed alive by them 
and then to have hewed their way out of their entrails. Marrows, or mermaids, are also still believed in, and many folk tales still exist describing their intermarriage with mortals. According to Nicholas O'Kearney, it is the general opinion of many old persons versed in native traditional lore that before the introduction of Christianity, all animals possessed the faculties of human reason and speech, and old storytellers will gravely inform you that every beast could speak before the arrival of St. Patrick, but that the saint, having expelled the demons from the land by the sound of his bell, all the animals that, before that time, had possessed the power of foretelling future events, such as the black steed of Bianachlabra, the royal cat of Clomachrichcat, Cloch, and others became mute, and many of them fled to Egypt and other foreign countries. Cats are said to have been appointed to guard hidden treasures, and there are few who have not heard old Irish people tell about strange meetings of cats and violent battles fought by them in the neighborhood. It was believed, adds O'Kearney, that an evil spirit in the shape of a cat assumed command over these animals in various districts, and that when these wicked beings pleased, they could compel all the cats belonging to their divisions to attack those of some other district. The same was said of rats and rat expellers when commanding a colony of those troublesome and destructive animals to emigrate to some other place, used to address their billet to the infernal rat supposed to hold command over the rest. In a curious pamphlet on the power of bardic compositions to charm and expel rats, lately published, Mr. Eugene O'Curry states that a degraded priest who was descended from an ancient family of hereditary bards was enabled to expel a colony of rats by the force of satire. Hence, of course, Shakespeare's reference to rhyming Irish rats to death. It will thus be seen that Irish fairy lore well deserves to have been called by Mr. Alfred Nutt, one of the leaning authorities on the subject, as fair and bounteous a harvest of myth and romance as ever flourished among any race. References Alex Carmichael Carmina Gadelica David Comin The Boyish Exploits of Finn The Periodical Folklore Lady Gregory Cuchulain of Muirthemna Gods and Fighting Men Miss Eleanor Hull the Cuchulain Saga in Irish Literature, Douglas Hyde, Beside the Fire, a collection of Gaelic Irish folk stories, Libar Shelecha, Folk Stories in Irish, Irish Penny Journal, Patrick Kennedy, The Fireside Stories of Ireland, Legendary Fictions of the Irish Celt, Standish Hayes O'Grady, Silva Gedelica, Wood Martin, Traces of the Elder Faiths in Ireland, Pagan Ireland, W. Y. Wentz, The Fairy Faith in Celtic Countries, Lady Wilde, Charms, Incantations, etc., Celtic Articles in Hastings Dictionary of Religion and Ethics. End of section 32. Section number 33 of The Glories of Ireland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Glories of Ireland, edited by Joseph Dunn and P.J. Lennox. Section number 33. Irish Wit and Humor by Charles L. Graves. No record of the Glories of Ireland would be complete without an effort, however inadequate, to analyze and illustrate her wit and humor often misunderstood misrepresented and misinterpreted they are nevertheless universally admitted to be racial traits and for an excellent reason other nations exhibit these qualities in their literature and ireland herself is rich in writers who have furnished food for mirth but her special preeminence resides in the possession of what to adapt a famous phrase may be called in anima naturaliter jocosa 
Irish wit and Irish humor are a national inheritance. They are inherent in the race as a whole, independent of education or culture or comfort. The best Irish sayings are the sayings of the people. The greatest Irish humorists are the nameless multitude who have never written books or found a place in national dictionaries of biography. None but an Irishman could have coined that supreme expression of contempt. I wouldn't be seen dead with him at a pig fair or rebuked a young barrister because he did not squander his carcass, for example, gesticulate enough. But we cannot trace the paternity of these sayings any more than we can that of the lightning retort of the man to whom one of the quality had given a glass of whiskey. That's made another man of you, Patsy, remarked the donor. Deed it has, sore, Patsy flashed back. And that other man would be glad of another glass. It is enough for our purpose to note that such sayings are typically Irish and that their peculiar felicity consists in their combining both wit and humor. To what element is the Irish nature are we to attribute this joyous and illuminating gift? No one who is not a Gaelic scholar can venture to dogmatize on this thorny subject. But setting philology and politics aside, it is hard to avoid the conclusion that Ireland has gained rather than lost in this respect, by the clash of races and languages. Gaiety, we are told, is not the predominating characteristic of the Celtic temperament, nor is it reflected in the prose and verse of the old ancient days that have come down to us. Glamour and magic and passion abound in the lays and legends of the ancient Gael, but there is more melancholy than mirth in these tales of long ago. Indeed, it is interesting to note in connection with this subject that the younger school of Irish writers associated with what is called the Celtic Renaissance have, with very few exceptions, sedulously eschewed anything approaching to jocosity, preferring the paths of crepuscular mysticism or somber realism, and openly avowing their distaste for what they consider to be the denationalized sentiment of Moore, Lovar, and Lover. To say this is not to disparage the genius of Yeats and Singh. It is merely a statement of fact and an illustration of the eternal dualism of the Irish temperament, which Moore himself realized when he wrote of Aaron the tear and the smile in thine eye. A reaction against the Donnybrook tradition was inevitable, and to great extent wholesome, since the stage Irishman of the transpotine drama or the music halls was for most part a gross and unlovely caricature. But, like all reactions, it has tended to be obscure the real merits and services of those who showed the other side of the medal. Lever did not exaggerate more than Dickens, and his portraits of Galway fox hunters and duelists, of soldiers of fortune, and of Dublin undergraduates were largely based on fact. At his best was a most exhilarating companion, and his pictures of Irish life, if partial, were not misleading. He held no brief for the landlords, and in his later novels showed a keen sense of their shortcomings. The plain fact is that, in considering the literary glories of Ireland, we cannot possibly overlook the work of those Irishmen who were affected by English influences or wrote for an English audience. Anglo-Irish humorous literature was a comparatively late product, but its efflorescence was rapid and triumphant. The first great name is that of Goldsmith and, though deeply influenced in technique and choice of subjects by his association with English men of letters and by his residence in England, in spirit he remained Irish to the end, generous, impulsive, and improvident in his life, genial, gay, and tender-hearted in his works. The vicar of Wakefield was Dr. Primrose, but he might just as well have been called Dr. Shamrock. No surer proof of the preeminence of Irish wit and humor can be found than in the fact that, Shakespeare alone excepted, no writers of comedy have held the boards longer or more triumphantly than Goldsmith and his brother Irishman Sheridan. She stoops to conquer. The rivals, the school for scandal, and the critic represent the sunny side of the Irish genius to perfection. They illustrate in the most convincing way possible how the debt of the world to Ireland has been increased by the fate which ordained that her choicest spirits should express themselves in a language of wider appeal than the ancient speech of Aaron. On the other hand, English literature and the English tongue 
have gained greatly from the influence exerted by writers familiar from their childhood with turns of speech and modes of expression which even when they are not translations from the gaelic are characteristic of the hibernian temper the late dr p w joyce in his admirable treatise on english as spoken in ireland has illustrated not only the essentially bilingual character of the anglo-irish dialect but the modes of thought which it enshrines there is no better known form of irish humour than that commonly called the irish bowl which is too often set down to lax thinking and faulty logic but it is the rarest thing to encounter a genuine irish bowl which is not picturesque and at the same time highly suggestive take for example the saying of an old carry doctor who when conversing with a friend on the high rate of mortality observed bedad there's people dying who never died before here a truly illuminating result was attained by the simple device of using the indicative for the conditional mood as in juvenal's famous comment on cicero's second philippe antoni gladios poti contemner sisic omnia dixent the irish bull is a heroic and sometimes successful attempt to sit upon two stools at once or as an irishman put it englishmen often make bulls but the irish bull is always pregnant though no names of such outstanding distinction as those of goldsmith and sheridan occur in the early decades of the nineteenth century the spirit of irish comedy was kept vigorously alive by maria edgeworth william magnan francis mahoney father prout and william carleton sir walter scott's splendid tribute to the genius of maria edgeworth is regarded by some critics as extravagant but it is largely confirmed in a most unexpected quarter turgeniev the great russian novelist proclaimed himself her disciple and has left it on record that but for her example he might never have attempted to give literary form to his impressions of the classes in russia corresponding to the poor irish and the squireens and the squires of county langford magin and mahoney were both scholars the latter happily called himself an irish potato seasoned with attic salt wrote largely for english periodicals and spent most of their lives out of ireland in the writings of all three of an element of the grotesque is observable tempered however in the case of mahoney with the vein of tender pathos which emerges in his delightful bells of shandon mcgean was a wit mahoney was the hedge schoolmaster in excelsis and carleton was the first realist in irish peasant fiction but all alike drew their best inspiration from essentially irish themes the pendulum has swung back slowly but steadily since the days when irish men of letters found it necessary to accommodate their genius to purely english literary standards even lever though he wrote for the english public wrote mainly about ireland so too with his contemporary la fanu whose reputation rests on a double basis he made some wonderful excursions into the realm of the bizarre the uncanny and the gruesome but in the collection known as the purcell papers we found three short stories which for exuberant drollery and diversion have never been excelled that the same man could have written uncle silas and the quarjander is yet another proof of the strange dualism of irish character the record of the last fifty years shows an uninterrupted progress in the invasion of the english bell's letters by irish writers outside literature perhaps the most famous sayer of good things of our times was a simple irish parish priest the late father healy of his humorous sayings the number is legion his wit may be illustrated by a less familiar example his comment on a very tall young lady named lynch nature gave her an inch and she took an l in the house of commons today there is no greater master of irony and sardonic humor than his namesake mr tim healy on one occasion he remarked that lord rosebery was not a man to go tire shooting with except at the zoo on another being anxious to bring an indictment against the castle regime in dublin and finding the way blocked by a debate on uganda he successfully accomplished his purpose by a judicious geographical transference of names and convulsed the house by a speech in which the nomenclature of central africa 
was applied to the government of ireland but wit and humor are the monopoly of no class or calling in ireland they flourish alike among car drivers and cases publicans and policemen priests and parsons beggars and peers it is commonplace of criticism to deny these qualities in their highest form to women but this is emphatically untrue of ireland and was never more conclusively disproved than by the recent literary achievements of her daughters the partnership of two irish ladies miss edith somerville and miss violet martin has given us in some experiences of an irish r m for example resident magistrate the most delicious comedy and in the real charlotte the finest tragedy comedy that have come out of great britain in the last thirty years the r m as it is familiarly called is already a classic but the irish comedy humane to use the phrase in the sense of balzac is even more vividly portrayed in the pages of the real charlotte humor genuine though intermittent irradiates the autumnal talent of miss jane barlow and the long roll of gifted irish women who have contributed to the gaiety of nations may be closed with the names of miss hunt author of folk tales of breffney of miss perdone and miss winifred letts who in prose and verse respectively have moved us to tears and laughter by their studies of lanaster peasant life and of maura o'nell mrs scrine the imperable singer of the glens of antrium and to give a full list of the living irish writers male and female who are engaged in the benevolent work of driving dull care away would be impossible within the space at our command but we cannot end without recognition of our exhilarating extravaganzas of george a birmingham canon Hannay, the freakish and elfin muse of james stevens and the coruscating wit of f p dunn the famous irish american humorist whose mr dooley is a household word on both sides of the atlantic references goldsmith vicar of wakefield she stoops to conquer sheridan the rivals the school for scandal the critic r edgeworth essay on irish bulls m edgeworth castle rackrent the absentee mcginn miscellanies in prose and verse carleton traits and stories of the irish peasantry mahoney father prout relics of father prout john and michael bannum tales of the o'hara family lover legends and stories of ireland handy andy lever harry michael bannum tales of the o'hara family lover legends and stories of ireland handy andy lever harry laura career charles o'malley lord kilgobbin le fanu le purcell papers barlow bogland studies irish ideals irish neighbors birmingham the seething pot spanish gold the major's niece the red hand of ulster general john reagan stevens the crock of gold here are ladies hunt the folk tales of breffney perdone the folk of furry farm somerville and ross the real charlotte some experiences of an irish r m all on the irish shore dan russell the fox end of section number thirty three recording by april six zero nine zero california united states of america Section 34 of The Glories of Ireland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Olson Fytak, Los Angeles. The Glories of Ireland, edited by Joseph Dunn and p j lennox section thirty four the irish theatre by joseph holloway the irish theatre and secular drama may be said to begin with the production of james shirley's historical play saint patrick for ireland in werborough street theatre about sixteen thirty six to seven and although dublin was a great school for acting and supplied many of the best players to the English stage, such as Quinn, Macklin, Peg Woffington, Miss O'Neill, and hosts of others, 
it never really possessed a creative theatre, save at the Capel Street Theatre for a few years during the Grattan Parliament, until the modern movement in Ireland came into being and the Abbey Theatre became its headquarters. Of course, innumerable plays by Irish writers were written, but most of them were not distinctively Irish in character, and the names of Goldsmith, Sheridan, O'Keefe, Farquhar, Sheridan Knowles, Oscar Wilde, and dozens of others will always be remembered as great Irish writers for the stage. And when fine impersonators of Irish character, like Tyrone Power, John Drew, or Barney Williams arrived, there were always to be found several clever writers to fit them with parts, the demand always creating the supply. Even before Dion Boucicault took to writing Irish dramas of a more palatable and less stage-Irish character than those of his immediate predecessors, some excellent plays, Irish in character and tone, had from time to time found their way to the stage. However, Boucicault sweetened our stage by the production of the Colleen Baum, Arana Pogue, the Chagrin, and showed by his rollicking impersonations of Miles, Sean, and Con, how good-humoured, hearty, and self-sacrificing Irish boys in humble life can be. He had great technical knowledge of stagecraft, and that has helped to make his Irish plays live and the popular goodwill right up to today. A revolt against Boussicault's Irish boys all fun and frolic, and charming Colleen's, who could do no wrong, has made our modern playwrights go to the other extreme, so that now we find our stage peopled with peasants, cruel, hard, and forbidding for the most part, and with Colleen's, who are the reverse of lovable in thought or act. Neither picture is quite true of our people. What is really wanted is the happy medium, which few if any, of our new playwrights have yet given us. If our great popular Irish drama has yet to come, I think the Fays have made it possible to say that a distinct and really fine dramatic school has arisen in Ireland and evolved out of their wonderful skill in teaching, producing, and acting. And if we are not always really delighted with what our playwrights give us, the almost perfect way in which the plays are served up by the actors invariably wholly satisfies. It is the actors who have made the Abbey Theatre famous, and not the plays. Such acting as theirs cast a spell over all who see them. What pleasing memories do the names of W. G. Fay, Frank J. Fay, Dudley Diggs, Sarah Allgood, Arthur Sinclair, Mayor O'Neill, Mayor Nishuelbach, J. M. Kerrigan, Fred O'Donovan, Eileen O'Doherty, Una O'Connor, Ethne McGee, Nora Desmond, and John Connolly recall. With the production of W. B. Yeats' poetic one-act play, The Land of Heart's Desire, at the Avenue Theatre, London, on March 29, 1894, began the modern Irish dramatic movement. When the poet had tasted the joys of the footlights, he longed to see an Irish literary theatre realised in Ireland. Five years later, in the Ancient Concert Rooms, Dublin, on May 9, 1899, his play, the Countess Kathleen was produced and his desire gratified. The experiment was tried for three years and then dropped. Plays by Yeats, Edward Martin, George Moore, and Alice Milligan were staged with English-trained actors in the casts. And a Gaelic play, the first ever presented in a theatre in Ireland, was also given during the third season. It was The Twisting of the Rope by Dr. Douglas Hyde and was played at the Gaiety Theatre Dublin on October 21, 1901 
by a Gaelic Amateur Dramatic Society coached by W. G. Fay. The author filled the principal part with distinction. It was while rehearsing this play that the thought came to Fay. Why not have my little company of Irish-born actors, the Ormond Dramatic Society, appear in plays by Irish writers instead of in the ones they have been giving for years? And the thought soon ripened into realization. His brother, Frank, had dreamed of such a company since he read of the small beginnings out of which the Norwegian theatre had grown. And just then, seeing some of A's, George Russell's play, Deirdre, in the All-Ireland Review, he asked the author if he would allow them to produce it, and, consent being given, the company put it into rehearsal at once. A got for them from Yeats Kathleen Nihulehan to make up the program. Thus it was that this company of amateurs and poets, now known as the Abbey Players, came into existence, and at St. Teresa's Hall, Clarendon Street, Dublin, gave their first performance on April 2, 1902. Shortly afterwards, they took a hall at the back of a shop in Camden Street, where they rehearsed and gave a few public performances. On A declining to be their president, Frank Fay suggested the name of W. B. Yeats, and he was elected, and in that way came again into the movement in which he has figured so largely ever since. The company played occasionally in the Molesworth Hall, and produced there, among other pieces, Sings in the Shadow of the Glen, October 8, 1903 and Riders to the Sea, February 25, 1904, Yeats's The Hourglass, March 14, 1903, and The King's Threshold, October 8, 1903, Lady Gregory's 25, March 14, 1903, and Padre Colum's Broken Soil, December 3, 1903. On March 26, 1904, the company paid a flying one-day visit to the Royalty London, and Miss A. E. F. Horniman, who had given Shaw, Yeats, and Dr. John Todhunter their first real start as playwrights at the Avenue, London, in March-April, 1894. Shaw had had his first play, Widower's Houses, played by the Independent Theatre in 1892 saw the performance, and was so impressed that she thought she would like to find a suitable home for such talent in Dublin, and fixed upon the Old Mechanics Institute and its surrounding buildings, and there the Abbey Theatre soon afterwards, on December 27, 1904, came into existence. In writing of this Irish dramatic movement, one must always bear in mind that it was Yeats who first conceived the idea of such a movement, the Fays, who founded the school of Irish acting, and Miss Horniman, who, like a fairy godmother, waved the wand and gave it a habitation and a name, the Abbey Theatre, and endowed it for six years. Play followed play with great rapidity, and dramatic societies sprang up all over the country, playing homemade productions in Gaelic and English. All Ireland seemed to be play-acting and play-writing, so much so that Frank Fay was heard to say that he thought everyone had a play in his pocket and that anyone in the street could be picked up and shaped into an actor or actress with a little training. Ireland was so teeming with talent. Dramatic Ireland had slumbered for a long while and awoke with tremendous vigor for work. New dramatists sprang up in all parts of Ireland. The Ulster Literary Theatre started in Belfast, the Cork Dramatic Society in Cork, the Theatre of Ireland in Dublin, and others in Galway and Waterford soon followed. In Dublin at present, more than half a dozen dramatic societies are continually producing new plays and discovering new acting talent. 
there are also two Gaelic dramatic societies, and nearly every town in Ireland now has its own dramatic class and its own dramatists. All this activity has come about within the last ten or twelve years, where before, in many places, drama and acting were almost unknown. Many Gaelic societies throughout the country put on Gaelic plays by Dr. Douglas Hyde, Pierce Beasley, Thomas Haynes, Canon Peter O'Leary, and others, and the Oerechtas, the Gaelic musical and literary festival held each year in Dublin, usually presents several Irish plays and offers prizes for new ones at each festival. Of all the Irish playwrights who have arisen in recent years, Lady Gregory has produced most, and W. B. Yeats is the most poetic. He is more a lyric poet than a dramatist, and is never satisfied with his work for the stage, but keeps eternally chopping and changing it. His Kathleen Nihulahan, though a dream play, always appeals to an audience of Irish people. Perhaps his one act, Deirdre, is the nearest approach to real drama he has done. Some of Lady Gregory's earlier one-act farces, such as The Workhouse Ward, are very amusing. The Rising of the Moon is a little dramatic gem, and the Gale Gate is touched with genuine tragedy. Singh wrote only one play, Riders to the Sea, that acts well. The others are admired by critics for the strangeness of their diction, and the beauty of the nature pictures scattered through them. His much-discussed Playboy of the Western World has become famous for the rows it has created at home and abroad from its very first production on January 26, 1907. William Boyle, who gets to the heart of those he writes about, has produced the most popular play of the movement, in The Eloquent Dempsey, and a perfectly constructed one in The Building Fund. W. F. Casey's two plays, The Man Who Missed the Tide and The Suburban Groove, are both popular and actable. Padre Colum's plays, The Land and Broken Soil, the latter rewritten and renamed The Fiddler's House, are almost idyllic scenes of country life. Lennox Robinson's plays are harsh in tone, but dramatically effective, and T. C. Murray's Birthright and Maurice Hart are fine dramas, well constructed and full of true knowledge of the people he writes about. Shomas O'Kelly has written two strong dramas in The Schuler's Child and The Bribe, and Shumas O'Brien, one of the funniest Irish farces ever staged in duty. R. J. Ray's play, The Casting Out of Martin Whelan, is the best this dramatist has as yet given us, and George Fitzmaurice's The Country Dressmaker has the elements of good drama in it. St. John G. Irvine has written a very human drama in mixed marriage. He hails from the north of Ireland, but Rutherford Maine is the best of the northern playwrights, and his plays, The Drone and The Turn of the Road, are splendid homely county down comedies. Bernard Shaw's John Bull's Other Island, as Irish plays go, is a fine specimen. Canon Hannay has written two successful comedies, Eleanor's Enterprise and General John Reagan, the latter not wholly to the taste of the people of the West. James Stevens and Jane Barlow have also tried their hands at playwriting, with but moderate success. Perhaps the modern drama that made the most impression when first played was The Heatherfield by Edward Martin. It gripped and remains a lasting memory with all who saw it in 1899. 
but I think I have written enough to show that the Irish theatre of today is in a very alive condition, and that if the great national dramatist has not yet arrived, he is sure to emerge. When that time comes, the actors are here, ready to interpret such work to perfection. An article, however brief, on the Irish theatre, would be incomplete without mention of the world-famous tragedians John Edward McCullough, Lawrence Patrick Barrett, and Barry Sullivan, of genial comedians like Charles Sullivan and Hubert O'Grady, of sterling actors like Sheil Barry, John Brogham, Leonard Boyne, J. D. Beveridge, and Thomas Nerney, or of operatic artists like Dennis O'Sullivan and Joseph O'Mara, many of whom have passed away, but some, fortunately, are with us still. References John Genist Some Account of the English Stage from the Restoration to 1830 1832 Volume 10 is devoted to the Irish Stage. Chetwood General History of the Stage more particularly of the Irish Theatre, Dublin, 1749. Malloy, Romance of the Irish Stage. Baker, Biografia Dramatica, Dublin, 1782. Hitchcock, An Historical View of the Irish Stage from its Earliest Period Down to the Season of 1788. Doran, Their Majesty's Servants, or Annals of the English Stage, London, 1865. Hughes, The Pre-Victorian Drama in Dublin. The History of the Theatre Royal, Dublin, Dublin, 1870. Levy and O'Rourke, Annals of the Theatre Royal, Dublin, 1880. O'Neill, Irish Theatrical History, Dublin, 1910. Brown, A Guide to Books on Ireland, Dublin, 1912. Lawrence, The Abbey Theatre, in the Weekly Freeman, Dublin, December, 1912. Origin of the Abbey Theatre, in Sinn Féin, Dublin, February 14, 1914. Vagant, Irish Plays and Playwrights, London, 1913. Lady Gregory, Our Irish Theatre, London, 1914. Bourgeois, John M. Singh and the Irish Theatre, London, 1913. Moore, Hail and Farewell, Three Volumes, London, 1911. 1914. Asmore, The Ulster Literary Theatre, in The Lady of the House, Dublin, November 15th, 1913. The Reviews, Beltane, 1899 to 1900, and Sawin, 1901 to 1903. End of section number 34. Section 35 of The Glories of Ireland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. The Glories of Ireland. Edited by Joseph Dunn and P.J. Lennox. Irish Journalists by Michael MacDonald The most splendid testimony to the Irish genius in journalism is afforded by the London press of the opening decades of the 20th century. One of the greatest newspaper organizers of modern times is Lord Northcliffe. As the principal proprietor and guiding mind of both the Times and the Daily Mail, he directly influences public opinion from the steps of the throne and the door of the cabinet to the errand boy and the servant maid. T. 
T. P. O'Connor, M. P., is the most popular writer on current social and political topics, and so amazing in his versatility that every subject he touches is illumined by those fine qualities, vision, and sincerity. The most renowned of political writers is J. L. Garvin of the Pall Mall Gazette and The Observer. By his leading articles, he has done as much as the late Joseph Chamberlain by his speeches to democratize and humanize the old Tory party of England. The authoritative special correspondent, studying at first hand all the problems which divide the nations of Europe, and knowing personally most of its rulers and statesmen, is E. J. Dillon of the Daily Telegraph. And when the quarrels of nations are transferred from the chancelleries to the stricken field, there is no one among the war correspondents more enterprising and intrepid in his methods, or more picturesque and vivid with his pen, than M. H. Donahoe of the Daily Chronicle. All these men are Irish. Could there be more striking proof of the natural bent and aptitude of the Irish mind for journalism? Dean Swift was the mightiest journalist that ever stirred the sluggish soul of humanity. Were he alive today, and had he at his command the enormous circulation of a great daily newspaper, he would keep millions in a perpetual mental ferment. Such was the ferocious indignation into which he was aroused by wrong and injustice, and his gift of savage, ironical expression. Swift, as a young student in Trinity College, Dublin, saw the birth of the first offspring of the Irish mind in journalism. The Dublin newsletter made its appearance in June 1685, and was published every three or four days for the circulation of news and advertisements. Only one copy of the first issue of this, the earliest of Irish newspapers, is extant. It is included in the Thorpe collection of tracts in the Royal Dublin Society. Dated August 26, 1685, it consists of a single leaf of paper printed on both sides and contains just one item of news, a letter brought by the English packet from London, and two local advertisements as i reverently handled it i was thrilled by the thought that from this insignificant little seed sprang the great national organ the freeman's journal the press of the united irishmen the nation of the young irelanders the united ireland of the land league the irish world and the boston pilot of the american irish and the irish independent the first halfpenny Dublin morning paper, and the most widely circulated of Irish journals. If Swift did not write for the Dublin newsletter, he certainly wrote for the Examiner, a weekly miscellany published in the Irish capital from 1710 to 1713, and the first journal that endeavored to create public opinion in Ireland. It was at Swift's instigation that this paper was started, and he was doubtless encouraged to suggest it by the success that attended his articles in the contemporary London publication of the same name, the Tory Examiner, in which his journalistic genius was fully revealed. As it has been expressively put, he wrote his friends, Harley and St. John, into a firm grip of power, and thus, as in other ways, contributed his share to the inauguration and maintenance of that policy which in the last four years of queen anne so materially recast the whole european situation about the same time there appeared in london the earliest forms of the periodical essay in the tatler and the spectator which exhibit the comprehensiveness of the irish temperament in writing by affording a contrast between the irish force and vehemence of swift and the Irish play of kindly wit and tender pathos in the deft and dainty periods of Richard Steele. Dr. Charles Lucas was, even more than Swift, perhaps, the precursor of that type of Irish publicist and journalist, of which there have been many splendid examples since then in Ireland 
england and america lucas first started the censor a weekly journal in seventeen forty eight within two years his paper was suppressed for exciting discontent with the government and to avoid a prosecution he fled to england in seventeen sixty three the freeman's journal was established by three dublin merchants lucas who had returned from a long exile and was a member of the irish parliament contributed to it sometimes anonymously but generally over the signature of a citizen or civis the editor was henry brooks novelist poet and playwright his novel the fool of quality is still read his tragedy the earl of essex was wrongly supposed to contain a precept who rules or freeman should himself be free which led to the more famous parody of dr samuel johnson who drives fat oxen should himself be fat the object of lucas and brooke as journalists was to awaken national sentiment by teaching that ireland had an individuality of her own independently of england but they were more convinced with the assertion of the constitutional rights of the parliament of the protestant colony as against the domination of england therefore the first organ of irish nationality representative of all creeds and classes was the press the newspaper of the united irishmen which was started in dublin in seventeen ninety seven by arthur o'connor the son of a rich merchant who had made his money in london its editor was peter finnerty born of humble parentage at loray afterwards a famous parliamentary reporter for the london morning chronicle and its most famous contributor was dr william drennan the poet who first called ireland the emerald isle irishmen did not become prominently associated with american journalism until after the famine and the collapse of the young ireland movement in eighteen forty eight the journalist whom i regard as having exercised the most faithful influence on the destinies of ireland was charles gavan duffy the founder and first editor of the nation a newspaper of which it was truly and finally said that it brought a new soul into erin among its contributors who afterwards added lustre to the journalism of the united states was john mitchell in the southern citizen and the richmond inquirer he supported the south against the north in the civil war the rev abram joseph ryan who was associated with journalism in new orleans not only acted as a catholic chaplain with the confederate army but sang of its hopes and aspirations in tuneful verse serving in the army of the north was charles g halpine whose songs signed private miles o'reilly were very popular in those days of national convulsion in the united states halpine's father had edited the tory newspaper the dublin evening mail and halpine himself after the war edited the citizen of new york famous for its advocacy of reforms in civic administration perhaps the two most renowned men in irish american journalism were john boyle o'reilly of the boston pilot and patrick ford of the irish world o'reilly was a troop sergeant in the tenth hussars prince of wales own and during the fenian troubles of eighteen sixty six had eighty of his men ready armed and mounted to take out of island bridge barracks dublin at a given signal to aid the projected insurrection detected he was brought to trial summarily convicted and sentenced to be shot this sentence was commuted to twenty-five years penal servitude but o'reilly survived it all to become a brilliant man of letters and make the boston pilot one of the most influential irish and catholic newspapers in the united states ford who had served his apprenticeship as a compositor in the office of william lloyd garrison at boston founded the irish world in eighteen seventy 
this newspaper gave powerful aid to the land league a special issue of one million six hundred fifty thousand copies of the irish world was printed on january eleventh eighteen seventy nine for circulation in ireland and money to the amount of six hundred thousand dollars altogether was sent by ford to the headquarters of the agitation in dublin a journalist of a totally different kind was edwin lawrence godkin born in county wicklow the son of a presbyterian clergyman godkin in eighteen sixty five established the nation in new york as an organ of independent thought and for thirty-five years he filled a unique position standing aside from all parties sects and bodies and yet permeating them all with his sane and restraining philosophy in canada thomas d'arcy mcgee won fame as a journalist on the new era before he became even more distinguished as a parliamentarian when the history of australian journalism is written it will contain two outstanding irish names daniel henry denahi who died in eighteen sixty five was called by bulwer lytton the australian macaulay on account of his brilliant writings as critic and reviewer in the press of victoria gerald henry supple another dublin man is also remembered for his contributions to the age and the Argus of Melbourne. In India, one of the first, if not the first, English newspapers was founded by a Limerick man named Charles Johnstone, who had previously attained fame as the author of Chrysal, or The Adventures of a Guinea, and who died at Calcutta about 1800. Stirring memories of battle and adventure leaped to mind at the names of those renowned war correspondents william howard russell edmund o'donovan and james j o'kelly russell a dublin man was the first newspaper representative to accompany an army into the field he saw all the mighty engagements of the crimea alma balaclava inkerman sebastopol not from a distance of sixty or eighty miles which is the nearest that correspondents are now allowed to approach the front but at the closest quarters riding through the lines on his mule and seeing the engagements vividly so that he was able to describe them in moving detail for the readers of the times o'donovan son of dr john o'donovan the distinguished irish scholar and archaeologist was in the service of the london daily news that dashing campaigner as his famous book the myrrh oasis shows him to have been perished with hicks pasha's army in the sudan in november eighteen eighty three at the same time james o'kelly also of the daily news was lost in the desert trying to join the forces of the victorious sudanese under the mahdi ten years before that he had accomplished for the new york herald the equally daring and hazardous feat of joining the cuban rebels in revolt against spain he escaped the perils of the mambi land and the sudan and survived to serve ireland for many years as a nationalist member in the british parliament john augustus o'shea better known perhaps as the irish bohemian also deserves remembrance for his quarter of a century's work as special correspondent in europe including paris during the siege for the london standard indeed no matter to what side of journalism we turn we find irishmen filling the foremost and the highest places john thaddeus delane under whose editorship the times became for a time the most influential newspaper in the world was of irish parentage the first editor of the illustrated london news eighteen forty two one of the pioneers in the elucidation of news by means of pictures was an irishman frederick bailey among the projectors of punch and one of its earliest contributors was a king's county man joseph sterling coyne the founder of the liverpool daily post eighteen fifty five the first penny daily paper in great britain was michael joseph witty 
a wexford man his son edward m witty was the originator of that interesting feature of english and irish journalism the sketch of personalities and proceedings in parliament of the editors of the athenaeum for many years the leading english organ of literary criticism one of the most famous was dr john doran who was of irish parentage dodd is a familiar household word in the british parliament it is the name of the recognized guide to the careers and political opinions of lords and commons its founder was an irishman charles roger dodd who for twenty-three years was a parliamentary reporter for the times and what name sheds a brighter light on the annals of british journalism for intellectual and imaginative force than that of justin mccarthy novelist and historian as well as newspaper writer at home in ireland the name of gray is inseparably associated with the freeman's journal under the direction of dr john gray this newspaper became in the sixties and seventies the most powerful organ of public opinion in ireland and in the eighties it was raised still higher in ability and influence by his son and successor edmund dwyer gray in the south of ireland the most influential daily newspaper is the cork examiner which was founded in eighteen forty one by john francis mcguire who wrote in eighteen sixty eight the irish in america it is doubtful whether any country ever produced a more militant and able political journal than was united ireland in the stormy years during which it was edited by william o'brien as the organ of the land league the irish mood is gregarious expansive glowing and eager to keep an in intimate touch with the movements and affairs of humanity that i think is the secret of its success in journalism references madden irish periodical literature eighteen sixty seven andrews english journalism eighteen fifty five north newspaper and periodical press of the united states eighteen eighty four macdonald the reporter's gallery nineteen thirteen end of section thirty five